With one final delicate slice of her lightsaber, Mara cut away the 20 centimeter square section of the turbolift car wall she'd been working on, leaving everything behind it untouched. The piece of metal fell inward, stopping abruptly in midair as Luke caught it in a force grip. Okay, he said, easing it to the floor as warm air flowed in through the opening. Let's see what we've got. Mostly a lot of wires, Mara said, switching off her lightsaber and stepping closer to the wall. Luke moved to her side. She was right. In just the small section she'd opened up there were no fewer than eight wires of different colors crisscrossing their way across the gap. Guardian Presser wasn't kidding about the power cables being wrapped around the car, he commented. He sure wasn't, Mara agreed, pushing experimentally on one of them. It gave about a centimeter, and then stopped. Wrapped pretty tightly, too. We're not going to be able to push them far enough out of the way to squeeze between them. What good would that do anyway? Draskast? Even if we left the car, we would still be suspended in the dare. Sure, but as long as we stayed out of the repulsor beams, we'd be all right, Luke told him. All we'd have to deal with along the edges would be standard ship's gravity, and there should be access ladders built into the sides of the tube we can use to get down. Except that the wires prevent us from reaching them, Drask said tartly. Have you any other ideas? We're not finished with this one yet, Mara countered, just as tartly. What do you think, Luke? Should mine be on the other side? Yes, Luke agreed. Back-to-back -back always seems to work best. Right. Crossing to the opposite side of the car, Mara ignited her lightsaber again. With the delicacy of a surgical droid, she began to cut a second opening. And this will accomplish what? Draskast? If we do it right, it'll get us out of here, Luke told him. And if we don't, Mara added helpfully, at least it'll kill us quickly. Drask didn't reply. Watchman ran his induction meter to the lower edge of the rear wall and straightened up. Well? Fell asked. The topside repulsor cable comes around the corner right about here, the stormtrooper reported, marking the spot with a daub of synth flesh from his medpock. It's in slightly worse shape than the power line to the underside generator. The field leakage is definitely stronger. Right. Fell shifted his attention to Grappler as he ran his own sensor over the edges of the door. Anything there? Yes, but not promising, the other said. If Watchman is right about the differential and leakage levels, it appears the opposing sets of power cables were dropped into a cross-connection pattern right after the door closed behind us. So if we try to force it open, we break one of the circuits? Fell suggested. Actually, we'd eventually break both of them, Watchman said dryly. At least in theory. In actual practice, we'd probably be slammed into something solid one direction or the other before the second circuit popped. Let's try to avoid that, Fell said, trying not to sound sarcastic. His stormtrooper's apparently casual attitude, he knew, was just that, apparent. Beneath the surface they were all working as hard as he was to sort through the facts and options. Anyone have a less lethal suggestion to offer? There was a moment of silence. Then Cloud cleared his throat. I'm not as tech-trained as Watchman and Grappler, he said. But if we drain some of the power to one of the repulses, wouldn't the strength of the beam diminish? Fell rubbed his cheek thoughtfully. That was an interesting direction to go. Watchman? I don't think so the stormtrooper said slowly. Not with the power cables themselves. But we may be able to do something with the control lines, Grappler suggested. 
If we can adjust them enough to lower their output, we may be able to lower the car to ground level. Right. Watchman concurred. Of course, we'll only be able to get to the control cables if they're also wrapped around the car. You think they were careless enough to do that? I don't know, Fell said. Let's find out. The place Evelyn led them to reminded Jinsler of the meal room back at the comma relay post, a drab, viewportless place enclosed in undecorated metal, furnished only with a long, plain table and a handful of equally plain chairs. Seated in the chair at the far end of the table was a dark-haired man in his mid-fifties with a lined, brooding face, dressed in the same simple fashion as the girl. Good day. Jinsler said with a nod, trying to remember how diplomats usually talked on the holodramas he'd like to watch in the days when such entertainments could still interest him. Do I have the honor of addressing Guardian Presser? You do, Presser acknowledged. His eyes flicked to Fisa and the Jeruns, lingered a moment on the wolf kills slung over the alien's shoulders, then came back to Jinsler. Sit down. Thank you. Jinsler said, choosing a seat midway down the table. Fisa took the chair beside him. Bersh, perhaps sensing the lack of welcome, sat himself and his compatriot at the far end of the table, as far from Presser as possible. Let's make this simple, Ambassador, Presser said as the group settled in. First of all, I don't trust you. Any of you. You arrive suddenly and without warning invading my ship without even attempting to communicate with us first. I understand your feelings and your concerns, Jinsler said. But the fact is, we didn't know anyone was here until we were already aboard. Even then, if it hadn't been for the Jedi, we probably wouldn't have known about you until we stumbled over Evelyn here. Yes, Presser murmured. Well, we'll let that pass for the moment. Right now, I'd like to hear why I should permit any of you to come farther into our world. Jinsler smiled faintly. This was starting to sound and feel almost familiar. Maybe Presser had learned his diplomatic technique from the holodramas, too. Don't you mean, why should you permit any of us to live? He suggested. Because that really is the question, isn't it? At least Presser had the grace to blush. I suppose so, he admitted gruffly. What can you offer that's worth risking the betrayal of my people? At the far end of the table, Bearsh stirred in his seat. Jinsler threw him a sharp look, and he subsided without speaking. I don't know exactly what happened to you, he said, turning back to Presser. It's obvious you've all suffered tremendously. But I'm here, we're here in the hope of bringing that suffering to an end. And then what? Presser demanded. A glorious return to the Republic? Most of us volunteered for this voyage specifically to escape the very thing you're offering. We're not the Republic you left, Jinsler said. We're the new Republic. And what, you no longer have squabbles among factions and members? Presser countered. The bureaucracy no longer exists? The leaders are wise and benevolent, and just? Jinsler hesitated. What exactly was he supposed to say? Of course we still have a bureaucracy, he said carefully. It's impossible to operate a government without something of that sort. And there are certainly still squabbles and factions. But we've already tried the other option, rule by a single, monolithic empire. Most of us prefer the alternative. An empire? Presser asked, frowning. When was this? The wheels were already in motion when outbound flight left Coruscant, Jinsler said, wondering how much he should say. His goal was to convince Presser that the New Republic offered hope to these people not to give the full history of one of the politician's more spectacular failures. At first, Palpatine only seemed to want peace. Palpatine? 
oppressor cut him off. Supreme Chancellor Palpatine? That's the one, Jinzler confirmed. As I was saying, at first he only seemed to want to bring the Republic together. It was only afterward, in hindsight, that we were able to see how he was drawing more and more power to himself. Interesting, Presser said. But that's the past. This is the present. And I'm still waiting to hear a good reason why we should trust you. Jinsler took a deep breath. Because you're all alone out here, he said. You're in foreign territory, surrounded by the hazards and lethal radiation of a tightly packed globular cluster, sitting in a ruined and useless ship. This ship is hardly useless, Presser said stiffly. With all the work my father and the droids put into it, this particular dreadnought is pretty much ready to fly. Then why haven't you loaded everyone aboard and left? Jinsler countered. I'll tell you why. You haven't left because you have no idea how to get out. He locked gazes with the other man. The bottom line is this, Guardian. If you don't trust us, if you kill us, or even if you just send us away, you and your descendants will be here forever. Presser's lip twitched. I can think of worse fates. And if it were just you, I wouldn't have any problem with that decision. Jinsler turned to look at Evelyn, standing silently just inside the door. But it isn't just you, is it? Presser muttered something under his breath. Well, one thing hasn't changed between the old and new republics, he said. The politicians and diplomats still know how to fight dirty. He waved a hand as Jinsler opened his mouth. Never mind. I guess that's how the game has always been played. I'm not trying to push you into anything, Jinsler said quietly. We're not in any rush, and you don't have to make any decisions right now. But ultimately, you have to be aware that your decision is going to affect more than just your own life. Presser didn't reply. Jinsler listened to the silence, trying to think of something else to say. While you're thinking, he said as he finally found something, we'd very much like to meet the rest of your people and see your ship. It's a testimony to your ingenuity and perseverance that you were all able to survive for so long particularly after suffering so much devastation. For another long minute Presser gazed at him with narrowed eyes, as if trying to decide whether the request was genuine or simply one more diplomat's word game. Then, abruptly, he nodded. All right, he said, pushing back his chair and getting to his feet. You want to see our home? Fine, let's go see it. What about the others? Jinsler asked, standing up as well. The Skywalkers and Aristocra form by and the rest? They'll keep for now, Presser said, circling the table toward the door. If we decide we're going to deal with you, I'll release them. It would be a nice gesture to at least release Aristocra form by, Jinsler said, pressing the point cautiously. You're in Chiss space, and he's a high-ranking member of the Chiss government. You'll certainly need their help before this is over. Presser's lips compressed briefly. I suppose, he said reluctantly. All right. The Aristocra and his group can join us. But the Jedi will stay where they are. He considered. So will those armored soldiers, I think. I don't much like the looks of them. Jinsler bowed his head. Thank you, Guardian he said. To be perfectly honest, he didn't much like the looks of the stormtroopers, either. Fel could talk all he liked about how his empire of the hand wasn't the despotic tyranny Palpatine had created. Maybe he was even telling the truth. But Jinsler had lived under an empire once, and he'd long ago learned that words cost nothing to produce. Presser reached the door. Then, abruptly, he turned back around. One other thing, he said, his voice pitched just a bit too casually. 
Your name, Jinsler. Any relation to the Jedi Knight Lorana Jinsler? Jinsler felt a hard lump form around his heart. Yes, he said, forcing his voice to be as casual as Presser's. She was my sister. Presser nodded. Ah. He turned around again. This way. Chapter 13 What was that? Drask asked abruptly. Did you hear something? Luke asked the car. Mara closed down her Luke stretched out with the force, straining to hear. There was the sound of a door closing. One of the repulsor lift generators seemed to change pitch subtly. One of the turbo lift cars is moving, Mara said, her head cocked to listen. Down, I think. Which one? Drass demanded. Can you tell which one? The sense of those in the car, but between the Jeruns and Chiss, there was too much alienness all around for him to get a good reading. I don't know, he said. Mara? I think Jinsler's aboard, she said, shaking her head slowly. I can't get anything else. Drask muttered something under his breath. We must get out of here, he said. Aristocra Chafuarambintrano may be in grave danger. We're working as fast as we can, Luke pointed out, trying to suppress the sudden misgiving circling his stomach. If Jinza was on the move, did that mean Guardian Presser had decided he was the one the colonists should be talking to? Had that been Jinza's plan the whole time? In fact, to be the one to make first contact with them? He shook the thought away. No, that was ridiculous. How could Jinsler have possibly known there was anyone left aboard? Still, even if there was no malice in the man, there was also no diplomatic training. Mara? He murmured. Working as fast as I can, she reminded him scratching the tip of her lightsaber blade gently across the metal. Luke grimaced, but he knew as well as she did that this couldn't be rushed. If she cut too far through the metal and nicked one of the repulsor power lines, none of them would be helping Formby or Jinsler or anyone else. He fingered his own lightsaber hilt, cultivating his Jedi patience. And then, all at once, the square of metal popped out of the wall. Caught slightly by surprise, Luke let it fall nearly to the floor before he was able to nab it in a force grip and lower it more gently the rest of the way. Okay, Mara said, closing down her lightsaber and stepping aside. Your turn. Right. Stepping to the spot Mara had just vacated, he ignited his lightsaber. Stretching out to the force, he eased the tip of the blade between the crisscrossing of wires behind the wall. Careful, Drask warned, taking a half-step toward him. If you touch the wrong wire... Don't worry, Mara said, waving him back. He knows what he's doing. Luke pursed his lips. He knew what he was doing, certainly, at least in theory. Whether he could actually pull it off was another question entirely. Just above the lightsaber blade a bright red wire stretched horizontally across the opening. Preparing his mind, he twitched the blade toward it. Not close enough to actually touch it, of course. But close enough to activate the short-range prescience that gave the Jedi what appeared to be super-fast reflexes. And for that single brief instant, he could feel a sudden pressure against the soles of his feet. Red wire powers the upper repulsor he announced, closing down the lightsaber and stepping back. Right, Mara said, going to the opening and marking the indicated wire with a bit of the dark brown coating from one of her ration bars. One to go. Luke nodded and turned around toward the first opening she'd made in the wall. Choosing a blue wire this time, he ignited his lightsaber and again twitched the tip of the blade toward it. Nothing. 
He tried again with a green wire, then a red wire, then another blue wire, with similarly negative results. Then, finally, he waved the blade toward a black striped white wire and felt a brief sensation of the floor dropping out from under his feet. There, he told Mara, backing away. Black striped white. Got it, she confirmed, marking it as she had the red wire on the other side. Okay. We ready? Mara stepped behind him, pressing her back to his as she faced the other side and the red wire he'd identified. Just a moment, Drask said, sounding more than a little alarmed. What exactly do you plan here? It should be clear enough, General, Mara said. We're going to cut the power lines. But, Drask broke off. You really can do this? Luke could feel Mara's red-gold hair shift against the back of his neck as she turned to face the Chiss. Trust us, she said. Her hair resettled itself as she turned back to her target, and with a snap hiss she ignited her lightsaber. And with a sensation Luke still found astonishing, he felt her mind flow into, around, and through his. For that exquisitely stretched out moment in time they were truly a single mind, a single spirit poured into two separate bodies. They thought as one, they felt as one, they moved as one. And their lightsabers struck as one, each of the two glowing blades slashing through its targeted power cable in perfect synchronization. There was a slight jerk, more imagined than truly felt, and with a decided feeling of anticlimax, the turbolift car began to sink downward. Luke took a deep breath. As suddenly as it had begun, the melding ended. The sensation of oneness faded away, leaving only the warmth of the memory behind. There, Mara said. To Luke's ears, her voice sounded a little strained as she, too, worked to regain mental and emotional balance after their moment of unity. See? No problem. What do you mean, no problem? Drask bit out. We are falling. Don't worry, Mara said. Now that we're traveling at a normal speed, there are built-in safeties to catch us at the other end. The problem was that Presser's repulses would have slammed us down too fast for them to trigger. That was a dangerous chance to take, Drask growled. You want out of here or not? Mara countered. The Chiss hissed between his teeth. You Jedi have the arrogance of untested power, he told her bluntly. One day, you will take one too many chances, and it will destroy you. There was a gentle jolt from above, as if the car had momentarily shivered. What was that? Luke asked, glancing at the ceiling. We have changed direction, Drask said, cocking his head oddly to the side. We are now traveling more vertically than before. How do you know? Luke asked. Standing in the car's artificial gravity, he couldn't feel anything different. I simply know, the Chiss said. I cannot explain. It simply is. All right, fine. The last thing Luke wanted right now was something else to argue about. But in that case, where are we going? Perhaps Guardian Presser enjoys layering his traps, Drask said, his hand on his charik. This may lead to a special place reserved for anyone who defeats the first layer. I don't know, Mara said, looking around. Seems a little like overkill. Luke, do you remember what this setup looked like from the outside? There were a pair of curved tubes leading off the main one, right? They looked like they were heading toward each other when they disappeared into the hill. One coming off each side of the tube, 
Mara added. Like they were branch roots you could take from either of the two dreadnoughts. Branch roots heading to the central supply core, Luke said, nodding as the explanation suddenly hit him. Of course, the SC button on the control panel. Right, Mara agreed. That must be where we're going. The words were barely out of her mouth when the car abruptly jerked again, and the floor seemed to drop gently out from under them. Reflexively, Luke tensed, then relaxed as he realized what had happened. Now that the car was out of the main tube and presser's trap, it had been grabbed by the branch tube's normal repulsor beam and was being pulled sedately downward toward the storage core. We are turning over, Drask said, again doing that head-cocking thing. Must be lining up with the storage core's gravity direction, Luke said. Is that good? Shipboard gravity is usually tied in with the rest of the environmental system. If the gravity is working, chances are the core's got air and heat, too. A few seconds later the car settled to a stop, and the door slid open to reveal a large, musty-smelling cavern. Luke stepped out of the car, lightsaber ready in his hand. The room stretching out in front of him was only dimly lit with perhaps a third of the permlight emergency panels still operating. The nearest true bulkhead was 10 meters away toward the forward end of the core, with another bulkhead 20 meters in the other direction toward the rear. The space right in front of the turbo lift was reasonably open, but the rest of the room had been partitioned by a grid of floor-to-ceiling meshwork panels dividing the floor space into 3 meter by 3 meter sections. A few of the sections had been partially or completely emptied, but most still held stacks of crates. Haven't made much of a dent, have they? Luke commented as the others stepped out to join him. This facility was supposed to supply 50,000 people for up to several years, Mara reminded him. I'm surprised they got even this far into it. This may have been used up during the first part of the voyage. When all were still alive, Drask said, moving the beam from his glow rod down the labels of one of the stacks. Surely not many of the original crew could have survived. How anyone survived is still beyond me, Luke said, shifting his glow rod to point at the aft bulkhead. Just visible at the edge of the beam were two doorways, one human-sized, the other obviously built for cargo. Let's head aft and see what else is back. He broke off as the comm link at his waist emitted an odd chirping noise. He pulled it from his belt, peripherally aware that Mara and Drask were doing the same with theirs, and clicked it on. A burst of static crackled at him, and he quickly shut it off again. That's strange, he said, frowning at it. It sounded like something was coming through just then. Same here, Mara said, turning her calm link over in her hand. Yours too, General? Yes, Drask said, sounding thoughtful. It was as if... He stopped. As if? Mara prompted. As if someone had used a... I do not know the proper word in your language, the Chis said. It is a signal that stretches across all parts of the communications range in an attempt to penetrate jamming. Some kind of full-spectrum burst, Mara said, nodding. We use that technique ourselves sometimes. Usually between vehicles or ships, though. I've never seen it used on anything as small as a comlink. Do CHIS comlinks have that capability? Luke asked Drask. The other hesitated. Certain of them do, he said. Those I equipped our party with do not. Let's put it a different way, Mara said. Are there any of these more sophisticated comm links aboard the chaff envoy? Drask looked away. There are, he conceded. Mara looked back at Luke. Terrific, she said. 
So someone's able to communicate with the ship. Only that someone isn't us. Maybe it was just the survivors talking among themselves, Luke suggested, hunting for a less ominous explanation. Maybe Presser needed to send a signal to one of the other dreadnoughts. Mara shook her head. Intership comms ought to be hardwired. Unless some of the lines are out. Maybe, she said. Clearly, she didn't believe that for a second. Unfortunately, despite what she still sometimes called his farm boy naivete, either did Luke. Someone aboard outbound flight was communicating through pressers jamming. The question was, who? And what were they saying? He looked at Mara, but she just shrugged. Nothing we can do about it right now, she said. Come on, let's see what's back this way. In hindsight, I suppose we shouldn't have been surprised to find you here, Ambassador Ginsler commented as Presser led the group back toward the number five turbolift car. Even in the most adverse of conditions, humans always seem to find a way to survive. Yes, Presser said, keeping his voice neutral as he waved the others ahead of him into the car. The two drones, he noticed, hesitated before stepping through the doorway. Jinsler himself didn't even break stride. The man was either very trusting, very overconfident, or very stupid. Though the fact we lived through all of that certainly wasn't for lack of trying on somebody's part, he added. Indeed, Jinsler murmured as he and the female Chis stepped to one of the rear corners of the car. Exactly how this all happened is one of the things we hope to find out. Perhaps you'll have that chance, Presser said, pulling out his command stick and plugging it into the droid socket on the control board. Unfortunately, most of the records were ruined in the attack. He touched a button, and the barrier between cars 4 and 5 slid open. The three black clad chiss in the car reacted like dolls on twitch strings, spinning around as one of the walls of their prison vanished, their hands darting to their holstered weapons. The two Jeruns, in contrast, lifted their arms and surged forward toward their compatriots as if they'd been separated for years instead of just a few minutes. The older Chiss, the one dressed in yellow and gray, merely turned casually toward Presser and nodded. Good day, he said, his basic oddly accented but quite understandable. I am Aristocra Chafor Rembentrano of the Fifth Ruling Family, representing the Chiss Ascendancy. You may address me as Aristocra Formby. Do I have the honor of addressing Guardian Presser? You do, Presser said, returning the nod. The least he could do was show himself to be as cultured and polite as his visitors. I welcome you to outbound flight, Aristocra Formby, and apologize for the necessity of greeting you as I did. No apology required, the Aristocra assured him. Those glowing red eyes flicked to the female chis still hovering close to Jinsler, as if checking to see that she was all right. Your caution is completely understandable. Guardian Presser is going to take us to see his people, Jinsler spoke up. After that, I presume we'll be discussing the possibility of their return to the New Republic. The Aristocra frowned. The possibility? That's correct. Presser said. I'm not at all sure we'll choose to go back to the Republic. Or to go anywhere at all, for that matter. He made an adjustment on the command stick. You didn't tell him where they are? Formby asked, his eyes on Jinsler. Presser paused, his finger poised against the activation button. What do you mean, where we are? He asked. I'm afraid our conversation didn't get that far, Jinsler admitted. Presser looked at Formby, feeling a knot forming in his stomach. Why don't you tell me now? He invited. Formby's mouth twitched. You're deep within a high-security defensive position of the Chiss Ascendancy, he said. 
Traveling here is forbidden without special authorization. Now that we know about you, I'm afraid you can't be permitted to stay. The knot in Presser's stomach tightened. I see, he said, putting his voice back into neutral mode. And if we refuse to leave? I would hope you wouldn't, Formby said, matching Presser's tone. We will, of course, give you any assistance you might require in moving your people wherever you wish to go. It's little enough compensation for what you've suffered. I see, Presser said again. Well, you can present your case before Director Yulier and the Managing Council. They'll be the ones who'll make the final decision. Jinsler cocked his head. Who is Director Yulier? He's the head of the colony. Presser told him, pressing the activation button on his command stick. Behind him the door to the alcove slid shut and the double car began to descend. I see, Formby said. I'm sorry, I'd assumed you were the leader. I'm the guardian, Presser said. My peacekeepers and I keep order within the colony. Director Yulier and the Managing Council make all the policy decisions. Sounds rather like a corporation, Jinsler commented. And why not? Presser retorted. Corporations work a lot better than the political mess we left behind. Yes, of course, Jinsler said hastily. How many of you are there? Formby asked. Presser turned his face away from them. I think I should let Director Yulier handle any further questions. The car fell silent except for the distant creaks and rumblings of the turbolift equipment and the melodic murmuring of the four Jeruns as they huddled together in a back corner. Probably still assuring each other that they were all right, Presser decided, eyeing the dead animals wrapped across their shoulders with a mixture of distaste and fascination. With a raucous squeak and a vibrating thump, the double car came to a stop, snapping Presser out of his thoughts. This way, he said, touching the door release on the command stick. We'll go find Director Yulier. He stepped outside. And came to an abrupt halt. At the back of the turbolift lobby, as he prearranged, three of his peacekeepers were standing ready their faces displaying expressions ranging from wary to hostile to simply nervous. Standing in a silent group beside them were Director Yulier and the two survivor members of the managing council. Beside Yulier, her auburn hair glinting in the corridor's light, was instructor Rosemary Tabry, Presser's sister and Evelyn's mother. And that part Presser had most certainly not prearranged. Director Yulier, he said in greeting as he crossed the lobby toward the group, trying to keep his voice steady. Counselor Tarkosa, Counselor Keeley, he added, nodding to each of the other two old men in turn. What brings you here? Don't act the innocent, guardian, Yulier advised, the age wrinkles around his eyes deepening as he gazed at the group emerging from the turbolift car. It doesn't suit you. So these are our visitors, are they? Rosemary's expression was stiff, with a hint of paleness to her skin. This is hardly the place for a historic diplomatic meeting, you know. He looked significantly at the two counselors. Or the correct attendance for one either. The entire council will be summoned in due course, Yolier said. But I think those of us who actually lived through the devastation have first rights to face our destroyers. This is a major event with a major decision attached to it, Presser insisted, keeping his voice low. Probably the most significant thing that's happened since we arrived here. The Charter specifically requires that the entire Managing Council, Survivor and Colonist members, be present. And they will be, Yulier promised. He twitched a smile. Until then, 
I dare say Instructor Tabery can act as observer for the colonists. But, which ones are the Jedi? Keeley cut in, his nervous eyes darting back and forth across the group that had now paused a little uncertainly by the turbolift door. Guardian? Which ones are the Jedi? None of those here, Presser told him. The Jedi are still being held in one of the turbolift cars. No one here is a Jedi, you say? Yulier said. Not even? Why look, Instructor Tabery, there's your daughter. Imagine that. Presser felt his stomach tighten as he glanced behind him. Evelyn was just emerging from the car behind the last of the Jurons, the calmness in her face in sharp contrast to the tension in her mother's. She was assisting me, he said, looking back at Yulier. Was she really? Yulier said, as if it were a surprise to him. You took your niece up to four, exposing her to all the extra radiation up there? Not to mention putting her at risk from potentially dangerous intruders? What an extraordinary thing to do. She likes spending time with her uncle Jorid, Rosemary put in, her voice firm for all the concern in her face. She always has. Indeed, Yulia said as Evelyn slipped past Jinsler and Formby and came to stand beside her mother. Hello there, Evelyn. How are you? I'm fine, Director Yulia, Evelyn said with a seriousness that looked strangely out of place on someone so young. But the quick hug she gave her mother was pure ten-year-old. You don't have to worry about me. Uncle Jorah did everything just right. I wasn't in any danger. I'm sure you weren't, Yulia said, eyeing Presser again. Just as you weren't in any danger two years ago, hmm? Back when Javriel went crazy and tried to take the entire nursery hostage. You were helpful to your uncle then, too, if I remember correctly. You do, Presser confirmed, feeling sweat starting to gather beneath his collar. So Yulia had noticed Evelyn's abilities, too. He should have known the old survivor would catch on. And of all the possible times for him to decide to make an issue of it, he felt his throat tighten. Or had Yulia in fact deliberately chosen this moment? A moment when there were outsiders, including Jedi, aboard his ship for the first time in fifty years. Outsiders who not knowing the realities aboard outbound flight, might be willing and able to confirm his suspicions about Evelyn? Indeed, Yulier said. You have a strange way of returning your niece's affection, Guardian. I needed her help today, Presser said. The same help I needed from her back then, to act as decoy. It wasn't a job any of my peacekeepers could handle. But your own niece? Yulia persisted. Why not pick someone else? He smiled crookedly, the giveaway sign that he was about to close the jaws of his verbal trap. Or, he said smoothly, does she have special qualifications or talents that make her suited for such tasks? My daughter has many special talents, director, Rosemary put in, her arm wrapped protectively around her daughter's shoulders. For one thing, she doesn't panic under pressure. She's quick and smart, and she knows four as well as anyone else in the colony. Certainly now that most of the work is done, and almost no one goes up there anymore. Did she also join the peacekeepers while I wasn't looking? Yulia countered, throwing a quick glare in her direction. His trap had been set for Presser and he clearly didn't appreciate Rosemary jumping in and blunting its teeth. As long as we're quoting from the Charter, Guardian, I believe it explicitly states that you and your peacekeepers are the ones who are supposed to stand between the colony and potential dangers. He just said he needed someone to decoy them, Rosemary said, her voice starting to match the director's own annoyance level. She gestured to the three peacekeepers standing uncomfortably at the edge of the debate. 
You think they would have just walked into a disguised turbo lift behind Trilly or Oliet or Ronson? She shifted her finger to point squarely at Yulier's chest. Or should he have asked someone else? One of your granddaughters, maybe? A decoy shouldn't have been necessary, Yulier insisted. Guardian Presser has assured us over and over that between the various traps and the droid surveillance, Four is perfectly secure. Oh, so now you want to set off explosives and wreck it completely? Rosemary asked scornfully. After all the time and effort my father and the others poured into putting it back together? She drew herself up to her full 1.58 meter height. Or don't you mean it when you say you want to take us out of here someday? She demanded. Are you so comfortable in your private little kingdom that you want to keep us all here? Silence, woman, Tarkosa rumbled, his eyes glinting ominously beneath his bushy eyebrows. You have no idea what you're talking about. Yes, be silent, Yulier seconded gruffly. I didn't bring you here to listen to you make excuses for your brother. Then you apparently don't know her very well, Presser told him, a small part of him starting to enjoy this. Meanwhile, our guests are waiting. Yulia's lips pressed briefly together as his eyes flicked over Presser's shoulder. Very well, he said reluctantly. Introduce us. Certainly, Presser said half-turning and waving the others forward. Yulier hadn't given up, he knew. All he'd done was abandon this particular probe, at this particular time. But he would be back. He would definitely be back. Walking at the head of the group, Jinsler stepped to Presser's side and stopped expectantly. May I present the representative of the New Republic? Presser said, watching Yulier's expression closely. Ambassador Dean Jinsler. The director was good, all right. There was barely a twitch from the corners of his eyes as the name registered. Ambassador, he said smoothly. I'm Chaz Yulier, current director of the outbound flight colony. These are counselors Tarkosa and Keeley, two of the original survivors of the devastation. Honored director. Jinsler said, bowing from the waist like a diplomat from some old holodrama. We're pleased to find you alive. Yes, Yulier said, a little too dryly. I'm sure you are. This is Aristocra Formby of the Chiss Ascendancy, Presser went on, and first steward Bearish of the Jurin Remnant, along with their assistants. Such a very group. Yulia commented as he exchanged nods with Formby and Bersh. I understand you brought two Jedi along with you, as well. Yes, Jinsler said. Guardian Presser informs us they're still being held, along with the others. Others? Yulia asked, looking questioningly at Presser. Five others in a separate car, Presser confirmed. Representatives of a government calling itself the Empire of the Hand. Empire of the Hand, Yulia repeated, as if to himself. Interesting. I presume, Ambassador, that you'll wish both groups released at once to join you? Presser held his breath. A simple, obvious suggestion, but he'd long ago learned not to trust simplicity when it came to dealing with Yulia. Was the director's question in fact an attempt to find out who was really in charge of this expedition? Jinsler hesitated, perhaps also sensing a trap. I'm sure they're fine where they are, director, he said carefully. We'll want them released eventually, of course, but we can certainly begin our discussions without them. Good, Yulier murmured. Apparently, Jinsler had passed the test. Well then. The managing council chamber is located a short distance back this way. If you'll follow me? Thank you, Jinsler said, bowing again. Yulier turned and headed aft down the corridor, the two counselors falling into step beside him, 
Jinsler and Formby following a couple of paces behind them. Presser caught the eyes of his three peacekeepers and nodded toward Yulier. Nodding back, Ronson and Oliet moved into flanking positions beside the three survivors. The black clad chiss were already walking in a military precise, lockstep line behind Formby, with the Jurans following somewhat more tentatively and not at all in step with the rest of the group or even each other. We're certainly starting off with a bang, Presser muttered to Rosemary as the procession marched away. You'd better take Evelyn in. He broke off as he glanced down at his sister's side. Evelyn was nowhere to be seen. Blast her, he snarled under his breath, looking around. There she was, of course, halfway down the corridor, walking between Aristocra Formby and the three black-clad chis striding along behind him. How does she do that? I don't know, Rosemary murmured grimly. But if she doesn't quit it, Yulia won't need any help figuring out what she is. No kidding, Presser said, a tightness settling into his stomach. You'd better catch up and go with her. What, to a council meeting? Rosemary countered. I'm not authorized to be in there. Sure you are. Presser told her. You're representing the colonists in these negotiations, remember? Yulier said so. And that was as much of a fraud as asking why you keep using Evelyn for these stunts, Rosemary shot back. Speaking of which, save it, Presser cut her off. Look, if you don't go, Evelyn's going to crash the party by herself. What do you think Yulia will say when he finally notices her and doesn't remember seeing her coming in? You're right, Rosemary conceded reluctantly. But you'd better be there, too. I fully intend. Presser broke off as the calm link at his belt gave an odd twitter. Frowning, he reached down and pulled it free. That's weird, Trilly murmured, stepping to his side, his own calm link in hand. Your comm link just say something, chief? I thought it did, Presser said, tapping the switch. On the normal channel was only the static of his jamming, while on the special twist frequency command line there was silence. Strange. Want to know what's stranger? Trilly pointed down the corridor at the departing crowd. I saw Jinsler and Formby go for their comm links, too. Presser frowned, an uncomfortable feeling creeping across his back. With the jamming still in place, there shouldn't have been any communications getting through. Not to anyone's comm links. Get back upstairs and double-check the jamming, he ordered Trilly. Our guests may have a trick or two we don't know about. Right. Trilly started to go, stopped again as Presser caught his arm. And while you're there, the Guardian added quietly, put a lock on the controls for the forward trap car's repulses. Make sure no one but us can turn them on or off. Sure, Trilly said, sounding puzzled. You afraid someone's going to accidentally bump into them or something? Presser gazed at Yulier's receding back. Yulier, who had lived through the destruction of outbound flight, and still carried the scars from that event. Yulier, who knew where the Jedi and Imperials were currently being held. Yulier, who was leading the way toward a meeting room far from the turbolifts and the turbolift controls, where Presser and the others wouldn't be in a position to notice if someone slipped up to four and started playing with control switches. Yeah, Presser said softly to Trilly. Or something. With a disconcerting thump, the turbolift CAR began moving. Steady, Fell warned, putting a hand on the vibrating wall for balance, and watching closely as Watchman and Grappler adjusted the power splitters they'd cobbled together. Take it real easy. We're not in any particular hurry. We're keeping it slow, Watchman assured him. It's running real smooth. Good. Fell said, not entirely sure he believed it. 
The car's vibration seemed to be increasing, and a low-pitched rumble had started in from somewhere. On the other hand, if the trick failed, they would probably be dead before it even registered. Comforting. You still want us to head for the storage core? Grappler asked. If you can manage it, yes, Fell said. That other car they'd heard, the one with Ginsler and possibly formed by a board, seemed to have gone straight down to the next dreadnought in the ring. It didn't seem like it would be a good idea to just burst in full board behind them, especially if Presser had other surprises prepared for unwanted company. Far better if they could bypass that ship entirely and find a way to come up on it from below. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Cloud's head twitch. Commander? The stormtrooper asked. Did you get that? Get what? Fell asked, straining his ears against the rumbling. My comm link just chirped, Cloud said. Mine too. Shadow confirmed. Sounded like someone sending a message burst. Fell frowned. He hadn't heard any such noise from his own comlink, but then, the pervasive rumbling could easily have masked it. The stormtroopers, with their comlinks built into their helmets, would be less affected by outside noises. Could you get any kind of fix on it? He asked. Either direction or distance? Negative, Cloud said. My gear wasn't rigged for that. Well, rig it now, Fell ordered, looking around. Suddenly, the car seemed a little smaller and a lot more vulnerable. And let's risk a little more speed, he added. If Presser's talking to his friends, I want us out of here as soon as possible. And if it wasn't Presser? Shadow asked. Fell looked up at the ceiling. Then I want us out of here even faster. Chapter 14 The doorway opened into another storage room, identical to the one they'd come in through except that in this one there was no turbolift access door. It also didn't appear that any of the supply crates piled behind their meshwork panels had ever been touched. Neither had the crates in the next room back or in the room behind that. It's one thing to talk about ten years' worth of supplies for something this big, Luke commented as they walked past the stacked crates toward the next door leading aft. It's something else to actually see them. And this is just one level, Mara murmured, an odd sensation creeping through her as she gazed at the rows of stacked cartons. All those people, nearly fifty thousand of them, all gone. Destroyed in a matter of seconds or minutes or hours. Murdered on the orders of the man she'd once proudly served. Hey! She shook off the mood. Luke was looking at her, concern in his face. You all right? He asked. Sure, she assured him. I'm fine. Like she could actually fool him. More ghosts from the past? He asked quietly. She looked over at Drask, off examining a stack of crates a few meters away. It's strange, she told her husband softly. I thought I'd been through this already. That I'd put it all behind me. But back on the chaff envoy, I actually started feeling. I don't know. It's hard to explain. You started feeling comfortable? Luke suggested. Mara tried out the word in her mind. Yes, I suppose that's it, she agreed. Fell and this new 501st Legion seemed so different from what Palpatine had created that it felt like something I could actually enjoy being a part of. Luke's forehead creased. You're not seriously thinking of taking Park up on his offer of a job with the Empire of the Hand, are you? Of course not. Mara hesitated. Well, no, that's not entirely accurate, she confessed. I mean, I certainly wouldn't go anywhere without you. But at the same time, 
she shook her head. I know, he said. The New Republic hasn't exactly been a shining example of how to run a galaxy lately, has it? Mara snorted. The understatement of the month, she said. All those stupid little brush wars and conflicts. I thought they'd all die down after we finally found that intact copy of the Kama's document. But half of them are still simmering, and the Senate hasn't done a thing to stop them. That's not entirely true, Luke said. But you do have a point. Things were a lot quieter under the Empire, weren't they? At least until your rebellion got going, Mara countered. Then it got noisy again. We tried, Luke said, smiling back. The smile faded, and he shrugged fractionally. You can't play the what-ifs, Mara. Palpatine may have suppressed all those regional conflicts, but he also suppressed freedom and justice, especially for non-humans. If someone else had been in charge, but we'll never know. I understand all that, Mara said. But that's not really the point. The point is that I was just starting to feel kindly, even nostalgic, toward the Empire. She gestured at the dusty stacks of crates around her. And then I come face to face with something like this, supplies carefully laid in for people he knew he was going to have murdered. She let her hand drop to her side. There was just something about the cold-bloodedness of it that was a sudden kick in the teeth, that's all. I know, Luke said, taking her hand and squeezing it gently. You never really saw the results of Palpatine's policies, did you? No, not usually, Mara said with a sigh. Not the big ones anyway. Alderin and that sort. Mostly I dealt with individuals or small groups, and half of them were imperial officials suspected of embezzlement or treason. I never saw anything on outbound flight scale. It makes sense that he shielded you from as much of that as possible, Luke pointed out. You might have started having doubts, and he couldn't risk that. Jedi? Dras called. Mara turned around. The general had moved to another stack of crates near the aft set of doors and was shining his glow rod on one about halfway to the ceiling. Come. What is it? Luke asked as he and Mara crossed to the other. These two stacks, Drask said, indicating them with his glow rod. They have been moved here from somewhere else. Mara frowned at Luke, getting a similarly puzzled look in exchange. What do you mean? Luke asked. How do you know? In the previous storerooms these stacks all followed a specific pattern, Drask said. Foodstuffs of several particular types, clothing, replacement components, various other types of supplies, emergency equipment, and so on. They were all placed in specific positions, with the proportions of each type always the same. Luke looked at Mara. Is this making any sense to you? He asked. Actually, yes, she said. If you proportion out each room according to the rate of expected supply usage, you can more or less empty one area at a time and don't have to keep going back and forth among half a dozen storerooms for what you want. That would also make it quicker and easier to apportion things if you decided to plant a colony somewhere. Ah, Luke said, nodding. I get it. You give your colonists a dreadnought and, say, two levels worth of supplies. No sorting needed. You just take aboard everything from those two levels. Right, Mara said. And you say these stacks are out of order? Yes. Drask gestured. This group consists of electrical and fluid maintenance supplies. It should instead be foodstuffs. I'll take your word for it, Luke said, looking around. Well, it doesn't look like they came from anywhere in here. Unless someone rearranged the whole room, Mara pointed out. No, Drask said. 
The other stacks are properly placed. Maybe the next room back then, Luke suggested. Let's take a look. He led the way back to the smaller of the two aft doors and touched the release. Nothing happened. That's funny, he said, frowning as he touched the release again. Again, the door didn't budge. Let's try the big door, Mara suggested, moving over to the cargo hatchway and tapping the release for that one. It didn't move either. Now that, Luke said thoughtfully, is very peculiar. All the other doors have worked just fine. Perhaps there is something in there the survivors do not wish us to see, Drask suggested, his voice ominous. You have lightsabers. Cut it open. Let's not be too hasty, Luke said, running a hand along the smaller door. Maybe we can do it the easy way. Mara? Mara pulled her lightsaber from her belt and stepped to the doorway. Ready. Okay. Luke took a deep breath, and Mara could sense him stretching out to the force. A moment later, with a creak of metal that had been sitting too long in one spot, the door began to slide up into the ceiling. Mara was ready. The gap was barely waist-high when she ducked under the rising panel, igniting her lightsaber as she leapt into the room. But there was nothing there except another storeroom, empty except for the usual stacks of boxes, exactly like all the previous four storerooms they'd looked at. She frowned lowering the lightsaber blade a little. No, not exactly. Back toward the center of the room, half a dozen sections of the mesh had been cleared out. And inside them. Mara? All clear, she called, closing down her lightsaber and looking around. Lying against the near wall was a piece of slightly twisted girder. Stretching out to the force, she lifted it, and set it upright beneath the door Luke was still holding up. See if that'll hold it, she said. Carefully, Luke lowered the door onto the girder. The metal creaked but held. Odd thing to have lying around, he commented, frowning at the girder as he ducked under the door and into the storeroom. I haven't seen anything like that in any of the other rooms. You haven't seen anything like this, either. Mara said as Drask came in behind Luke. Take a look. Furniture storage? Drask asked, frowning past Luke's shoulder. It's a little more interesting than that, Mara said as the three of them crossed over to the cleared sections. The contents were little more than a jumbled mess of broken furniture and tangled furnishings. But to her the signs were obvious. You can see three cots in that first one. They've been a little broken up, but there are definitely three of them. Looks like there were four in the next. Probably four in that back one there, too. That round thing was probably part of a small table, Luke said, pointing. I don't see any chairs, though. Perhaps they had only stools, Drask suggested. Those short pieces, perhaps. Right. Mara agreed. There are probably a lot of other pieces tangled in with those blankets and draperies, too. And of course, those boxy things have got to be portable fresher stations. But this makes no sense, Drask objected. What you are describing are living quarters. Yet the vessels above are adequately intact. Why would anyone have chosen to live here instead? Maybe all the dreadnoughts were too badly damaged right after the battle, Luke suggested. It may have taken a while for the droids to make them livable again. Mara shook her head. You're both missing the point. What did we have to do to get in here? We had to lift, Luke broke off. Are you saying this was a prison? What else? Mara asked. Small cubicles with minimal furnishings and not much privacy, stuck away from everywhere else in the place, all of it behind a door that doesn't open. 
What else could it be? Interesting, Drass commented. It would seem that your outbound flight experiment was a failure from the start. For there to have been a need for a prison so quickly implies the passengers were not well chosen. Or that something drastic happened to them, Mara said. Some kind of space madness or something. Any chance it could have been a medical quarantine instead? Luke suggested. Unlikely, Drask said. There are not enough beds here for a large disease outbreak. A smaller problem would surely have been better dealt with in the vessel's own facilities. He's right, Mara agreed. Besides, I don't see any sign of medical equipment in here. She gestured into the area. And you see what else is in here? Luke frowned. No. I see, Drask said grimly. There are no bodies. Or even the remains of bodies, Mara confirmed. Which either means someone got in through that door sometime in the past fifty years and disposed of the dead. Or else they got out on their own, Luke finished for her. That's what I'm thinking, Mara agreed soberly. I'm also wondering if the timing of the breakout might have had an effect on the battle. Or perhaps it is connected with the unexplained appearance of this vessel in Chiss space, Drask pointed out. That mystery has still not been solved. No, it hasn't, Mara said. Luke, do you have any idea what sort of justice system was in place during that era? Specifically, what sort of people might the Jedi on outbound flight have locked up this way? I don't... But I can't see why anyone but the most violent or psychotic sorts would be buried this far away from the rest of the expedition. There would certainly have been a break on each of the dreadnoughts for dealing with standard lawbreakers. A whisper of sensation touched Mara's mind. Someone's coming, she said, unhooking her lightsaber from her belt. Who? Drask asked, drawing his charik. Guardian Presser and his forces? Mara focused her mind, trying to isolate and identify the approaching minds. They definitely seemed familiar, but they were still too far away to identify. Luke got there first. It's all right, he said, returning his own lightsaber to his belt. It's Fell and the stormtroopers. Is Aristocra Chafor and Bintrano with them? Drask asked. No, Mara said. Neither are Fisa or the Jeruns. It's just the five Imperials. They pledge to protect him, Drask said ominously. Why are they not with him? I don't know, Luke said, heading for the propped open door. Let's go ask them. They met up with the Imperials' two rooms back toward the turbo lifts. Well, well, Fell commented as the two groups crossed the room toward each other. I certainly wasn't expecting to find you three here. Not that I'm displeased, of course. What did you think of our host's little trap? Where is Aristocra Chaffo Arambintrano? Dras cut in before either Luke or Mara could answer. Why are you not protecting him? Relax, General, he said. He's hardly alone up there. Your three warriors are with him, remember? Besides, if Presser wanted any of us dead, he could have done it long before now, Mara added. She's right, Fell agreed. I'm sure the Aristocra's fine. Your calmness is very reassuring, Drask bit out. Do you even know where he is? Not exactly, Fell said. But from the sounds that turbolift car made as it headed down, we're pretty sure they're on D5 the next dreadnought around the circle from where we came in. Then why did you not follow them after you made your own escape? Drask asked. 
because I thought it might make more tactical sense to come in from a direction they weren't expecting, Fell said, starting to sound a little annoyed himself. There are three other turbolift tubes we can use to get up to D5, one straight aft along this deck, the other two fore and aft around that direction. He gestured to his right. Wait a minute, Mara said. If the dreadnoughts are in a ring, shouldn't the turbolift connections be on a lower deck instead of this one? Fell shook his head. It has to do with the way the gravity directions were set up, he explained. All the dreadnoughts are oriented with their bellies pointing inward toward the supply core, while the supply core runs its own gravity toward its own center, sort of like a cylindrical planet, with the lower decks down from the upper ones. That means that from any of the dreadnoughts, down is always toward the core, while from the core up is always toward the nearest dreadnought. Strange approach, Mara commented. Fell shrugged. My guess is that they probably figured doing it any other way would mean attaching the connecting pylons in different places on each of the dreadnoughts. This way, all the ships could be modified in exactly the same way, with two turbolift pylons connecting to the starboard belly, fore and aft, and the other two to the port side belly, fore and aft. It certainly doesn't matter to the crew, all the gravity changes are handled automatically as you travel from one place to another with the turbolift cars rotating so that you're matched with your destination by the time you get there. So Formby and the others are where, exactly? Luke asked. Dreadnought 5, Fell said. D5 for short. The one we came into from the chaff envoy was D4. So that wasn't the primary command ship? Fell shook his head. I assumed it would be. Two, but the labels on the turbolift controls clearly showed we came in on either D4 or D5. Given the ship's orientations, the one on the surface is definitely D4. I presume you are getting this information from the outbound flight data cards you have in your possession? Drask asked. The data cards that used to be in my possession, yes, fell corrected. Fortunately, we'd studied the layout before they were stolen. They were stolen? Drask asked, his eyes narrowing. When? While we were helping put out that fire just after we left Krusty, Fell said. Whoever said it apparently did so as a diversion to get aboard our transport. Drask looked at Luke and Mara then back at Fell. Why was I not informed? Mara sensed Fell's hesitation and wondered if he would have either the honesty or the audacity to tell Drask that he hadn't been told because he was one of the suspects. She rather hoped he would. Drask's reaction would probably be very interesting. To her mild disappointment, Fell went with the diplomatic answer instead. It didn't seem likely the thief could be found regardless, he explained. I thought we might have an advantage if the culprit didn't know we noticed the loss. What advantage did you expect to have? I don't know, exactly, Fell conceded. I just thought there might be one. You just thought there might be one. In a being of lesser inherent dignity, Mara reflected, Drask's words and tone might have sounded small-minded or even childish. But from a command officer of the Chiss, it came across as bitingly and righteously angry. A neat trick, that. In the future, Commander Fell, you will not think when aboard a vessel of the Chiss Ascendancy. You will instead bring any and all concerns of this sort to the commanding officer at once. He will decide what thinking is to be done. Is that understood? Completely, General, Fell said, his voice under careful control. Good, Drask said, not sounding particularly mollified. Now. You will lead us to these alternative turbolifts so that we may rejoin Aristocra Chaffor and Ventrano. Just a moment, Luke said. Would the command ship have been designated D1? Right, Fell said. So with six dreadnoughts, D4 would be all the way on the far side of the circle from it. Luke persisted. 
Right again, Fell said, his forehead wrinkling. Is this important at this precise moment? Drask put in impatiently. It might be, yes, Luke told him. Because logically, D1 is where they should have been flying outbound flight from. So why is that ship the one that ended up farthest underground when they crash-landed? Interesting question, Fell agreed thoughtfully. They must have been having some serious control problems there at the end. Maybe, Luke said. Or maybe they had unwanted help on the command deck. Indeed, Drask said, the impatience in his voice temporarily subdued by a touch of interest. The criminals, perhaps? Criminals? Fell asked, blinking. There seems to be a makeshift prison back there, Luke said, gesturing aft. No human or alien remains, though. Hmm, Fell said. And considering the shape the dreadnoughts would have been in after the battle, they might well have been in the best position to get to the command deck and make trouble. Or we could have it completely backward, Mara warned. Maybe the prisoners were the ones in command, and someone else managed to get outbound flight flipped over this way trying to stop them. Interesting speculation, Drask said. The moment of interest had passed, and he was getting impatient again. But this is all ancient history. Perhaps, Luke said. But then, ancient history is why we're here, isn't it? We must rejoin Aristocra Chafor and Mentrano, Drask insisted. We will, Luke promised. But first, I want to go have a look at D1. Anyone going with me? Mara looked around the group. From Fell's expression, she could tell that he wanted to go and she could sense definite interest from the four stormtroopers, as well. But Drask's agitation was practically bouncing off the stacks of crates, and once again Fell's sense of diplomacy won out. Thanks, but we'll wait for the second tour, he said, turning to Drask. Whenever you're ready, General, we'll escort you to D5. For a moment Drask's eyes bored into Luke's face as if estimating his chances of either talking him or ordering him out of going on what he clearly considered a time-wasting side trip. Apparently, he decided it wasn't worth trying. Thank you, Commander, he said, turning back to face Fell. You said there were three other turbolifts available? Yes, Fell said. Actually, the best approach would probably be to go a little farther around the core and escort Luke and Mara to the turbo if they'll need to get to D1. We can use the same one to get to D6, from which we can then travel to D5. It sounds as if that will be a longer trip than going directly to D5, Drask pointed out. It will be a little, Fell conceded. But it's occurred to me that if Presser's people are hiding any surprises we ought to know about, they'll most likely be on either D1, D2, or D6. Why? Because they're the three farthest underground, which means they have the best radiation shielding, Fell explained. Luke and Mara will already be checking out D1. If we at least take a look at D6 on our way to D5, we'll have two of the three covered. Drask hesitated, then nodded. Very well, he said. Provided you do not propose to search the entire dreadnought with only the six of us. We'll just take a quick look, Fell promised. If they're using the other dreadnoughts for anything at all, it should be obvious pretty quickly. Very well, Drask said again. Lead on. Fell nodded. Stormtroopers, escort formation. This way, General. Chapter 15 This is the main school area, Yulier said, pointing across the corridor toward a room with a small plaque beside the door identifying it as a seven fire control room. A neatly printed sign had been fastened to the wall above the plaque that read preliminary tiers. All the lower tiers are in the complex of rooms back there. He went on. 
There's also a university of sorts two decks above us, up where the main scientific and technical sections of the ship were. Interesting, Jinsler said, looking at the door and wondering if he dared ask to go in and take a look. What courses do you teach? Everything we can, of course, Yulia said, half turning to look at Evelyn and her mother, walking silently behind Formby. This is actually Instructor Tabori's field of expertise. Instructor, would you care to elaborate? Many of the records were lost in the devastation, of course, Rosemary said. Either destroyed or buried in the wreckage of D1 where we couldn't get to them. She waved at the schoolroom door. But the survivors had fair amounts of skills and knowledge among them. So as soon as they could they set up a school to teach the children what they would need to know. In the lower tiers we teach history, science, reading, galactic languages, political science, and a few others, the usual curriculum of a republic school back home. At the university level, though of course it's not a real university, we teach mechanics and electronics, higher mathematics, basic astrogation and starship operation, plus the sorts of things we'll need when we finally get out of here and settle down on a real world again. Ah, Jinsler said. And you were trained as an instructor? She shrugged. That's what I do now, but my actual training is in meteorology and music. I'm not very good at the latter, though. She smiled down at the girl beside her. Evelyn's much better than I am. And of course, there are a lot of advanced maintenance classes. That being particularly important to our survival, Counselor Tarcosa added gruffly, glaring briefly at Rosemary. Apparently, her comment about leaving outbound flight wasn't sitting well with him. Even with many of the old droids still functional, this ship still chews up a huge number of worker hours and repairs and maintenance. And the droids need constant maintenance of their own. Jinsler nodded. What about basic life necessities? He asked. Food, water, and energy? Fortunately, we have all of that in abundance, Yolier said. The central storage core suffered only minor damage in the devastation, and we were able to bring the D5 and D6 fusion generators back online before the emergency power supplies were exhausted. You speak as if you were there. Formby suggested. Yulier favored him with a somewhat brittle smile. Yes, I was, he said. I was twenty-two, in fact, when your people viciously attacked and destroyed us. It took every bit of Jinsler's strength to keep his face from reacting. With all of Yulier's politeness and hospitality, and the almost homey atmosphere of the place as the inhabitants had fixed it up, He'd nearly forgotten what had actually happened here. Hearing Yulia's straightforward reminder had hit him harder than he would have expected. Yes, Formby murmured. Though it was not the will of either the nine ruling families or of the Chiss people that that happened. Well, it was the will of someone with blue skin and red eyes, Yulia said bluntly. And I'm constrained to point out that even after all that, Knowing that it had happened, you waited until now to come see what had become of us. He peered closely at Formby. Or is this your first time here? Have you actually been watching us all along, just for your own amusement? We didn't even know this vessel had survived until a few handfuls of days ago. Even then, we had no reason to assume anyone had survived. Then why did you come? Yulier countered. Was it the ship itself you wanted? Secrets from the Republic you hoped to plunder? He turned his unblinking stare on Jinsler. Or was it you and this so-called New Republic of yours? Were you the ones who wanted it? Jinsler shook his head. We came solely from a desire to see the place where so many of our people had died, he said, trying to match Formby's calm diplomatic tone. 
and to honor those who gave their lives defending our people, Berj spoke up from the rear. That's correct, Jinsler said. No one here wants to take anything away from you. Yolyar smiled coldly. No. Of course not. The smile vanished. At the very least I'm sure you didn't expect to find anyone aboard who still remembered, he said. You see, Ambassador Jinsler, I recognize your name. I knew that other Jinsler, too, the one who deserted us at our time of greatest need. Who was she, a relative? Sister? Cousin? She was my sister, Jinsler said, staring at him in disbelief. Lorena, desert these people in the middle of trouble? No, that had to be a mistake. Your sister, Yulia repeated, the darkness in his voice deepening. Deeply beloved, of course, which is why you've come all this way to honor her memory. He crossed his arms across his chest defiantly. Well, we don't honor her memory here, Ambassador. Are you still so eager to help us? Jinsler took a careful breath. She wasn't beloved, he said, fighting to control the trembling of emotion flowing into his voice. At least, not by me. Yulia lifted his eyebrows with polite skepticism. No. No. Jinsler looked the other man straight in the eye. As a matter of fact, I hated her. The statement seemed to throw Yulia completely off his stride. He blinked then frowned, opened his mouth, then closed it again. Of course you did, he said at last, clearly just to have something to say. He eyed Jinsler another moment, then turned resolutely back to form by. The fact remains that it was your people who attacked us, he said, apparently trying to get back on course with his earlier tirade. What do you and these nine ruling families of yours intend to do about that? Formby opened his mouth. I'd like to see the school, Jinsler put in, suddenly tired of hearing Yulia talk. As long as we're here anyway. Again, Yulia seemed to falter. He looked at Jinsler, hesitated, then nodded. Certainly, he said. Instructor Tabori, perhaps you'd be kind enough to show the ambassador around? Ah, uh, sure, Rosemary said her face puckering uncertainly. Jinsler's comment about his sister had apparently thrown her for a loop, too. This way, Ambassador. She turned and headed toward the door at a quick walk, her daughter beside her. Jinsler followed, fighting his way through the images and memories swirling around him. This is the second-tier classroom. Jinsler blinked the images away to find himself standing in a low-ceiling room equipped with perhaps a dozen small desks arranged in a circle. In the center of the circle was a hollow projector showing a tree with three animals of various species standing beneath it. The children at the desks, four- and five-year-olds by the look of them, were busily scribbling away on their data pads while a young woman wandered around the outside of the circle silently inspecting their work. I see, Jinsler said trying to generate some genuine interest in the proceedings. Art class? Art plus elementary zoology and botany, she told him. We combine disciplines and lessons as much as possible. The third tier classroom is through here. She led the way through an archway into another room with larger desks and no students or teachers. Run out of thirders? Jinsler asked. They must be on a field trip, she said, crossing over to a larger desk in the corner and peering down at a data pad lying there. Yes, they're down in the nursery today learning about the proper care and feeding of babies. Sounds like fun, Jinsler commented. And the art of proper changing, too, no doubt. You said down? I thought we were on the lowest deck. The nursery's on six, the next dreadnought down, Pressa's voice said. Jinsler turned, vaguely surprised to see the guardian walking behind him. 
Preoccupied with his memories, he hadn't even noticed the other follow them inside. There's less solar radiation down there, so that's where all the pregnant women and those with children under three are housed. And their families too, of course, Rosemary added. We'd all moved down there except that it suffered so much more damage in the battle that there's less usable space for people to live in. And besides, Director Yulier doesn't want us living too close to. Rosemary, Presser cut her off sharply. Rosemary flushed. Sorry. Sorry for what? Ginsler asked. So, did you really want to see the school? Presser asked. Or was that just an excuse to get away from Yulier and his ranting? Ginsler hesitated, studying Presser's face. The man's eyes were hard, his expression set in pale stone. It would not, he decided suddenly, be a good idea to lie to this man. Mostly the latter, he conceded. He seems so angry. Wouldn't you be? Presser countered. The universe turned upside down, with everything you planned to do with your life suddenly cut off at the knees. I suppose, Ginsler said. Are he and the other two the last of the original survivors? No, there are ten left, Presser said. But the other seven are old and weak and keep pretty much to themselves. Most of the 57 survivors were either injured in the attack or suffered badly in the months after outbound flight arrived here, Rosemary said. It affected both their health and their lifespans, which is why there are only 10 left. We're talking about the adults, of course, Presser added. There were also several children like me who were alive during the devastation but were too young to know what exactly was going on. We certainly didn't have any plans for our lives yet. His eyes bored into Ginsler. Though, of course, plans or otherwise, our lives were pretty well destroyed, too. Tell it to Aristocra Formby, Ginsler advised, holding his gaze evenly. He's the one accepting guilt for all this, not me. To his mild surprise, Presser actually smiled. You're right he said without apology. I'm sure Yulia will remember to bring that up. Did you really hate your sister? Evelyn asked. Jinsler looked down at the girl. She was gazing up at him, her eyes steady, her face expressionless. Yes, he said. Does that frighten you? Why should it frighten me? She asked. Maybe you're wondering if I hate all Jedi, Jinsler suggested. Maybe you're wondering if I hate you. No, Presser bit out before Evelyn could answer. Whatever you're thinking, stop it right now. There's absolutely nothing special about her. Jinsler frowned. An unexpectedly harsh reaction, far more vehement than the comment deserved. I just meant... No. Presser said, his voice softer and under better control now but just as firm. You're imagining things. Leave it alone. Jinsler looked at Evelyn, and in his mind's eye he saw her calmly leading them into the turbolift trap. Unafraid of armed alien strangers, as if she somehow knew they wouldn't shoot her the minute her back was turned. And then stepping casually through the doorway with exquisitely precise timing as the trap was triggered. He looked at Rosemary. Am I imagining things? He asked. Rosemary sent a hooded look at her brother. Jord worries about things, she said obliquely. There's nothing to worry about, Jinsler assured her. If she has Jedi abilities, I said to let it alone, Presser warned harshly. She's not going to have that kind of life. I won't let her. Neither will Rosemary. You hear me? Jinsler swallowed. The guardian, he suddenly noticed, had his hand wrapped around the grip of his blaster, 
and the knuckles were white. I hear you, he said quietly. But you're making a mistake. You just keep your mouth shut, Presser said. His voice was still tight, but his gun hand seemed to have relaxed a bit. You hear me? Jinsler sighed to himself. Yes. I won't mention it again. Why did you hate your sister? Evelyn asked. Jinsler looked at her again, feeling a tightness in his chest like a logjam starting to break up. For more than half a century he kept these thoughts and feelings locked away in the dark privacy of his own mind, never speaking of them to family or friends or confidants. The closest he'd ever come to even hinting at them before today had been his admission to Luke and Mara that he and Lorana hadn't parted on good terms. Perhaps he'd kept all of it in too long. She was my older sister, he said. Third of four children, if you care. I was the youngest. We lived on Coruscant, pretty much in the shadow of the Jedi Temple. My parents worked there, in fact as maintenance engineers on the electrical equipment. His gaze drifted away from his audience to one of the empty desks, where a spare data pad was lying. My parents adored Jedi, he said, the words coming out with difficulty. Adored them, honored them, practically worshipped them, in fact. Did the Jedi return the affection? Presser asked. Jinsler snorted. What makes you think the grand exalted guardians of the Republic even noticed a couple of lowly workers scurrying around beneath their feet? He shook his head. Of course not. They had better things to do with their time. But that didn't matter to my parents. They still loved the Jedi, and they thought the greatest thing in the universe would be if they could have a Jedi child of their own. As soon as each of their children was old enough, They hustled us over there and had them run us through the tests. Was your sister the only one who made it? Rosemary asked. Jinsler nodded. Right at ten months, he said, his throat aching. It was the happiest day of my parents' life. How old were you when that happened? Evelyn asked. I wasn't even born yet, Jinsler said. Parents weren't allowed to even see their children once they'd been taken into the temple, and my parents lost their jobs. Still, they would hang around outside and finagle a glimpse of her every once in a while as she passed by. I was four when I first saw her. The same age I was when I first met her, Presser murmured. Jinsler blinked. You remember her? Of course. Presser said, sounding surprised that he would even have to ask. Jedi Lorana, we called her. What, I look too young to you. It's just that so much has happened since then that it seems like, you know. So what did you think of her? Presser shrugged too casually. She seemed nice enough, he said, his voice guarded. At least for a Jedi. I didn't know any of them very well, of course. Yes, I suppose she could have become a nice person by then, Jinsler said, and immediately regretted it. No, that's not fair, he amended. She was probably just as nice when she was six. I just... I suppose I wasn't in a position to notice. Let me guess, Presser said. You'd already failed your own test. Very good, Jinsler said sourly. My parents never said anything about it, but I knew without asking that they were disappointed. Anyway, when I was four they brought me to the temple. The Jedi were coming out for some kind of public holiday. We waited and waited. He took a deep breath. And then, finally, there she was. He closed his eyes, a whole flood of hated memories sweeping back through him. 
The rustling of Lorana's robes as she walked by them, a tall Jedi striding along watchfully beside her, the sudden tight grip of his mother's hands on his shoulders as she bent down and whispered Lorana's name in his ear. They were proud of her, he went on in a low voice. So very proud of her. I take it you weren't impressed? Presser asked. Jinsler shrugged. She was six. I was four. How impressed should I have been? What happened? Rosemary asked. Did she talk to you? No, Jinsler told her. The Jedi who was with her spotted us and leaned over to say something. She looked in our direction, hesitated a second, and then the two of them turned and headed off. She never even got within ten meters of us. That must have been disappointing, Rosemary murmured. You'd think so, wouldn't you? Jinsler said, hearing the bitterness in his voice. But not with my parents. Even as she disappeared into the crowd of Jedi, I could feel them practically swimming in love and respect and adoration. None of it, of course, directed at me. But they loved you too, didn't they? Evelyn asked, her voice low and earnest. I mean, they must have loved you too. Even after all these years, Jinsler's throat ached at the memories. I don't know, he told her quietly. I'm sure they, I think they tried. But the whole time I was growing up it was clear that Lorana was the real center of their universe. She wasn't even there, but she was still their center. They talked about her all the time, held her up as an example of what people could make of their lives, practically made a shrine to her in a corner of the conversation room. I can't even count the number of times a scolding included the words not something your sister Lorana would ever do somewhere in the middle of it. Setting a standard none of the rest of you could ever live up to, Rosemary said. Not a chance in the galaxy, Jinsler agreed tiredly. I tried, you know. I went into my father's own field, electronics, and pushed myself until I'd gone farther than he'd ever made it farther than he'd ever hoped to go. Droid repair and pattern design, starship electronics maintenance, comm equipment architecture and repair. And politics? Evelyn murmured. Jinsler looked down at her, startled. She was gazing at him with a disturbingly knowing look. Abruptly, he got it. Ambassador Jinsler. In the rush of ache and memory and old bitterness, He'd completely forgotten the role he was playing here. I tried as hard as I could to make myself into someone they could love as much as her, he said, wrenching himself out of his meanderings and back to the point. And of course, they said they were proud of me and of what I'd done. But I could see in their eyes that I still didn't measure up. Not to Lorana's standards. Did you ever see her again? Rosemary asked. Lorana, I mean. I saw her a couple more times at the temple, Jinsler told her. Always at a distance, of course. Then we met just before outbound flight left the Republic. He looked away. I don't want to talk about that. For a long moment no one spoke. Jinsler stared at the empty classroom, watching the memories still parading themselves in front of his eyes wondering why exactly he just bared his soul to a trio of total strangers that way. He must be getting old. It was Presser who eventually broke the silence. We should get back to the others, he said, his voice sounding odd. You'll you're suspicious enough of us as it is. We don't want him to think we're planning some conspiracy against him. Jinsler took a deep breath, willing the ghosts of the past to go away. The ghosts, as usual, ignored him. Yes, he said. Of course. They retraced their steps through the classrooms, Rosemary leading the way with Evelyn beside her. Not held quite so closely to her side, Presser noted as he fell in behind Jinsler like a good peacekeeper should. 
Apparently, his sister didn't feel quite as nervous about their visitor as she had a few minutes ago. As for Presser himself, he didn't know what to think anymore. He'd been fully prepared to hate Ginsler and the others, or at the very least to be extremely distrustful of them, their words, and their motives. But now, all that nice convenient caution had been thrown for a twist. True, Ginsler's story just now could have been a complete lie, a performance carefully calculated to lull suspicions and evoke sympathy. But Presser didn't think so. He'd always been good at reading people, and something about Ginsler's revelation had struck him as genuine. Still, that didn't necessarily mean anything as far as the rest of the group was concerned. He caught the subtle hint in Evelyn's question about politics. Clearly, Ginsler was no ambassador, or at least nobody who'd been officially sanctioned in that post. Either he was part of some complicated plot, which was seeming less and less likely, or else he'd wormed his way into this expedition under false pretenses. Either way, the logical conclusion was that the chief Chiss, Formby, was the one in actual charge here, and so far Presser hadn't been able to read him at all. Hopefully, Yulia was making some progress on that front. The outer school door slid open, and Rosemary stepped out into the corridor and nearly collided with Trilly as he shot past at a fast jog. Sorry, the peacekeeper muttered, managing to avoid running them down. He caught sight of Presser and came to an abrupt halt. Jorid, I need to talk to you, he said. Presser glanced at Ginsler. Letting the pseudo-ambassador wander around alone would not be a good idea, he knew. But the look in Trilly's eyes was one that demanded immediate attention, and in private. Rosemary, will you escort the ambassador to the meeting chamber? He asked his sister. I'll be along in a minute. Certainly, Rosemary said. This way, ambassador. Walking side by side, she, Evelyn, and Ginsler headed down the corridor. What is it? Presser asked when he judged the group far enough out of earshot. I went to lock down the turbolift controls like you said, Trilly said, his voice tight. The other two trap cars, two and six, aren't mid-tube anymore. Presser felt his stomach tighten. You mean they? No, that's impossible. We'd have heard the crash. I'd sure think so, Trilly agreed. But if the cars aren't there, and they didn't smash themselves to a group pulp, it means the Jedi and Imperials somehow ungimmicked them and got out. Presser hissed softly between his teeth. This was not good. This was very not good. All right, he said slowly. They didn't come down here. There are enough people wandering around that we'd surely have heard about it if they had. That means they either went back up to four or else they're down in the storage core. Could you tell where the cars ended up? Trilly shook his head. We messed up all the positioning sensors when we rewired the cars way back when. We'd have to physically go in there and see. Yeah, Presser said. Okay, go scare up a couple of maintenance droids and send them into the shaft, one in each direction. Then get hold of Bells and Amberson and have them lock down all access from four. If they went up, they're probably planning to come back with reinforcements. And if they went down? Presser grimaced. From the supply corps, the intruders would have access to both the main colony here on five as well as the nursery on six. And of course. You think they know about quarantine? Trilly asked echoing Presser's own thought. I don't know how they could, Presser said. But they're Jedi. Who knows what they know? Well, we sure as vacuum can't let them get back there, Trilly warned darkly. If they find those people, worse if they spring them. He shook his head. Right, Presser said grimly. Who's on quarantine duty? Perry and Quinn's. Trilly said. 
You want me to send reinforcements? Presser snorted. Like who? Yeah, Trilly said with a sigh. We don't exactly have an army here, do we? Hardly, Presser agreed, frowning back over Trilly's shoulder. In the distance, in the direction of the forward turbolift lobby, some of the lights seemed to have gone off. Odd. About all we can do is warn them. Better alert the maintenance crews to be on the lookout, too. Wired comms only on those. I want the comm link jamming kept in place for now. Right, Trilly said. This could get ugly, Jorid. Presser looked the other way down the corridor, where glimpses of his sister, Anise, and Jinsler could still be seen through colonists going about their business. Yes, he said. I know. Chapter 16 The last ten meters of the turbolift pylon leading to the command dreadnought were crushed and twisted, as if that part of the pylon had been hit with a powerful impact. The final two meters of that, in addition, were blocked by what seemed to be the remains of a car that had been caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. Even with lightsabers, it was a delicate task to cut enough of it away to get through. Finally, Mara said as she sliced through one last section of car wall to reveal the tube doors, as mangled and distorted as the tube itself. Maybe we should have gone aft and tried the pylon back there. I doubt it would have been any faster, Luke said, stepping forward and carefully sniffing the air drifting in through the slightly open door. It smelled dank and stale, but otherwise livable. The door markings were upside down, he noted, which meant that the turbolift car hadn't made the usual rotation as it arrived, and D1's gravity wasn't functioning. If the gravity was off, the rest of the environmental system probably was, too, with the air he was smelling just the leakage from the rest of the outbound flight complex. They would have to make sure they didn't get oxygen starved. Don't forget all the debris we had to wade through when we first came in up on D4. He reminded her as he stepped back and gestured an invitation toward the doors. Thrawn probably made even more of a mess of the turbo laser and shield sections on this one. I suppose. With deft flicks of her lightsaber, Mara carved an opening through the door. Shall we? It wasn't as bad as Luke had expected, at least as far as basic travel difficulties were concerned. It was strange to walk along the ceiling with the deck above them, and of course the planetoid's own gravity was far weaker than what they were used to, but that in itself didn't present any particular problems. The bulkheads and floors were horrendously crumpled and twisted, but there was relatively little actual debris lying around to contend with. Occasionally they had to use their lightsabers to clear away a support strut that was blocking a doorway and twice they had to use the force to move a wayward console that had broken away from its connections and was lying, dust-covered, across their path. But most of the obstacles were easily dealt with, and a handful of the permlights had survived to supplement the illumination from their glow rods. The debris itself wasn't the tough part. The tough part was the bodies. Not really bodies, of course at least not the sort Luke had seen in the aftermath of the many battles he'd been through in his lifetime. After five decades, there was little left but piles of bones and scraps of clothing to show where someone had fallen. Sometimes he could see evidence of how death had come, severely broken skulls from flying equipment, or pulverized bones showing where a hit from a laser or missile blast had turned part of the inner hull into deadly shrapnel. Most of the time, though, the remains showed no indication of what had happened. Those crewers, most likely, had either died of suffocation or from the impact when the dreadnought had slammed into the gravel pile where outbound flight now lay. You can see where the hull's been repaired, Mara commented as they picked their way forward toward the command deck. See the weld marks? Luke looked where she was pointing her glow rod. The marks were very professional, precisely following the jagged hull cracks. Repair droids? Definitely, Mara agreed. 
The attack must have smashed the hull in enough places to bypass the blast doors and emergency compartmentalization system, which then suffocated any of the crew and passengers still alive. But it didn't put all the droids out of commission, and they automatically began emergency repairs. By the time anyone else got here, enough of the ship was airtight again for them to fly it. The damage seemed to increase as they moved forward. So did the number of bones. The crew must have been trying to escape up here as Thrawn took out the turbo laser and shield blisters, Mara said as Luke sliced open yet another frozen blast door. There normally wouldn't have been this many people this far forward. Especially since most of the ones on duty would have been farther forward on the command deck. Luke agreed, eyeing her closely. How are you doing? I'm all right, she said. Why? Shouldn't I be? I just wondered, he said. I mean down here with more. With more evidence of what Thrawn and Palpatine did to these people. Luke winced. Something like that. Oddly enough, I'm all right, Mara said, her eyes drifting around the room. I guess I must have already worked through all that up above. She gestured toward an upside-down arch ahead of them, a doorway partially blocked by a half-closed blast door. Looks like we're getting near the end of the line. I think you're right. Slipping through the opening, Luke looked around. It was a large room, with a lot of scattered chairs and broken consoles that had once apparently been lined up in neat rows all of it covered with the same thick layer of dust that existed everywhere down here. Definitely the monitor anteroom. He identified it as Mara joined him. That would put the bridge just ahead, through that other archway in the middle of the far wall. What's left of it anyway? Mara said, looking around. It may be my imagination, but it looks like there's less actual battle damage here. It does, doesn't it? Luke agreed, frowning. She was right. Aside from a few of the droid-repaired fissures, most of the destruction seemed to be impact damage. Either it happened when outbound flight plowed into this rock pile, or else Thrawn did some ship ramming during the battle. Thrawn, or someone else, Mara said. Don't forget that according to Bersh, the Vigari were also at that battle. True. Luke surveyed the wreckage, a strange feeling of emptiness flowing into him. I'd hoped we'd be able to find some intact records down here. Something about the Jedi of that time, maybe some details about how they'd been organized. But I can't see how anything like that could have survived. Doesn't look promising, does it? Mara said. Still, as long as we're here, we might as well go the whole way. You said that was the door to the bridge? Should be, Luke said, ducking under a section of collapsed deck and stepping over to the archway and the warped metal door blocking it. Igniting his lightsaber, he sliced it open. It was indeed the bridge, very much as he remembered from his brief time aboard the katana some thirteen years before. Except, of course, that this particular bridge was littered with bones and broken consoles and ankle-deep in powdery dust. And it was only about half as long as the other one had been. Now, that's impressive, Mara said. I don't think I've ever even heard of a ship being crushed this badly, let alone seen it. They must have been really scorching space when they hit. Yes, Luke murmured. Question is, whose idea was it to hit this hard? You still thinking about those prisoners in the storage core? Off and on, Luke said, frowning toward the crushed bow. There was something glinting dully over there amid the shards of the shattered observation bubble, something that didn't seem to fit with the rest of the wreckage they'd seen. We know they escaped somehow, he continued, stepping carefully through the debris wincing as something snapped beneath his boot. We also know that there were 18 Jedi aboard outbound flight, and yet Thrawn was still able to beat them. I keep wondering if there's some connection. It could be that Thrawn had a bigger fleet than anyone wants to admit, 
Mara suggested, leaning over one of the consoles for a closer look. Formby said it was just his picket force, Luke reminded her. Formby is also lugging around about two bantheweights of corporate chis guilt over the whole incident, Mara countered, moving on to the next console. Maybe there was more official chis involvement than he's letting on. Could be, Luke said, squatting down among the transparent steel shards. There it was. Gingerly, he reached into the debris and got a grip on it. He froze. Not at them. There were two objects buried in the rubble, both archaic in design and yet instantly recognizable as they lay among two distinct sets of broken bones. Mara picked up instantly on his emotional reaction. What is it? She asked, abandoning her survey and coming to his side. Exhibit 1, Luke said, lifting up a dented cylinder that could only be a lightsaber. And, he added quietly, holding up a tarnished, dented hand weapon. Exhibit 2. Mara inhaled sharply. Is that what I think it is? I think so, Luke told her, standing up and turning the weapon over in his hand. It's a few decades out of date, but the style is unmistakable. It's a chis charik. For a moment neither of them spoke. Then, still wordlessly, Mara held out her hand. Luke placed the unknown weapon in it, and for another minute she studied it in silence. Yes, she said at last. You can see chis lettering on it. It's a charik, all right. So what's it doing here? Luke asked. Dras told us Thrawn never sent a landing party aboard. And how exactly would Dras know whether he did or didn't? Mara pointed out. He wasn't there. Was he? Not that I've heard, Luke admitted, taking the Charik back from her. An odd thought was starting to take shape around the edges of his mind. Not much we can tell from the skeleton either, Mara commented squatting down and gently touching one of the bones the Charik had been lying beside. Humanoid, but definitely not human. That covers a lot of species, unfortunately. Including the Chiss, Luke said. Tell me, Mara. You spent a lot of time talking to the Chiss on the trip here. Did any of them ever say they'd actually seen any of the Vigari? Or seen Holos of a Vigari? or even heard a description of one. Mara frowned, and he could sense her stretching to the force as she searched her memory. No, she said. In fact, I remember formed by specifically saying they hadn't been seen anywhere in the region since outbound flight. Though to be fair, I never actually asked anyone that particular question. Well, I did ask Bersh once, Luke said. None of his generation of Jurun's ever saw a Vigar either. Which would make sense if they all disappeared fifty years ago, Mara pointed out. Are you going anywhere special with this? The Chiss were at outbound flight, Luke said. According to Bersh and Formby, so were the Vigari. He lifted his eyebrows. What if they were in fact the same people? Mara blinked. Are you suggesting the Chiss are the Vigari? Why not? Luke asked. Or at least some particular group of Chiss were. We both know how devious and creative Thrawn was. Would it have been that hard for him to invent a completely fictitious race for his own purposes? Probably wouldn't have been more than a lazy afternoon's work for him, she conceded. But why would he do that? That's the real question, isn't it? Luke conceded. I don't know. I just find it oddly suspicious that when outbound flight disappeared, so did the Vigari. Hmm, Mara murmured, frowning off into infinity. Maybe we should sit form by down in a quiet corner somewhere when we get back to the rest of the group. It's about time he was straight with us about what's going on. It's well past time. Luke said. 
and we'll need to get him off alone. I don't think we'll want Drask listening in. That goes without saying. Mara gestured to the dusty weapons in his hands. Either of those still work? I don't know. Aiming at an empty spot across the room, Luke squeezed the Cherik's firing stud. Nothing happened. Dead as Onager, he said, sticking it into his belt. Pointing the lightsaber away from him, he touched the activator. The weapon's snap hiss sounded weak and rather asthmatic. But the green blade that blazed out appeared functional enough. Whoever built this built it to last, he commented closing it down and peering more closely at it. I wonder if it was Kbayathes. Kbayathes? He was apparently the senior Jedi Master on the expedition, Luke reminded her. This is probably where he would have been during the attack. And look, he pointed to the activator. See this? Looks like some kind of gem. You're right. Mara said, leaning toward him for a closer look. An amethyst, I think. I'll take your word for it, Luke said, sliding the lightsaber into his belt beside the charik. Come on, let's finish and get back upstairs. That talk with Formby is starting to sound more and more interesting. The turbolift creaked and Moan A.S. had arrived at Dreadnought 6, but it settled into place with only a couple of small bumps. They've definitely been using this car, Fell commented. As we had already concluded below, Drask said pointedly. With an effort, Fell held his tongue. Yes, Drask had noticed that the core's stack of supplies near this particular turbolift tube had been systematically raided. And yes, Fell had agreed then with the general's conclusion that this probably meant at least part of D6 was in use but it didn't mean extra evidence shouldn't be noted and commented upon. With a little more creaking, the doors slid open. Grappler, at point, stepped out into the corridor, his helmet turning back and forth as he scanned the area. Clear, he reported, moving aside to let the others emerge. Which way, Commander? The most direct path to D5, of course. Drask growled before Fell could answer. That is, after all, our chief purpose in being down here. With an effort, Fell controlled his temper. Drask had been nothing but a blue-skinned lump of impatience and disapproval since he'd left Luke and Mara and linked up with the Imperials. Maybe, he thought unkindly, that was why the two Jedi had been so eager to go down to D1 and foist him off on the Imperials. We'll get to D5, General he said with all the patience he could scrape together. But as long as we're here, it wouldn't hurt to do a little looking around. Drask rumbled something deep in his throat. You do not understand, he bit out. Fell looked aft along the corridor, trying to ignore him. The game of diplomacy, he decided, was rapidly losing whatever faint charm it once might have possessed. As soon as he reasonably could, he would indeed get back to the others, turn Drask back over to Formby, and be done with him. In the distance, somewhere beyond this particular Dreadnought's fleet tactical room, he could see a glow that seemed stronger than anything Permlites could put out. Looks like the local civilization is back that way, he said, pointing. Stormtroopers? There was a short pause as the stormtroopers turned their sensors in that direction. Infrared and gas spectrum analysis readings indicate approximately 30 to 40 humans, Grappler reported. Picking up voices too, Cloud added. The pitch would suggest mostly females and infants. Fell frowned. Infants? Let's take a look. Drask rumbled again. Commander Fell. We're going to take a look, General, Fell said shortly, sending the Chiss's glare right back at him. If you choose to argue with me every third or fourth step, it's going to take a lot longer. Very well, Commander, Drask said, his eyes blazing. As you wish. You are in command of this unit, after all. 
and don't you forget it. Again leaving the words unsaid, Feld gestured the 501st forward. They headed down the corridor, Grappler in the lead, Cloud and Shadow behind him, Watchman bringing up the rear behind Fell and Drask. The general maintained a stony silence, and possibly because of that they hadn't gone more than a handful of steps before Fell began to hear the sounds of infant squeals and gurgles and female conversation. A few steps after that, and he was able to see the light he noticed spilling gently out into the corridor from a large room he tentatively identified as the forward sensor analysis complex. Easy, everyone, he murmured as Grappa neared the archway leading into the room. We don't want to scare them. Better let me go first. Grappa nodded, and the three stormtroopers in the lead slowed their pace and moved apart. Fell passed through the middle of the formation. To his annoyance, Drask stayed right at his side. General, if you pause to argue, this will take longer, Drask countered. Let us finish and go to D5. Fell squeezed his hand into a fist. Having a stranger drop in on unsuspecting women and children would be bad enough. Having two strangers, one of them a glowing-eyed alien, would be an order of magnitude worse. But there was a set to Drask's jaw implying that further argument would be a waste of time. Sighing to himself, Fell stepped into the archway. Even at first glance it was clear why Cloud had picked up only female and infant voices. By its furnishings and decor, the room was clearly a large and well-equipped nursery. Perhaps twenty women were visible in the nearer section, sitting on comfortable-looking couches and chairs, some of them clearly pregnant, the rest just as clearly monitoring the activities of a herd of infants, crawlers, and toddlers. There were also about a dozen older children in the seven to eight-year-old range, that group standing in a half-circle around another woman as if listening to a story or a lesson. He had just enough time to see every eye turn to him, and to catch the startled or frightened expressions on several of the women. The attack came as a stuttering burst of full-auto blaster fire from somewhere farther aft, a screaming volley of red bolts sizzling and spattering across the stormtrooper's armor. Instinctively, Fell ducked down, grabbing for Drask's arm only to find that the general's combat reflexes were better honed than Fell's and had already put him flat on the deck. The stormtrooper's reactions were just as quick. Watchmen shouted something Fell didn't catch and suddenly a set of green blaster bolts was scorching the air in the other direction. Cease fire! Fell shouted over the din. Stormtroopers, cease fire! No! Drask barked. Lay down protective fire and retreat to the fleet tactical room. Fell come. Before Fell could even form a protest, Drask had the two of them back on their feet rapidly retreating behind the stormtrooper's moving defensive screen. They reached the fleet tactical room, and with a quick look inside Drask shoved Fell through the doorway and jumped in after him. A second later, with one final burst of covering fire, the four stormtroopers were inside as well. Report. Fell ordered, feeling like an idiot and hoping the effects of the exertion would adequately cover his embarrassment. Getting shot at was hardly a new experience for him, but usually he was in the cockpit of a cloak raft at those times, with a familiar collection of sensors, shields, and weapons at his fingertips. Being attacked in dress uniform had startled him more than he would have expected. Injuries? No armor damage, Watchman reported. Those bolts were weaker than standard. Comes of using the same Tabana gas reserves for fifty years, I guess, Fell said. All right, I guess that's that. Let's see if we can get back to the turbo lift without getting ourselves blasted. No, Drask said. We go back. Fell felt his jaw drop a couple of centimeters. What are you talking about? We're here to help these people, not trade shots with them. Drask eyed him curiously. Interesting, he said. 
You have more restraint than I would have expected from one trained under Syndic Mithranurodo's authority. He gestured down the corridor. But in this particular situation, such restraint is inappropriate. Those warriors are protecting something. I wish to learn what it is. Fell took a deep breath, his opinion of Drass's soldiering skills dropping a few notches. They were protecting that nursery, he said, as if explaining it to a small child. Women and children. Remember? No, Drask said. If that had been their purpose, they would have been positioned between the turbo lift and that room. Maybe there aren't any good defensive positions this far forward. We passed at least three of them, Drask countered. I am a ground soldier, Commander. Such things are my business. He's right, Commander, Watchman put in. Actually, for that matter, the position they were firing from wasn't very secure. Best guess is that they were on their way forward from somewhere else when they ran into us. Fell stepped to the doorway and hooked a cautious eye around it. Beyond the open nursery door, he could see two figures jump-stopping toward them along the corridor. In fact, I would suspect they are right now taking advantage of the lull to move to better positions closer to us, Drask said from behind him. They're coming, all right, Fell confirmed, his estimation of Drask reluctantly returning to its previous level. Looks like just two of them. Then let us move quickly, Drask urged. If we hesitate too long before launching a counterattack, the subsequent battle will take place near the nursery and risk injury to the women and children. That is unacceptable. I thought launching attacks in general was unacceptable to the Chiss. Fell muttered under his breath as he gestured the stormtroopers forward. They fired first, Drask reminded him coolly. They are now fair game. Do we go? Fell clenched his teeth. We go, he confirmed. Watchmen? Clear out those snipers. Try to do it without killing them. Copy, Commander, the stormtrooper said promptly. Grappler, Shadow, Cloud, Overrun Pattern 3. Go. Grappler touched his fingertips to his helmet in acknowledgement and swung halfway out into the corridor dropping onto one knee and opening up with his Blastek on full auto. The other two stormtroopers gave the pattern half a second to settle in, then ducked out into the corridor and charged out toward the waiting enemy, Shadow adding his own blaster fire to the barrage. Fell held his breath. Five seconds later came the distinctive sputtering sizzle of a stun blast, and the firing abruptly ceased. All clear, Grappler announced, getting to his feet and disappearing down the corridor toward his comrades. Silently, Fell let out the breath he'd been holding. He'd worked with units of the 501st on several occasions, but never under actual combat conditions. This was going to be an educational experience. Let's go, General. The women and children, he noted as they passed the nursery, had retreated to the farthest part of the room and were standing huddled together, some of them visibly trembling. He considered pausing to try to reassure them, decided that anything he could say or do would only scare them more, and continued on without breaking stride. The two gunners were sprawled on the floor as he and the others reached the spot. Shadow was kneeling beside them, checking for the heart palpitations that sometimes occurred with stun blasts while Cloud stood guard with his Blastek pointed aft down the corridor. They'll be all right, Shadow reported as he stood up. Shall I leave them their weapons? Fell looked down at the antique blasters lying beside the sleeping men. Disarming the enemy was standard procedure, of course. But he hadn't come here to fight these people, and there was a chance that what had just happened had been some kind of misunderstanding. Just put them up there, he ordered, pointing to a makeshift ledge a meter and a half above the deck that was supporting some reworked cable connections. We don't want some kid from the nursery finding them. Yes, sir. 
He watched as the stormtrooper complied, fully expecting Drass to object to his decision. But the Chiss said nothing. Cloud? I'm not picking up anyone else nearby, the stormtrooper reported. There's a lot of the same sort of structural damage back there that we ran into on D4, though, and that could be masking them. Not to mention providing them with lots of choices for an ambush position, Fell said. Yes, sir, Watchman agreed. Shall we go clean it out? Fell very much wanted to say yes. Antique weapons or not, those blaster bolts could still do considerable damage to an unarmored body if they connected. Staying here while the 501st did all the dangerous work made a lot of tactical sense. But he couldn't do that. Not with Drask standing there listening. We'll go together, he told Watchman. Yes, sir, the other said. Stormtroopers, escort formation. Move out. The council meeting chamber was simpler than Ginsler had expected it to be. There was a long rectangular table in the center ring by a dozen padded wire mesh chairs, with another eight or nine chairs lined up against each of the two side walls. In each corner of the room were a pair of pedestals with oddly shaped sculptures sitting on them, clearly handmade, while a few more pieces of local art hung on the walls. Yulia was seated at the far end of the table, flanked on one side by Councillor Tarkosa and on the other by Councillor Keeley. Facing them from the other end of the table, the end nearest the door, were formed by Fisa and Bersh, the latter hunched over in his seat like someone fighting a losing battle with disillusionment. The other three Jurons were seated together in the chairs along the left-hand wall, looking equally dejected, while the three Chiss warriors sat stiffly against the wall to the right. Each of the two latter groups had one of Presser's peacekeepers standing watch beside its row. The conversation, or perhaps more accurately the confrontation, was already underway as the door wheezed open and Ginsler, Rosemary, and Evelyn stepped into the room. Not good enough, Aristoc reformed by, Yulier was saying. The actions of your people have cost us fifty years of exile and deprivation, not to mention the loss of nearly fifty thousand of our companions' lives. If you genuinely wish to atone for this atrocity, you'll need to do far more than that. He looked up at Ginsler. Ah, uh, Ambassador, he greeted him gravely, gesturing to the chair beside Visa. Did you enjoy your tour? Yes, thank you, Ginsler said, moving reluctantly forward. This looked like a discussion he really didn't want to get involved in, and for a moment he wondered if he should try to come up with another excuse to get out of it. But the door had already slid shut behind him, and the others were all looking at him with varying degrees of expectation. He was apparently in for the duration. So, it appeared, were Rosemary and Evelyn. Out of the corner of his eye he saw one of the Jurons bound eagerly from his chair and smilingly usher the mother and daughter to chairs beside the Chiss warriors. Yulier's forehead wrinkled dangerously at that, but he apparently decided it wasn't worth making an issue of. We were just discussing the extent of reparations the Chiss government will be providing in contrition for the devastation, he said instead. And as I've already explained, I cannot make the sort of agreement you seek, Formby said. I have no instructions or mandate for the situation we find ourselves in here. I can offer a certain level of monetary compensation from my own family's resources, the amount of which I've already stated. But I can make no promise that will bind the other families. On the other hand, the nine ruling families had agreed to turn outbound flights remains over to the New Republic, Ginsler pointed out as he sat down beside Visa. It shouldn't be stretching that offer too much to include returning all the colonists, as well. And what makes you think we want to return to that part of the galaxy? Yulier asked. What makes you think we want anything to do with you or your new republic? Then what do you want? Ginsler asked. 
In a perfect world, we'd want the slow executions of everyone involved with what was done to us. Carcosa bit out. But Aristocra form by informs us that most of them are unfortunately already dead. So we'll settle for a ship. Jinsler blinked. A ship? Not just any ship, of course. Yolier cautioned. We want a ship at least as big as one of our dreadnoughts. No, make that twice as big, equipped with the best and most modern equipment available. And weapons, Keeley murmured, his eyes staring darkly at something in the table apparently only he could see. Lots of weapons. From Jinsler's belt came a soft chirp, the same odd sound he'd heard back in the turbolift foyer just after they'd been brought down here. He glanced at Bersh across the table, but if the Jeroen's comm link had made any such noise he wasn't reacting to it. Yes, Yolier agreed. Plenty of weapons and defenses. You already have most of that list, Formby reminded him. According to Guardian Presser, the uppermost dreadnought has been made capable of flight. Capable of flight, yes, Tarkosa said. Capable of what we need, no. What do you need, then? Formby asked. What exactly do you want with this new ship? To fulfill our mission, of course, Tarkosa said. Fifty years ago, we were commissioned to travel through the unknown regions to the edge of the galaxy and beyond in a search for new life and new worlds. He glared at Formby from beneath his bushy eyebrows. The Chiss denied us that opportunity. We will therefore make it for ourselves. Jinsler threw a startled look at Formby. The aristocrat's face was settled in diplomatic neutral, but Jinsler could see a hint of surprise in his glowing eyes. That's a rather ambitious project, director, he said carefully, turning back to Yulia. Especially for a group as small as yours. And what if your people don't wish to go? Formby added. The people will come, Keeley said, his eyes still focused on the table. If we lead them, they will follow. All of them. Of course, Jinsler said, a shiver running up his back. Was the counselor going senile? Or had the long exile driven him completely insane? We will, of course, need to consult with our governments, he said aloud, deciding the best approach right now would be to stall and hope he didn't improvise himself into a corner. We'll need to discuss how to locate and deliver a ship that will suit your needs. Good, Yulier said, leaning back in his seat. Go ahead. We'll wait. It's not quite that simple, formed by put in. First of all. Of course, of course. Yulier lifted a hand in an imperious gesture toward the young man standing beside the chiss. Peacekeeper Oliet? You may turn off the jamming. The peacekeeper reached for the antique comm link in his belt, hesitated. I'm sorry, director, but I don't think I should do that without Guardian Presser's permission. Yulier's face darkened. Then get it, he said, his voice rumbling ominously. To Jinsler's left, the door again slid open, and with perfect timing Presser stepped inside. There you are. Yulier said, his tone making the words an accusation. Release the jamming. Ambassador Jinsler needs to contact his government. It's not the jamming that's the problem, Formby said before Presser could reply. The fact is that communication with the outside galaxy is impossible from inside the redoubt. If Ambassador Jinsler and I are to consult our governments, we'll need to leave outbound flight. Yulier's eyes narrowed. Will you now? He said, his voice almost silky smooth. How very convenient. Perhaps you won't find it so necessary if I tell you that one of you will be required to remain while. He broke off as, 
With a squeak of boots on decking, the peacekeeper who'd taken Presser aside earlier appeared from the corridor and came to a halt at Presser's side. He grabbed the guardian's arm and began murmuring urgently to him. Guardian? Yulier demanded. Guardian! Your pardon, director, counselors, Presser said, most of his attention on the man still whispering to him. A small matter that needs to be dealt with. I'll be back in a moment. He flashed a hand signal to the two peacekeepers standing guard over the Chis and Jurons. Then he and the messenger hurried from the room, the door wheezing shut behind them. Jinsla looked across the room at the guard beside the Jurons. The young man's face was suddenly tight and nervous, and his hand was now resting on the butt of his blaster. Whatever was going on, it was apparently far more serious than Presser was admitting. And it seemed to Jinsler that there were only two places trouble could be coming from right now. The Jedi, or the Imperials. Swallowing, he turned back to Yulier. Well, he said, searching for something to say. As long as we have a few minutes, Director, why don't we get some details? I'd like to hear exactly what kind of ship you're looking for. Chapter 17 Mara was on her knees, studying the scattered bones and trying to visualize what the owner of the Charak might have looked like, when she felt the faint and distant sensation. She paused, closing her eyes as she stretched out to the Force. Bits and pieces flowed into focus, fear, surprise, anger, violence then flowed away again into the general roiling fog. She worked harder at it, trying to pull back from the details to get a bigger picture. The larger view refused to come, and a moment later the sensation itself faded into the darkness and dust and ancient bones. But that moment had been enough. Somewhere nearby, someone had died. Violently. She opened her eyes and looked at Luke. His eyes were still closed, his mouth tight as he, too, chased after the last wisps of the vision. She waited, fingering her lightsaber and fighting for patience, until he too had lost the contact. How many? She asked. Several, he said, climbing hastily to his feet. No injuries either, just deaths. Quick ones too, as if the victims were ambushed. You think it's real, then? Mara asked as they headed back across the bridge and into the monitor anteroom. I mean, it couldn't have been something from the past, could it? You mean like an echo of what happened to outbound flight 50 years ago? Luke shook his head. No. One of us might possibly pick up something like that, but not both of us at the same time. No, this was real and it happened just now. They had to do some climbing through the rubble at the bottom of the turbolift shaft in order to reach their car, but they made sure to leave adequate hand and footholds, and within a few minutes they were once again inside. Were you able to tell where it happened? Mara asked as the car began moving sluggishly upward. No, Luke said. Someplace above us, but it all went by too quickly to pin it down any better than that. You. Mara shook her head. All I could tell was that the deaths didn't seem human, somehow. Really, Luke said, looking at her thoughtfully. Interesting. I had something of that same feeling, but I couldn't decide whether that part was real or just the fact that there are so many Chis and Jeruns around. Or maybe it was a little of both. Mara said. If someone decided to start shooting at Jinsler or the 501st, they wouldn't be likely to let Formby and Bersh just walk away. The car lumbered to a halt in the storage core. Where exactly are we headed? Mara asked as they hurried through the silent storage rooms. We'll try the turbolift fell and the stormtroopers used to go to D6, Luke said over his shoulder. We should be able to reach either D6 or D5 with that one. Yes, that part I'd already figured out, 
Mara said. I was asking which of the two dreadnoughts you think we should start with. I don't know, Luke said as they reached the turbo lift lobby where they'd taken their leave of the Imperials. Phil went to D6. Jinsler and Formby are probably on D5. Pick one. The turbo lift door slid halfway open and stopped. Let's make it D5, Mara decided as they squeezed inside. Even with three Chiss warriors along, the civilians are likely to be harder pressed if things have gotten messy. Sounds good, Luke said. Using the force to pull the doors at least partially closed, he tapped the key for D5. The car didn't move. Oh, he said, trying the key again. Still nothing. Terrific, Mara growled, pulling out her comm link. A quick on, off showed that the jamming was still in place. Well, so much for the easy approach, she said. Looks like our choices are to climb the shaft or head aft and hope the turbolifts back there are still working. Or to continue around to the turbolift presser had us trapped in, Luke reminded her. Actually, given that we've already cut some of the repulsor controls in that pylon, it might be the easier one to climb. Probably safer, too, Mara pointed out, pushing the doors open again. Right, Luke agreed as they squeezed back out into the turbolift lobby and took off at a run toward the next turbolift lobby over. It would be a little tricky to play Hilltop Emperor if the repulsor beams came back on. Mara stiffened. Suddenly, unbidden, a horrible revelation had come like a thundering of blaster bolts chewing their way into her stomach. The Jerun ship, Bersh's farewell to the rest of his people as the chaff envoy prepared to head into the redoubt, the vague and nameless puzzle that had bothered her so tantalizingly at the time. And the image of a Jerun child triumphantly waving a red headband. What is it? Luke asked his own step faltering at the abrupt spike he felt in her. Mara? Blast it. She bit out, sprinting past him as she doubled her speed. Come on, no time to waste. Blast them all. What? But she had left Luke and his bewildered question behind her. So simple, so embarrassingly simple. And yet Mara Jade Skywalker former emperor's hand, had missed it completely. Musing on the empire that had been, and her former place in it, she had missed it completely. She was nearly to their target turbo lift, and over her panting breath she could hear Luke's footsteps as he caught up to her. Steady, his thought came, flowing calmness over her as he tried to soothe some of her agitation. But even Jedi calm couldn't help her now. People had already died because of her carelessness. Unless they hurried, others would suffer the same fate. Maybe even all of them. The turbo lift lobby was almost completely dark when Presser and Trilly arrived. This is crazy, Presser declared, looking around in disbelief. Even some of the emergency perm lights were out, which should have been well nigh impossible. What could have caused all this? You got me, Trilly said. The power's all right at the generators. That was the first thing the text checked. It's just getting lost somewhere along the way. So what? We've got a short in the wiring. It'd take a lot more than just one, Trilly pointed out. And that wouldn't explain the pearl lights, anyway. Yes, Presser conceded. Have we got a tech crew on the way? One's already here, Trilly told him. They're a deck up, checking out the turbo lifts. Apparently, that's where the outages started. Presser scratched his cheek. The turbo lifts that the two Jedi and Imperials were able to get past? I thought about that too, Trilly said. But the power was just fine earlier after they got out. Maybe it's some sort of delayed reaction. Presser suggested. Something they set up to cover their tracks. I don't know, Trilly said doubtfully. 
seems kind of a waste of effort. Especially for Jedi. Across the lobby, the faint sound of a ventilator fan went silent. There goes another one, Presser said, peering in that direction. You know what this reminds me of? That infestation of conduit worms we had a few years after the landing. That's impossible, Trilly insisted. We exterminated them thirty years ago. Unless we've just imported a new batch, Presser said, jerking his head back down the corridor. Trilly muttered something under his breath. Yulia's not going to be happy about this at all. No kidding. Presser started to reach for his comm link, remembered the jamming in time and headed instead toward one of the wall-mounted comms. We'd better get a couple more tech teams down here, he said. If it's conduit worms, we want them gone, and fast. Right, Trilly said. You want me to wait here while you go tell Yulia the good news? Presser made a face. Let's both wait, he said. There's no point in starting rumors until we know for sure what we've got. Besides which, you don't want to spring this on Yulia alone? Presser keyed the wall calm for the text section. Something like that. The center port side corridor on D6 was as snarled with rusted debris as anything Fell had seen up on D4. The center starboard corridor, in contrast, was almost perfectly clear. They've definitely been using this one, Watchman commented as the group made their cautious way aft. Not very much traffic, but it's steady. How do you figure that? Fell asked. From the pattern of dust on the deck, Drask told him. There are places where occasional footsteps have lifted or moved it. No more than twenty people come this way each day. Possibly fewer. Possibly as few as ten, Watchman agreed. The two guards we left stunned back there, running three shifts a day, plus a few more would pretty well cover it. Commander? Grappler, in the lead, called back over his shoulder. I'm picking up voices ahead. Extend formation, Watchman ordered. Not too far. Make sure to stay in sight. I see a light, Grappler announced. Looks like it's coming from one of the crew bunk rooms. Watch for trouble, Fell warned. They may have had time to get reinforcements in position. Apparently they hadn't. A minute later, the group had arrived. At a prison. Fell hadn't been particularly impressed by Luke's claim that there had been an old prison down in the supply corps, and Drask's description of the setup hadn't done anything to modify that skepticism. But about this place he had no doubts at all. The door to the old crew quarters had had a pair of narrow slits cut into it, one at a level for observation, the other just above the floor and wide enough to pass a tray of food through. Supplementing the door's original lock was a heavy add-on with the kind of twin access ports that implied two separate codes were necessary to open it. Hello? A woman's voice called tentatively from behind the door. Perry? Is that you? Fell stepped to the door and pressed his face to the upper slit. The bunk room had been divided into at least three sections, two of which were currently closed off by light and movable panels. The center section, the one visible from the observation slit, had been set up as a recreation area, with chairs, a couple of small tables, games, and toys. Seated in two of the chairs were a pair of women, one in her twenties, the other much older, watching as four children with ages ranging between six and ten years old played or talked. The younger woman was leaning toward the door, squinting to try to see fell through the narrow slit. Abruptly, she stiffened. You're not Perry, she said, her voice quavering a little. Who are you? I'm Commander Chuck Fell of the Empire of the Hand. Fell identified himself as the children all paused in their activities and turned to see what was going on. Don't worry, we aren't going to hurt you. 
What do you want? The older woman asked. We're here to help, Fel assured her, frowning as he looked around. These certainly didn't look like hardened criminals who deserved to be kept behind a double-coated lock and supplied through a zoo-style feeding slot. In many ways the room reminded him of the nursery they passed down the corridor, in fact, or perhaps a special classroom of some sort. Who are you people? We're the remnant of the Republic mission called Outbound Flight, the older woman said. Yes, we know that part, Fell said. I mean you and the children. What are you doing in there? Why, we're the dangerous ones, of course, the younger woman said bitterly. Didn't you know? She waved a hand to encompass the children. Or rather, they are. That's why they're in quarantine. We're just here to take care of them, poor dears. The dangerous ones, huh? Fell asked, eyeing the children. As far as he could tell, they looked like any other kids he'd ever known. What exactly did they do? They didn't do anything, the older woman said quietly. Apparently she'd been at this long enough for her bitterness to decay into resignation. All they were was a little bit different from everyone else. That's all. Director Yulier's imagination and hatred did all the rest. And what exactly does his imagination and hatred tell him? Fell asked. What does he think they are? Why, pure evil, of course, the younger woman said. Or at least, that's what he's afraid they'll grow up to be. Fell looked at the kids again. Pure evil? He asked. Yes, the older woman added, her forehead creasing as if it should be obvious. You know. Jedi. Chapter 18 Fell just stared at her, his brain refusing to form words. Pure evil? Jedi? Who told you Jedi were evil? He demanded. Some of them may have their moments, but... He trailed off. Both women were looking at him as if he just told them that red was green. Don't you know anything? The younger woman said. They destroyed us. They betrayed and destroyed us. Did you actually see this happen? Fell persisted. Or is it just something you heard from? Commander, Drask said. Fell turned away from the observation slit. What? He snapped. For the moment, this is irrelevant, the general said quietly. We can learn more about their history when the aristocra and ambassador are once again safely under our protection. Fell felt his jaw tighten in frustration. But the chiss was right. Understood, he said reluctantly. So we just leave them here. Would you prefer we take them with us? Drass countered. No, of course not, Fell conceded reluctantly. I just, of course not. Back to the turbo lift? Yes, Drask said, his eyes flashing with quiet anger toward the locked room. We have seen what we came here to see. Fell nodded. He hated to just leave these people here, prisoners of some insane half-remembered myth or personal vendetta. But Drask was right. It could be dealt with later. All right, stormtroopers, form up. We're heading back to the forward turbo lifts. He started to turn, and as he did, something about Grappler's stance caught his attention. Grappler? He asked. Reluctantly, he thought, the Ikari came back to attention. Your pardon, Commander, he said, his voice sounding even more alien than usual. I was remembering. Remembering what? My people. Grappler gestured fractionally toward the quarantine door with his Blastek. The warlord took away many such innocents who were of no genuine threat and put them in places like this. Most were never heard from again. 
I understand, Fell said, leveling his gaze at the white faceplate. But the best thing we can do right now is find Formby and Jinsler and make sure they know about this. Rule one is that diplomats always get first crack at this sort of problem. And if they are unable or unwilling to do anything? Fell looked back at the locked door. Rule two is that soldiers get second crack, he said darkly. Move out. Outbound flights designers had clearly never considered the possibility that anyone would ever wish to travel through the connecting turbolift pylons without an actual turbolift car or at least a maintenance repulsor lift pack. As a result, they had kept the tube interior smooth, without any of the access ladders Luke had assumed would be there. There were also no other built-in handholds, and all the wiring was buried behind protective metal panels. Fortunately, Jedi had their own resources. How's it going? Luke grunted as he hauled himself another arm's length up the thick power cable. I'm doing fine, Mara countered from above him. Question is, how are you holding up? I'm fine, too, Luke assured her, taking a moment to look up at the woman sitting on his shoulders. It would have looked utterly ridiculous, he knew. Had there been anyone around to see them, a man hauling himself hand over hand up a set of power cables while a grown woman sat high atop his shoulders like a small child watching a victory day parade. But silly looking or not, it was working, and faster even than Luke had anticipated. With the metal access panels long since frozen shut by age and rust, there was no way to reach the cables beneath them except via a lightsaber wielded by a steady hand. Any other approach they could have used would have required each of them to cut away a section of paneling, haul him, or herself up to that level via the newly exposed cables, and then pause to cut away the next section. This way, Mara was able to concentrate on the task of precision cutting while Luke could give his full attention to the climb itself. Or at least he could do so as long as his arms held out. Stretching out to the force, Letting its strength flow into his muscles, he kept going. It was just as well, he reflected, that they hadn't had to get out of the rigged turbolift car this way. Drask would never have made it. Watch it, Mara warned. We're hitting the edge of another eddy. Right, Luke said, making sure to get an extra firm grip with each pull upward. With the storage core and each of the dreadnoughts running its own gravity direction, the tube had been designed to align incoming cars with the proper, up, before they arrived at their various destinations. The gravity eddy fields required for such an operation weren't too difficult to get past. He and Mara had already forded two of them, but getting caught unprepared could be trouble. I wish these things weren't tied into the ship's environmental system. He muttered as he felt the eddy current tugging at his body, trying to turn him around. Mara had abandoned her lightsaber work for the moment in favor of steadying herself with a grip on Luke's collar. Without gravity in the pylon, we could have just floated up to D5. It would have taken us half a day just to find all the redundancies and shut them down, Mara pointed out, waving her free hand cautiously above her. Okay, there's the upper edge of the eddy. Luke eased them past the interface, and they continued on their way. So when are you going to tell me what this is all about? He asked. Even over the humming of her lightsaber he heard Mara sigh. It was that scene on the chaff endless observation deck, she said. Just before we headed into the redoubt, when Bersh and the Jurons were saying goodbye to their ship. I remember, Luke said. You said at the time something about that wasn't right. I just wish I'd caught it sooner, Mara said, an edge of self-recrimination in her voice. I should have caught it earlier. Remember when the Jurin ship first arrived, and on the calm display behind Bersh we saw some children playing Hilltop Emperor? Yes, Luke said, replaying the scene in his mind. It looked all right to me. Oh, it looked just fine, Mara bit out. Problem is, a couple of days later, 
when the Jeruns were saying their farewells, the same scene was going on in the background. Luke frowned. What do you mean, the same scene? More children playing on the structure? I mean the same children playing on the structure, she said. Doing the same things, in exactly the same way. Luke tightened his grip on the cables. The whole thing was a recording? You got it, Mara said bitterly. There are no children aboard that ship, Luke. Bersh was lying through his teeth. Both sets of teeth. And I missed it completely, Luke said, feeling like a fool. I wasn't even paying attention. Why should you have been? Mara pointed out. There wasn't any reason to suspect them of anything. I still should have been more alert, Luke said, refusing to be mollified. Especially after everything that was going on aboard the chaff anvil. So what exactly does it mean? It means the Jeruns are frauds, Mara said. It means that ship of theirs isn't a refugee ship at all. Aside from that, I have no idea. Bersh said the ship was mostly composed of small rooms, Luke said, trying to think it through. That kind of structure is something our sensors might be able to check out, so we can assume he was telling the truth about that. What sort of ship would be composed of mostly small rooms? A prison ship, maybe? Mara suggested. Or maybe a cargo ship like Outbound Flight Storage Corps? That's basically a series of small rooms. I wish we knew what size rooms they are, Luke said. You ever asked Drask if he took any sensor readings of their ship? No, but you'd think he would have said something if it didn't check out, Mara said. Maybe he did, only not to us, Luke said, visualizing the Jiren ship in his mind. Big and spherical with a regular pattern of dark spots covering the hull. Viewports, he tentatively identified them at the time. Or vents or decoration. He drew in a sharp breath. Or ejection ports, he said aloud. What? Ejection ports, he repeated. Those dark spots on the hull are just like the ones we saw on that Firepoint asteroid on our way into the redoubt. Ejection ports for fighters, Mara bit out. The thing's a carrier. And we left it sitting right next to the Brask Auto Command Station, Luke reminded her grimly. Terrific, Mara grunted. So much for the Jeruns being peace-loving. From behind Luke's head, barely audible over the sound of Mara's lightsaber, came a soft chirp. Did you hear that? He asked. Hear what? Another of those comlink chirps, he told her. The kind Drask said sounded like someone communicating over the jamming. It came from your comlink. I missed it, she said, the tone of her lightsaber changing slightly as she sliced away more of the metal. The Jeruns, you think? I don't think anyone else has lied to us as consistently as they have. Luke said grimly. Not even Formby? Not even Jinsler, he said. And I'm getting a very bad feeling about this. How much farther? Her weight shifted slightly on his shoulders as she peered upward. Fifteen minutes at this rate, she said. Maybe more. Luke set his teeth, stretching out to the force for strength. Let's make it less. No. With a contemptuous flick of his wrist, Tarkosa sent Jinsler's data pad sliding back across the tabletop toward him. Completely unacceptable, all of them. What's wrong with the Rindili Battlehorn class? Jinsler asked, struggling to remain calm. This whole thing was starting to get ridiculous. It's got the size you want, it's got the speed. It's a freighter, Tarkosa said flatly. It's a bulk cruiser, not a freighter, Jinsler corrected. It's armed, it's armored, it's got the range, 
It's got the capacity. It's unacceptable. Yulia cut in. Show us something else. Jinzla reached over and snagged the data pad, swallowing the retort he so very much wanted to say. Yulia and the two counselors had shot down every single suggestion he'd made, and he was becoming extremely irritated with the whole bunch of them. Fine, he said, keying for Mon Cal's ship designs. Maybe there would be something here that the crotchety old survivors could live with. Of course, there would then be the whole question of persuading either the Chiss to buy such a ship or the New Republic to donate it to the cause. But that would be a crisis for another day. From his comm link came another chirp. What is that noise you people keep making on our comm links? He demanded. What are you talking about? Yulier asked. That little chirping sound, Jinsler said. Do all your comm links have frequency bleed through or something? I repeat, what are you talking about? Yulier countered. You're doing that, not us. Jinsler frowned. What are you talking about? We're not. Ah, yes, Bersh murmured, standing up. As was the beginning, so is the end. Jinsler shifted his frown to the Jurun. What? As was the beginning, so is the end, Bersh repeated. Ducking his head forward, he slid the limp wolfco body off his shoulders and let it thump onto the table in front of him. Against the wall behind him, his three compatriots had also taken off their wolf kills, laying them on the floor, and Jinsler had the sudden irrational thought that they were about to present the dead animals to Yulier as a gift to try to get him to cooperate. Once victims, Bersh went on. Now victors. Reaching to the wolf kill's neck, he broke off its decorative blue and gold collar. And with a sudden, brief shudder, the wolf kill came to life. Someone gasped as the animal scrambled to its feet. One of the survivors, Jinsler thought dimly as the wolf kill shook itself like a wet carfler. Or maybe it had been Jinsler himself. For the moment, his brain was too frozen with shock to process anything but the impossibility that was now staring him in the eye along its long, tooth-filled muzzle. At the far wall, he was vaguely aware that the other three wolf kills had similarly and inexplicably revived. For a stretched-out second no one moved. Bersh murmured something reverent-sounding in that melodious, two-toned language of theirs. From the survivor's end of the table came another soft gasp. No, he heard Yulia breathe. It can't. The four wolf kills leapt. Instinctively, Jinsler shoved himself back from the table as the nearest animal jumped toward him, fully expecting a terrible stab of pain as its jaws closed around his neck. But the furry missile shot passed without even grazing him with its outstretched claws. The momentum of Jinsler's push sent his chair tipping over backward and as his shoulder and head slammed against the deck a brief burst of stars blurred his vision. Through the sound of the blood roaring in his ears he heard screams and shouts and the sputter of blaster fire. There was a ululating roar, another scream, and suddenly he found himself being hauled to his feet. It was Tarkosa, his eyes wild, his age-lined face etched with fear and rage. Get back, you fool! he snarled giving Jinsler's arm a single tug toward the back of the room and then letting go and backing up hastily himself. Blinking once to clear his eyes, Jinsler looked behind him. The calm scene of a few seconds before had dissolved into chaos. The three Chiss warriors were bent over or on their knees, wrestling with the snarling wolf kills, clearly fighting for their lives. The peacekeeper who had been standing guard over them was already down, lying motionless in a widening pool of blood, his blaster lying on the deck beside his limp hand. Even as Jinsler stared in horror, one of the Chiss managed to twist his charik far enough around in the grip of his attacker's jaws and fire point-blank into its torso. But the wolfkill shrugged off the shot without even a snarl, its teeth and claws continuing to tear at the warrior's arm and chest. 
Across the room by the other side wall, the remaining peacekeeper had been knocked prone by the three Jeroons whom he had been guarding. Two of them were pinning down his gun hand as the third sat on his chest, rhythmically beating his head against the deck. From behind Jin's there came a sizzling hiss, and a streak of blue fire shot past his shoulder to impact squarely in the center of the third Jeroon's back. The Jeroon screamed something vicious sounding and rolled forward off the peacekeeper's chest. A second shot struck his shoulder, blackening his robe and eliciting another scream. And once again Jinsler ducked reflexively away as one of the wolf kills abandoned the injured chiss he'd been attacking and leapt past him. He spun around. To see the wolf kill slam into form by, its snarling jaws snapping shut around the aristocrat's gun arm. The impact staggered form by backward, but he managed to stay on his feet. Ignoring the blood suddenly flowing onto his sleeve, he twisted his arm around and tossed the charek to his free hand. Pressing the muzzle to the wolf kill's head, he fired. That one at least wrenched a howl from the animal. But if the injury affected either its strength or resolve, it didn't show. Formed by fired a second time, and then the wolf kill seemed to realize it was no longer holding on to the proper arm. With one last tearing bite, it let go and reached out for Form by's other arm. It never had a chance to connect. Even as its jaws opened, Fisa appeared out of nowhere, a streak of yellow-clad blue that slammed into the wolf kill's side, tearing it off form by and sprawling both of them onto the deck. The wolf kill howled in fury, twisting like a snake as it tried to buck her away. Fisa was faster, throwing her arms around its sides and burying her face in the fur of its back. The creature howled again twisting its head back and forth as it tried to reach her. But Fisa held on, shouting in the Chiss language as Form by fired round after round of blue fire into the wolf kill's body. And with that, the paralysis holding Jinsler rooted to the floor abruptly snapped. Bersh was standing by himself in a little bubble of calmness, his hands on his hips, as he coolly surveyed the carnage going on around him. Call them off! Jinsler snapped a sudden fury blazing inside him as he strode toward the Jurun. You hear me? Call them off. I hear you, human, Berge said. The nervous, self-effacing voice Jinsler had become accustomed to aboard ship had suddenly changed to something harsh and arrogant. You are as big a fool as they are. Stay back, or die now in agony instead of later in cold and darkness. You're the one who's going to die, Jinsler bit out, feeling his hands curling into fists. Bersh might be younger, but Jinsler was a good head taller and at least fifteen kilos heavier, and the Jeroon wouldn't have the element of surprise they'd had against the young peacekeeper getting his brains beaten in. He would hammer the Jeroon until he called off the attack. Would hammer him all the way to death, if that was what it took. Perhaps Bersh saw that in his eyes as he approached. His expression changed, and with a speed Jinsler wouldn't have expected he lifted his hands from his hips and grabbed for the end of his left sleeve. Jinsler tensed, lengthening his stride, trying to beat the Jerun to whatever weapon he was reaching for. Bersh's hand reached the sleeve, but instead of drawing a weapon, he merely ripped the outer layer of cloth away. Jinsler had just enough time to see that the arm was covered with what appeared to be lumpy packing material, half black and yellow, half translucent. And abruptly the arm exploded into a hundred angrily buzzing insects. He was barely able to wrench himself to a halt in time. For a second or two the insects swarmed aimlessly before coalescing into a spherical pattern swirling around Bersh. Careful, human, the Jeroon warned softly. Be very careful. I don't know what Skostri stings would do to a human, but they're quickly fatal to most other life forms we've used them against. His mouth curved in a sardonic double smile. Of course, if you wish to serve as a test case, come ahead. Casually, he turned his back on Jinsler, 
crossing toward the Jeroen whom Formby had shot and the two uninjured ones still beating on the peacekeeper. The swarm moved with him, as if genetically programmed to recognize him as their hive or queen. Jinsler took a cautious step forward, keeping a wary eye on the insects. Another few steps, and Bersh would be within reach of the injured peacekeeper's dropped blaster. If he got to the weapon first, any hope of stopping them and the wolf kills would be gone. But the Jerun had apparently forgotten there was another spare weapon lying loose on the deck, the one dropped by the other peacekeeper. Or maybe he simply didn't think it was relevant, since the only ones close enough to reach it were already fighting for their lives against the wolf kills. Everyone except Dean Jinsler. He eased his way toward the gun, striving to be as invisible as possible. Even if he shot Bersh, he knew, the swarm of insects might well take vengeance on him. But it would be worth it to watch Bersh's smile turn to pain and then to death. Still no one seemed to have noticed him. Another few steps. Ambassador! Formed by Kalt. Jinsler twisted his head back around. Yulier and the two counselors had flipped the long conference table onto its side and were dragging it toward one of the room's back corners. Formby and Fisa were with them, the aristocra staggering slightly as blood continued to pour from his mangled arm. The wolf kill he had been fighting lay still on the deck, its fur almost uniformly black from multiple charic burns. Rosemary and Evelyn were already back in the corner, Rosemary's arms visibly trembling as she clutched her daughter close to her. Ambassador! Formed by called again. Come! Quickly. Shoo! Jinsler hissed at him. Didn't they see what he was trying to do? Yes, Ambassador, go! Bersh agreed. Jinsler turned back. Bersh was standing beside the now motionless second peacekeeper, the boy's blaster pointed casually in Jinsler's direction. Or would you prefer to die now in agony? Jinsler hesitated. But if the Jeruns wanted them all dead, there was nothing and no one left to stop them anyway. Clenching his hands one last time, this time into fists of impotent rage and defeat, he backed away. Bring chairs, Yulier called. Quickly. With his full attention still on the blaster in Bersh's hand, Jinsler groped blindly for some of the fallen chairs and came up with two of them. All the Chiss warriors were lying broken and bloody on the deck now, he noted distantly, their own battles over. The wolf kills who had killed them stood panting, watching Jinsler with unblinking eyes as they licked their bloody muzzles and paws. The survivors had the table in position by the time he arrived, set on its edge across the back corner to form a low barrier. What they wanted with the chairs was quickly evident as Yulier and Tarkosa stacked them like sections of a roof over the top of the triangle-shaped gap they'd created behind the table, using the back walls and the sculpture pedestals for support. The Jeruns had gathered together now as well, watching in silence as they completed their task. Now get inside, Bersh instructed as the last roofing chair was set in place. Quickly. Silently, the prisoners complied crawling through a gap that had been left between one end of the table and the bulkhead. Yulier, the last one in, pulled a final chair into the gap behind him. And there they were, Jinsler thought bitterly. Caged animals, in a cage of their own construction. There was the sound of footsteps and Bersh's face appeared through the latticework of chairs above them. There, now you see? The Jerun said sardonically. He had his left arm stretched out to the side, and the swarming insects were beginning to settle back into their places there. Even humans are capable of following orders. No one replied. All right, you've got us, Jinsler said, deciding that someone should find out what was going on. What do you want? Bersha's mouth twisted crookedly. I want you all dead, of course, he said. The only question remaining is the method. He gestured behind him, 
to where the other Jurans were slaving some kind of salve on the one formed by headshot. Perch, for instance, would very much like to gun you all down right here so that he can enjoy your screams. Especially yours, Aristocra formed by. But I've decided to let you choose exactly how you will die. You won't get away with this, Yolier said. The words were defiant, but to Jinsler his voice merely sounded old. Oh, I think we will, Bersh said calmly as he rewrapped his sleeve over the now quiescent insects. Your precious Jedi and Imperial Stormtroopers should all be dead by now. Our sabotage of the turbolift cars they were trapped in will have taken care of that problem. Who else is there to stop us? We've been ready for trouble for fifty years. You don't think we can take you? I doubt it, Berge said. At any rate, we're not likely to find out. With your communications jamming still in place, you won't be able to summon your pitiful little colony to the attack. By the time they wake up to what's happened, we'll be long gone. He smiled. And you will be well on the road to a dark and icy death. He reached down and shook his robe. There was a soft clatter as some small objects fell to the deck. A small present for the survivors of outbound flight, he said. We have used some already on the turbolifts. These should take care of this particular area. Frowning, Jinsler turned his head sideways, pressing his cheek against the chair above him to try to see over the edge of the table. There were half a dozen thread-like objects on the deck he saw, spreading out as they skittered their way toward the walls. He caught his breath. Line creepers. Very good, Ambassador, Bearish said approvingly. After all, I promised that you would die in cold and darkness, didn't I? What are lion creepers? Yulier asked. They're like conduit worms, Jinsler told him, feeling his stomach tightening. Only worse. Bearish slipped a few into the control lines aboard the chaff envoy and nearly shut it down. He lifted his eyebrows. That was you, wasn't it? We'll be traveling through your vessel for a while longer, distributing the rest of our little pets for maximum effect, Bersh said to Yulier, ignoring the question. After that, we'll leave you to your doom. There's no need to destroy these people or their home, Bersh, Formby said. His voice was deadly calm, with only a hint of the agony he must be feeling from his torn arm. If you want the chaff envoy, take it. Bersh snorted. You underestimate us, Aristocra. We have bigger game in mind than a simple chist diplomatic vessel. He waved toward the wolf kills. And speaking of game, we'll be leaving our pets behind to make sure you stay here quietly until we are finished. I trust you noticed how difficult they are to kill. If not, or if some of you decide you prefer a quicker death than the one we'll be leaving you, I'm certain they'll enjoy the exercise. Bersh, Formby said again. But Bersh merely turned his back on them and strode away. Again peering out through the chairs, Jinsler saw the other Jurons fall into step behind him, the two uninjured ones supporting the third. The door wheezed open, and Bersh looked briefly out into the corridor. A moment later they were gone, the door sliding shut behind them. Jinsler shifted his attention to the three remaining wolf kills. They were padding around now, continuing to clean themselves, occasionally sniffing at their fallen victims. But it was clear they were also keeping an eye on the prisoners behind their barrier. I don't understand, Rosemary said, her shaking voice barely above a whisper. What do they want from us? Yulier sighed. Vengeance, instructor he said. Vengeance for crimes real and crimes imagined. What crimes? Rosemary asked. What did we ever do to the Jeruns? We did nothing to the Jeruns, Yulier said bitterly. That's the problem. Jinsler turned around to stare at him. 
What? Didn't you know, Ambassador? Yulier bit out, his eyes dark as he glared past Rosemary's shoulder. Bersh and his friends aren't Jurons. They're Vigari. Chapter 19 Jinsler blinked at him, the collected images of the voyage flashing through his mind. How could Yulier even think that such excruciatingly humble travel companions could possibly be members of a race of pirates and slavers? But even before the question formed in his mind, that last vivid image of Bersh settled like a heavy curtain over all the rest, Bersh standing placidly by as his wolf kills slaughtered their way across the meeting chamber. How did you know? He asked. Their voices. Yulier said as he stared into space, a distant agony reflected in his eyes. Or rather, their speech, when they spoke in their own language just before their attack. I only heard it once, but it's something I'll never forget. The eyes came back to a hard focus. You genuinely didn't know who they were? Of course not, Jinsler said. You think we would have let them aboard outbound flight if we had? I don't know, Yulier said darkly. Some of you might have. He turned his gaze toward Formby. Possibly the heirs of those who tried to destroy outbound flight in the first place. Ridiculous, Formby said, his voice taut with suppressed pain. He was lying on his side along the back wall, his head cradled in Fisa's lap, the blood stains on his sleeve growing steadily larger. I've told you before, the Chiss ascendancy had nothing to do with your destruction. Thrawn acted totally on his own. Perhaps, Yolier said. But what about you, Aristocra? On whose behalf are you acting? Why do we waste time with unimportant matters? Fisa cut in angrily. We must get medical attention for Aristocra Chafor and Bintrano. Where is your medical center? What difference does it make? Yulier growled. Those things will kill anyone who tries to leave. No, Fisa said. During the battle they attacked only those who carried weapons. As long as we leave unarmed and make no threatening movements, I believe we may pass safely among them. Interesting theory, Tarkosa said scornfully. Are you prepared to risk all our lives on it? I will be. I will go. No, don't, Evelyn said. I saw one of them talking to the animals. I think he told it not to let any of us leave. Really, Yulier said his tone suddenly subtly different. And how would you know that? I don't know, Evelyn said. I said I think. I am willing to take the risk, Fisa insisted. I'm not, Formby told her, reaching up to touch her arm with his fingertips. You'll stay here. But... That's an order, Fisa, Formby said his breathing starting to sound heavy as the loss of blood began to take its toll. We will all stay here. Is that how blue ones face hard choices? Tarkosa said scornfully. To simply sit and do nothing until they die? Maybe that's what they're hoping, Keeley muttered. Maybe their line creepers aren't as bad as they want us to think. Maybe they hope we'll go charging out there and get torn to bits. So instead we sit here and die? Tarkosa shot back. No one's going anywhere, Jinsler said firmly. There's no need. The Jedi and Imperials are still free. They'll find us. Keeley snorted. Jedi, he said, biting out the name like a curse. There aren't any Jedi, Yolier said. You heard Bersh. They're already dead. I'll believe that when I see it, Jinsler said, turning around to peer through the chairs. 
The wolf kills had finished their post-slaughter grooming and had moved closer to the makeshift refuge, probably drawn by the voices. They were prowling at arm's length away from the table barrier, theirs straight up, their jaws half open. We need a weapon, Yulier murmured. That's what we need. A weapon. Those men and Chiss had weapons too, Jinsler reminded him, looking past the wolf kills to the dead bodies scattered about the far end of the room. What we really need is help. He trailed off, his eyes focusing on the nearest of the dead peacekeepers and the calm link hooked to his belt. The calm link the boy had reached for when Yulier had ordered the jamming to be shut off. Director, he said, trying to keep the sudden excitement out of his voice. If we had one of the peacekeepers' calm links, could we shut off the jamming? If we had one, yes, Yulier said. There's a special twist frequency command line built into those comm links that allows for communication with other peacekeepers and the command system. Do you know how to operate it? Of course, the director growled. I served my share of peacekeeper duty. Except that the nearest comm link is ten meters away, Tarkosa pointed out. Were you hoping to convince one of the animals to bring it to you? No. Jinsler looked at Evelyn. Not one of the animals. The girl looked back at him, and for the first time since they'd met he saw an edge of fear in her eyes. No, she whispered. I can't. Yes, you can, Jinsler told her firmly. You must. No, Rosemary cut in emphatically. You heard her. She can't. Can what? Yulia demanded, his voice suddenly watchful. There's nothing special about her, Rosemary insisted, glaring warningly at Jinsler. Yes, there is, Jinsler said, just as firmly. You know that as well as I do. Rosemary, it's our best chance. No! Rosemary bit out, clutching her daughter tightly to her. So I was right, Yulier said softly. Rosemary whirled on him. Leave her alone, she flared at him, her voice trembling. You're not going to send her to three to die. You're not. Do you dare defy the law? Yulier thundered. She hasn't done anything. Rosemary shot back. How can you condemn her when she hasn't even done anything? She's a Jedi. Tarkosa snarled. That's all the law requires. Then the law is a fool, Jinsler said. The three survivors turned furious eyes on him. Keep out of this, Outlander, Tarkosa ordered. What do you know about us, or what we went through? Is that your reason for denying your children their birthright? Jinsler demanded. For keeping them from using and developing the talents they were born with. Is that your excuse, something that happened fifty years ago? Before any of them were even born? No, Evelyn said, her face pleading, her eyes shimmering with tears. Please, Ambassador. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be a Jedi. Jinsler shook his head. You don't have a choice, he told her quietly. None of us gets to choose which talents and abilities we're born with. Our only choice is whether we take those gifts and use them to live and grow and serve, or whether we bury them in the ground and try to pretend they were never there. Awkwardly, he shifted around in the cramped space and took the girl's hand. It was shaking, and the skin was icy cold. You can use the Force, Sevlin, he said. It's one of the greatest and rarest gifts that anyone can ever be given. You can't simply throw it away. She looked up at him, blinking back tears. Her face was so tight, he saw, and yet so controlled. And suddenly it was as if he were four years old again, 
gazing across the distance at his sister Lorana's eyes for the first time. Watching the wariness and uncertainty in her own face as she turned away, feeling himself seething with confusion and resentment at the special place she clearly held in his parents' hearts. Or was that as clear as he thought? He felt his hand tighten around Evelyn's as memories he'd spent years pushing away rushed in, washing over his carefully constructed view of himself and his life like a mountain stream cutting through loose mud. An image of his mother praising him for his near-perfect grade evaluation in fourth tier. Another image, this one of his father, complimenting him on his ingenuity as they worked together to rewire a section of the family holoviewer. More images, dozens of them, all showing that his long-held belief in parental neglect hadn't been true at all. In fact, it had been an out-and-out lie. A lie he'd created and repeated to himself over and over until he genuinely believed it. A lie he'd created for one reason, and one reason only. Jealousy. He hadn't hated Lorana at all, he saw now. He'd simply hated what she'd become, because it was what he had longed to be but never could. He closed his eyes. So simple, and yet it had taken him most of his life to finally recognize the truth. Or perhaps it had simply taken that long for him to admit it to himself. Perhaps, down deep, he'd known it all along. He opened his eyes, and as he did so, the image of Lorana's face vanished back into the mists of memory, leaving him once again sitting inside a ruined starship, huddled behind a makeshift barrier, holding a little girl's hand. He turned to Yulier. She has the power of the Jedi, Director Yulier, he said. She always will. You should be honored to know her. The other's eyes bored into him like a pair of hungry Duracrete slugs. But there was apparently something in Jinsler's expression that warned against further argument. The director merely gave a contemptuous snort and turned his face away without speaking. Jinsler looked at Tarkosa and Keely in turn, silently daring each of them to object. But whatever it was Yulier had seen, they saw it, too. Either of them spoke. And finally, he turned back to Rosemary. There's one last thing, he said. She needs the approval of the people she loves. More importantly, she deserves it. Rosemary swallowed visibly. She didn't like this. That was abundantly clear in the lines etched across her face. But beneath the fear and pain, he could see some of the same toughness he remembered in his own mother. It's all right, Evelyn, she said softly. It's all right. Go ahead and, and use what you have. Evelyn looked up into her mother's face, as if mentally testing her sincerity. Then she lowered her gaze to Jinsler. What do you want me to do? Jinsler took a deep breath. The peacekeeper over there by the wall has a calm link on his belt, he told her. Do you see it? Evelyn wiggled around to where she could peer through the mesh of the chair plugging the gap between table and bulkhead. Yes. It's the only thing that can shut off the jamming and let us call to our friends for help, Jinsler said. We need you to bring it to us. Your friends are dead, Keeley murmured. No, Jinsler said. Not these Jedi. I've heard of stories about them, Counselor. They can't be killed nearly as easily as Bersh thinks. And there are still Chiss warriors aboard our ship, Fisa added. Many of them. They can help us, too. But only if we can call them, Jinsler said, gazing into Evelyn's eyes. Only if you can bring us that comm link. Evelyn set her jaw. All right, she said. I'll try. Jinsler felt his throat ache with an old, old pain. Do or do not. There is no try. His father had quoted that Jedi dictum to him over and over again as he was growing up. 
But never before now had he been able to get past his own resentment and see the encouragement embedded in those words. Pressing his cheek against the chairs above him, wincing as one of the wolf kills snorted a breath of fetid air practically in his face, he looked across the room. At the peacekeeper's side, the comm link twitched. Yulier grunted something under his breath. The comm link twitched again, harder this time, and then, suddenly, it popped free of its clip and clattered onto the deck. The wolf kills paused in their pacing, all three shaggy heads turning toward the sound. Steady, Jinsler murmured. Let it sit there a minute. Evelyn nodded silently. A few seconds later, with nothing more to draw their attention, the wolf kills resumed their pacing. All right, Jinsler said. Now start it toward us. Slowly and as steady as you can. Slowly, though not at all steadily, the comm link began to move across the deck. One of the wolf kills paused again as it jerked its way to within three meters of the table, the animal's dark eyes watching the small cylinder with obvious curiosity. But none of its enemies was making any of the threatening moves it had been taught to react to, and its trainers clearly hadn't anticipated a situation quite like this. The wolf kill watched for a moment longer as the calm link rolled and bumped its way along, then lost interest and returned its attention to the creatures cowering behind their barrier. Again, Jinsler found himself holding his breath. Then, almost anticlimactically, the calm link was at the chair. Reaching out carefully, Evelyn plucked the device and threw one of the gaps in the mesh and an instant later jerked backward with a gasp as a snarling wolfkill slammed his snout into the chair, nearly knocking it out of position. Give it to me! Jinsler snapped, snatching the comm link out of the startled girl's hand. If a loose comm link rolling across the floor wasn't on the wolfkill's list of threats, something being held in an enemy's hand obviously was. Here, he added tossing it to Yulier as he swung his legs over and braced his feet against the chair. The wolf kill hit it again, but he'd gotten to it in time and it held steady. Shut off the jamming. Yulier's reply, if he made one, was lost as a set of snarling jaws and a clawed paw abruptly slapped into the chair directly above Jinsler's head. Brace the chairs, formed by called, struggling to sit upright and getting a one-handed grip on the back of the nearest one. Just in time, the third wolf kill leapt up onto the array of chairs above them, howling furiously as it bit and shoved its snout at them, trying to find a way through. One of its hind legs slipped down between two of them, and the animal howled even more furiously as it flailed around trying to extricate itself. The clawed paw slashed with random viciousness in the enclosed space, and Fisa gasped as it caught her across the shoulder, spilling a line of blood onto the bright yellow of her tunic. It's off! Yulier called over the noise. Holding grimly onto one of the chair backs with one hand, Jinsler thumbed on his comm link with the other, king for general broadcast. Luke, Mara, Commander Fell, he called. They couldn't be dead. They couldn't. Emergency! Beneath her, Luke gave one final tug on the cables, bringing Mara's eyes level with the lower edge of the turbolift door. How's that? He called. Good, Mara called back, running her fingertips along the corroded metal at the side of the door. In actual fact, Another pull or two might have been a little better for what she needed. But it had been a long climb, and even with all the strength he'd been able to draw from the force Luke's shoulders beneath her legs had been trembling with muscle fatigue for the past five minutes. Better that she strain a little herself and let him conserve what he had left for whatever lay ahead. Because if they were right about that soundless cry they both sensed a minute ago, there was serious trouble up here. Ah, there it was. Got it, she announced. Wrapping her fingertips around the manual release, she gave it a careful tug. There was a click as it came loose. Stretching out to the force, she pried the door open. 
But instead of opening to the cheery or at least adequate light of a standard turbolift lobby, it opened into almost total darkness. How come it's so dark? Luke asked. Probably because there aren't any lights. Mara told him, looking around as she got a grip on the edge of the opening and pulled herself up and through. Strangely, even most of the perm lights that should have been in the area seemed to be out. We may have been wrong about this being the main living area. Wait a second, she added, peering down the corridor. I can see some lights way aft. Maybe everybody's back there. Or maybe they're not. A voice came from the darkness to her right. Just stay where you are. Mara turned toward the sound and flinched back as the beam of a glow rod blazed to life in her face. She reacted instantly, dropping and throwing herself to her left in a flat half-roll that brought her back up into a squatting position with her lightsaber ready in her hand. The man with the glow rod tried to track the beam to her motion, but the half-roll fooled him and the beam overshot her. For a fraction of a second she was able to see past the light to the shadowy figure behind it and to the weapon he was holding in his other hand. First things first. Reaching out with the force, she got a grip on the weapon and twisted its muzzle away from her. To her surprise, instead of fighting against the push as most people instinctively did, the figure continued rolling his hand in the same direction, rotating at wrist and elbow and twisting out of her force grip as he would have from a normal combat wrist lock. He swung the arm back around in a tight circle, and was bringing it back to bear when the glow rod beam came back to her face. I said stay put. He snapped. Nice move. Mara complimented him, shielding her eyes from the light. This time, she recognized the voice. Guardian Presser, I presume? Put down the lightsaber. Presser ordered. Then move away. He broke off with a gasp of pain, his glow rod twisting wildly in his grip and coming to rest pointed at the ceiling. Mara blinked away the last remnants of the sparkles in her eyes in time to see his blaster wrench itself out of his hand and go flying toward the turbo lift. Sorry, Luke apologized, pulling himself the rest of the way out of the shaft and catching the weapon in his outstretched hand. But I don't think we've got time for a debate. Something's gone wrong up here. Obviously, Presser growled, rubbing his wrist. What did you do to the power? It wasn't us, Mara said. All we did was ungimmick the car you left us in. She broke off as a beep came from her belt. The jamming seems to be stopped too, she added, pulling out her comm link and touching the switch. Era. Commander fell. Jinsler's voice came urgently. Emergency! We're here, Mara said, throwing a sharp look at Luke. There were panicky voices and the sounds of serious commotion in the background. Report. We're in the council meeting chamber, Jinsler said, clearly fighting to keep his voice steady. Bersh has us trapped by those wolf kills of theirs. Wait a minute. Luke said into his own calm link. The wolf kills? What wolf kills? The ones they've been wearing everywhere. Jinsler ground out. They weren't dead, just in some kind of suspended animation, very slick, very advanced. And they're not Jeruns, sither. They're Vigari. Presser hissed something under his breath. Vigari? There was a muffled crash from the background. What's happening? Luke asked. The wolf kills are trying to get to us, Jinsler said. We've got them blocked, but I don't know how much longer we can keep them out. Mara looked at Presser. Which way? There, Presser said, pointing back toward the lighted area Mara had spotted earlier. Show us. Luke told Presser, handing him back his blaster. Jinsler? We're on our way. Watch out for Bersh and the others, 
Jinzla warned as they followed Presser down the corridor. They left all the wolf kills in here with us, but they've got some nasty looking stinging insects they use for personal protection. They might have other weapons too. Got it, Luke said. Any idea where they were heading? They just said they'd be wandering around, Jinsler said. It seems they also brought a supply of lion creepers. Terrific, Luke muttered, glancing into a darkened doorway as they passed. Fell? You there? Right here, Luke, Fell's voice came promptly. We caught the gist. What do you want us to do? Where are you? Where are you? D6, about midway back along the starboard corridor, Fell told him. You want us to head back to the turbolifts and join you up there? From the way the lights and power have gone out, I'd say Bersh has been here already with his line creepers. Guardian, are the aft turbo lifts operational? They should be, Presser said. I've got everything locked down between four and five, but from six up to here they should still work. You copy that? Luke called. Copy, Fell confirmed. General Drass calling the chaff envoy for the rest of his warriors. If we hurry, maybe we can catch Bersh and his friends in a pincer. Except that pressers locked down all the turbolifts from D4, Mara interjected. That was what you said, wasn't it? It was, Presser confirmed, punching keys on his own comm link. Maybe I'd better confirm that was actually done. Trilly? Someone answered in a voice too quiet for Mara to hear. Presser lowered his own voice, half turning away and speaking rapidly as he brought the person on the other end up to date. Luke caught Mara's eye. What do you think? He asked. We don't have time to be creative, Mara said. Not with Jinsler and the others under attack. Straight in is about all we've got to work with. Agreed, Luke said. Unless we want to layer the attack, with us leading the charge and the 501st, the Chiss, and Presser's peacekeepers coming in backup waves. We may not have any choice on the layering part, Mara pointed out. They'd reached a section of the ship where most of the pearl lights were functioning, she noted, as well as the majority of the regular lights. The line creepers must not have gotten a stranglehold on this area yet. The Chiss in particular are going to have to gear up from stage zero. Who knows how long that'll take? Let's find out, Luke said, lifting the comlink to his lips again. Fell, did you hear the question? Yes, but it appears to be a moot point, Fell said grimly. Drass can't make contact with the ship. No answer on any channel, from anyone. Mara looked at Luke her heart suddenly tight in her chest. He was staring back at her, a haunted expression on his face. The flurry of deaths they both sensed while they were down on D1. Luke? Yes, we heard, Luke said. Better get your team up here on the double. There's a good chance they may already have taken out the chaff on the... Understood, Fell said grimly. We're on our way. Luke clicked off the comm link. Guardian? Six of you can scratch most... Six of my peacekeepers are missing. Six out of how many? Mara asked. Presser snorted gently. Eleven, including me. We weren't exactly a serious fighting force to begin with, 
he waved his blaster. But they were here the whole time, either in the turbo lift or with my people. When could any of them have slipped away, either back to your ship or to hit my men? The key is that they weren't all here, Luke told him. We had to leave one of them behind. Because of injuries sustained in a mysterious sneak attack, Mara added sourly. What do you think, Luke? They shot Astash themselves? It's starting to look that way, Luke agreed, pausing to look down a cross corridor before passing it by. But at least they don't have the element of surprise anymore. They apparently had it long enough, Presser said bitterly. Don't worry, we'll get them, Mara said. What did you tell your people? I told the ones who are left to hold position, observe, and stand ready to defend those around them if attacked, Presser said, his jaw set belligerently. Two of them were in that room with your people, and I'm not going to risk the others on some bantha-brained attack until I have a better idea what we're up against. If he was expecting an argument, he was disappointed. I agree, Luke said. Actually, right now we need their eyes and ears around the ship more than we need the extra firepower. Absolutely, Mara agreed. After all, how much trouble can four or five Vigari make? She would remember that rhetorical question for a long time afterward. With Presser in the lead, they rounded a jog in the corridor and ran straight into the Vigari. But not four Vigari. Not even five Vigari. There were eight of them, Bersh and seven others, striding down the corridor toward them about ten meters away. Bersh was still dressed in his usual robe and tunic, minus his wolf kill, but the others were outfitted like soldiers, with helmets and full combat armor, armed with an eclectic mix of Chischerix and Old Republic blasters and carbines. Two wolf kills prowled ahead of them like advanced scouts, while five more wove in and out of their formation like a fighter escort. The two groups spotted each other at the same moment. Halt! Presser ordered, snapping his blaster up to point at Bersh. The Vigari halted, all right, in exactly the way Mara would have expected trained soldiers to. The four in front dropped instantly to one knee giving the ones behind them a clear shot as all seven raised their weapons in silent warning. The wolf kills halted more reluctantly, their eyes glaring balefully at the humans, their tails swishing restlessly. Easy, Luke murmured, reaching out a hand to gently push Presser's blaster out of line. At the same time, he subtly eased the shoulder in front of the other where he would be in a position to protect him if and when the Vigari decided to start shooting. His lightsaber was ready in his hand, Mara noted, but as yet unignited. Hello, Bersh, he called to the Vigari. I see you've brought some friends. Ah, the Jedi, Bersh said. If he was at all worried by their sudden appearance, it didn't show in his face. So you survived the turbo lift, after all. I'm very sorry for you. Why? Mara asked, a part of her mind studying the Vigari soldiers and trying to work through the unexpected numbers. Only five Vigari had been invited aboard the Chaff Anva, that much she was sure of. So where had the rest been hidden? Because it would have meant a quicker and less painful death for you, Berge said. Now it will involve much more suffering. Why does anyone have to die? Mara asked reasonably. Why don't you tell us what you want? Maybe we can work something out. Bersha's eyes flashed. You fool, he bit out. You think the Vigari can be bought off like trinket dealers in the marketplace? What was it? Bersh snorted. The avenging of fifty years of Vigari humiliation, he said. 
The achieving of 50 years of Vigari desire. Does that tell you anything? More than you'd think, Mara assured him. It did nothing of the sort, of course, at least not yet. But one of the first rules she'd been taught about interrogation technique was that every bit of information that could be coaxed out of an unwary or talkative subject was a piece that might later prove important to the overall puzzle. And have you achieved those noble goals? Bersha's twin mouths curved in a bitter smile. Beyond our most optimistic hopes, he said. The human remnant we leave behind will spend their last hours cursing themselves for how they have unwittingly served us. Sounds intriguing, Mara said encouragingly. How about letting us in on the secret? We're all going to die soon anyway, right? Bersha's eyes shifted to Luke. Is this Jedi heroism? He asked contemptuously. To let your female speak while you cower in silence? Luke stirred. I'm hardly cowering, he said mildly. I let Mara do the talking because she's better at this sort of thing than I am. Comes of being trained to interrogate prisoners. The Vigari smile turned smug. You have it upside down, Jedi, he said softly. And we have wasted enough time with you. Now die. He murmured something, and abruptly the two wolf kills and the lead leapt forward. Mara caught a flicker in Luke's sense as he prepared for combat. No, she told him, brushing his chest with her fingertips as she took a long step to put herself between him and Presser and the charging animals. You did all the climbing. This one's mine. Before he could argue the point she took another long step forward, stretching out to the force as she gauged the distance and timing. Ears laid back, salivating jaws wide open, the wolf kill's paws hit the deck one final time and leapt straight for her throat. With a quick sidestep, Mara ignited her lightsaber and cut both of them in half. She turned to the Vigari as the remains of the animals hit the deck behind her with sickening multiple thuds. No, she said conversationally, holding her lightsaber in ready position. What was that about someone dying? Bersha's eyes were wide, his face rigid with shock. The smug smile had vanished completely. His mouth worked a moment and with a sort of strangled gasp he spat something in his own language. In answer, seven alien weapons opened fire. Mara was ready. Her lightsaber flashed as she opened her mind to the Force, letting it guide her hands, slashing the brilliant blue blade across the mixture of red and blue bolts. Her sharp focus on the threat in front of her gave her a sort of tunnel vision. But though she couldn't see him, she could sense that Luke was at her side with his own lightsaber deflecting the bolts into bulkheads and deck and ceiling. Dimly, she sensed someone else firing nearby, and noticed one of the Vigari stagger in his armor, his weapon twisted to fire uselessly into the ceiling. Presser, she realized in a distant sort of way, firing through the defensive barrier she and Luke had set up in front of him. There was another shout of alien language ringed by a sense of rage and desperation. The remaining wolf kills leapt forward, apparently oblivious to the blaster bolts scorching the air around them as they charged toward the defenders. Mara took a step forward as Luke took one backward, her lightsaber never missing a beat of their defense, as Luke closed down his weapon and dropped to one knee behind her. She might be better than he was at detailed lightsaber work. But even after a long climb he was far and away the best she'd ever seen at this kind of focused accuracy with the Force. If the Vigari weren't already sufficiently impressed, she thought as she continued to deflect their shots, this ought to do it. The wolf kills reached their jumping-off spot and started to leap straight at her. They squealed like small lapdokricks coming to an abrupt and simultaneous halt as Luke stretched out with the force to momentarily scramble their nervous systems. As they stood stunned, he sent a second, 
more precise mental jolts into their systems, his mind searching out and focusing on their sleep centers. With a group sigh, the animal's legs collapsed beneath them and they dropped unconscious to the deck. Luke got back to his feet. Well? He challenged. Farm boy, the word ran affectionately through Mara's mind. She herself had been trained in ruthlessness, taught never to risk herself for those who threatened her and who, by definition, had therefore forfeited their right to live. But Luke didn't see things that way. Even as the years had grown and matured and hardened him, the inner core of idealism and mercy he'd brought with him out of that moisture farm on Tatooine had never faltered. Others might sneer at that, she knew, or use his farming background as an insult. But for her, the title was an acknowledgement of his moral high ground, a large part of what she loved and admired most about her husband. And at the end of the day, she slept better for knowing that even their deadliest opponents had been given every chance they could possibly hope to receive. But in this case, the chance was wasted. Bersha's only response was to scream another order. His soldiers' only response was to intensify their rate of fire. And as the shots began to come perilously close to her face, Mara knew that this particular battle had come to an end. That end came in the form of a lightsaber whipping through the air beside her, deftly slipping between the frenetic slicing movements of her own weapon. It flashed down the corridor, spinning like a blazing crop harvester disc, slicing through the Vagari weapons and armor and bodies. Two seconds later, it was over. Mara straightened from her combat stance, breathing hard as she studied the fallen soldiers, stretching out with the force for signs of any surprises still lurking nearby. But Luke had done what was necessary with his usual efficiency. It was only then that she saw that Bersh wasn't among the fallen. Where did he go? She demanded, taking another look. Who? Luke asked, looking up from the wolf kill he had knelt to examine. Bersh, Mara said. He's gone. She turned to look at Presser. Guardian? Presser didn't answer. He was staring at the crumpled Vigari bodies, his jaw hanging open in disbelief. Presser? Mara tried again. With an effort, he raised his eyes to her. What? After fifty years without Jedi, these people had apparently forgotten what they were capable of. Right, Presser said, visibly pulling himself together. He, uh, he took off right after. He shot Luke a furtive glance. After you put the animals to sleep. Or whatever you did to them. The rest cranked up their rate of fire, and he took off back down the corridor. We'd better get after him, Mara said grimly. Luke? Go ahead, he told her, moving to the next wolf kill. I want to make sure they won't wake up until we're ready to deal with them. Go on, I'll catch up. Okay, Mara said, starting down the corridor. Come on, Presser, you have to show me where this meeting room is, she added, pulling out her comm link and flicking it on. Fell, stay on your toes, she called. It looks like we've got more Vigari to deal with than we were expecting. There was no answer. Fell? She tried again. Still nothing. I would say, Presser said quietly, that they've probably already figured that out. Chapter 20 the AFT sections of D6 weren't AS well-maintained AS the corridor between the nursery and the Jedi quarantine had been. But the aft turbolift tubes weren't very far, the area was passable enough, and the 501st was what the training manuals would have called. Inspired. They made it to the turbolift lobby without further incident, and in probably record time. 
Fell had keyed the call button, and they were waiting for the car to arrive, when they got their first hint of imminent trouble. It doesn't sound right, Commander. Grappler insisted, the side of his helmet pressed against the turbo lift door. It sounds, it just sounds wrong. Wrong how? Feld demanded impatiently. He was all for caution, but at the same time he didn't want to start jumping at moss creakings, either. Not with Formby and the others in danger up there. Does it sound old, rusty, cranky? What? It's too heavy. Watchman decided suddenly, his helmet pressed to the door alongside grapplers. There's too much weight there for an empty car. Fell shot a glance at Drask. Could it be a problem with the repulsor lift generators? No, Watchman said. There's some of that too, but not enough. The car is definitely loaded. And we must assume it is loaded with enemies, Drask said. I suggest, Commander, that we take cover. Fell grimaced. To run and hide felt cowardly somehow, especially since he still wasn't convinced there was anything but an empty turbolift car on the way. Still, it wouldn't do Jinsler and form by any good if he and the 501st got themselves slaughtered like amateurs. And since it was Drask who had suggested it, and not he himself, he wouldn't have to put up with any of the general's criticism later. Defensive positions, he ordered. Glancing around, he located a likely doorway a few meters back down the corridor and headed to it. The room appeared to be a small duty galley for the engine crews, with dust and broken serving crockery everywhere. Settling himself into a position half straddling the doorway where he could see without exposing more of himself than necessary, he braced his blaster hand against the door controls and waited. The turbo lift's hum changed subtly as the car settled into position. And with a brilliant flash of white, the door exploded outward. Reflexively, Fell ducked back as shrapnel and pieces of burning plastic clattered down the corridor. Apparently, Watchman Grappler had been right. The sound of the explosion faded away, and he swung his eye and blaster back around the jam. Two armored figures charged out through the ragged opening, firing red blaster bolts in a scatter pattern as they came. Fell inhaled sharply. After Jinsler's warning he had naturally expected the intruders to be some of Bersha's disguised Vigari cronies but he'd expected the short robe and dead animal clothed beings they'd gotten used to seeing aboard the Chaff Envoy, not a fully equipped war party. Another pair of Vigari charged out on the heels of the first two, for snarling and definitely not dead wolf kills emerging with them. So far, the Imperials hadn't returned fire. It was, Feld decided, about time to change that. Wincing back slightly as one of the random shots sizzled off the bulkhead near him, he filled his lungs. Halt! He bellowed. He hadn't expected any response except possibly better-directed enemy fire, and he wasn't disappointed. All four enemy helmets swung toward the sound of his voice, all four weapons still spitting fire as they tracked him. Coolly, centering his muzzle on the nearest Vigari's chest, Fell squeezed the firing stud. The alien staggered back as the blaster bolt blew a cloud of dust and partially vaporized armor from his chest plate. A fraction of a second later Fell had to dodge back around the door controls again as a hail of fire scorched the air where he'd been standing. He ducked down lower and swung his arm around the corner to fire a couple of blind shots in their direction. Out in the corridor, the sounds of the Vigari weapons had been joined by the Blastek's distinctive nasal stutter, and a different sound he assumed was Drask Charik. Still firing, he eased an eye cautiously around the doorway to refine his aim. Just in time to see one of the wolf kills leaping directly for him. He dodged backward into the galley. The wolf kill's charge overshot the doorway, and Fell got a clean shot into the animal's flank as it passed. 
But the wolf kill merely hit the deck and skidded to a stop, its claws scrabbling for purchase. Without any sign that it had just taken what should have been a killing shot, it turned back toward him. With a roar, it opened its jaws and leapt. Fell backed up, firing another pair of ineffective shots into the wolf kill's head and shoulders, then dodged to his right, trying to avoid the animal's charge. But the wolf kill wasn't going to be taken in by the same maneuver twice. It hit the ground and instantly made a right angle turn. Before Fell could do more than fire one last time, it was on him. More by luck than by skill he managed to deflect the clawed forelegs from his face as he dropped his blaster and thrust his arms forward in a desperate attempt to grab the wolf kill's neck before its teeth could reach him. The animal twisted its head to the side in midair, its jaws clamping hard around Fell's right forearm. Fell gasped as a stab of pain shocked through him. The animal's momentum shoved him backward, knocking him off his balance and toppling them both toward the deck. His flailing left hand caught a handful of neck fur. Tugging hard as he twisted the rest of his body, he managed to turn the animal far enough that they hit the deck side by side instead of with the wolf kill landing on top of him. Another thud of pain shot through Fell's side from the impact, a jolt punctuated by several sharper, more localized jabs from the bits of broken servingware beneath them. Again, the wolf kill didn't even seem to notice. Fell tightened his grip on the animal's fur, trying desperately to come up with a plan. His knees and feet were too hemmed in by the wolf kill's body for him to try kicking it, even if he'd had some idea where its vulnerable areas were. His right arm was trapped and useless, and his left hand was effectively immobilized by the need to keep holding on to the wolf kill's neck but the animal's eyes were within reach. Maybe. Fell stared at the dark eyes, trying to push back the agony long enough to think. Letting go of the wolf kill's neck would be dangerous, possibly even fatal. But it seemed to be the only chance he had. If he didn't do something fast, he could lose his right arm entirely, and with only one functioning arm the end would come very quickly. Bracing himself, mentally crossing his fingers, he let go with his left hand and grabbed for the wolf kill's eyes. That had apparently been precisely the move the animal had been waiting for. With a triumphant growl, it instantly let loose of Fell's right arm. With its head and neck free, it arched its back, its bloody jaws aiming straight at Fell's throat. Fell had just enough time to jerk back, knowing that he'd gambled and lost as a white-armored hand abruptly appeared in front of the darting jaws. The wolf kill snarled as it clamped down on rigid plastic alloy composite instead of a soft human neck. The snarl quickly turned into a startled yip as it was hauled straight off the deck by its jaws and the scruff of its neck. Ready? The stormtrooper called, holding the wiggling animal at arm's length. Ready, another voice called back. With a grunt, the first stormtrooper heaved the animal over his head toward the far corner of the room. There was a sputter of multiple blaster fire, and then silence. Nice job, Fell said, breathing hard as he started to get shakily to his feet. The stormtrooper still standing over him, Shadow, he was able to identify him now, grabbed his uninjured arm and helped him the rest of the way up. Perfect timing and everything. Thanks. Don't mention it, sir, Shadow said. How bad is it? I'll live, Fell assured him, studying his arm. It looked terrible, he had to admit, but it didn't feel too bad. Though that could be the effect of the adrenaline still filling his bloodstream. It would probably hurt a lot more in a minute or two. What happened out there? We got them all, Cloud said, stepping to his side with a bandage and synth flesh tube from his medpock. Seems their armor wasn't designed with Blastex in mind. What about General Drask? Fell asked, trying to look past the two stormtroopers to the door. I am unhurt, Drask said, moving into view around Cloud. 
I am sorry your rescue was delayed. As long as it got here eventually, Fell said, wincing as Shadow tore back his sleeve. I shot it a couple of times, but it didn't seem to do any good. Look, Cloud, just stop the bleeding and kill the pain, all right? As long as I can use it, everything else can wait until later. So where are the vital spots on these things, anyway? I'm not sure there are any vital spots. Watchman said as Cloud put away the synth flesh tube and concentrated on the bandage. They look like normal animals, but their internal structure seems to be highly decentralized, with their nervous systems and vital organs distributed throughout their bodies. You have to basically turn the whole animal into chopped meat to stop it. I'll remember that. Fell said, eyeing the handful of fresh scorch marks on Watchman's armor. Anyone hurt? A few nicks, Watchman said, displaying a section of his left forearm where a tiny hole had been punched completely through. They can wait until we get back to the ship. Fell looked at Drask. Assuming there's still a ship to go back to. There will be, Drask assured him darkly. There are still Chiss warriors aboard the vessel. It and they will be waiting when we return. I hope you're right, Fell said. Okay, that's good enough, he added as Cloud finished the first layer of bandage and started in on a second. Is that turbolift car still operational, or did that little entrance of theirs wreck it? It looked all right, Watchman said. Grappler's doing a more complete check on it now. Oh, and the Jedi tried to reach us during the battle, Shadow added. Fel hadn't even heard the call signal from his comm link. What did they want? They were warning us there were more Vigari than we might expect, Watchman said. I think we got the message, Fel said, starting for the door. Did anyone answer them? I don't believe so. Watchman said. I think we were all too busy at the time. Understandable, Fell said, retrieving his blaster from the deck where he dropped it. We'll check in with them on the way up. Grappler was waiting by the shattered turbolift door, his helmet swiveling back and forth as he kept watch along the various corridors for any other surprises the Vigari might decide to throw at them. The turbolift is operational, he confirmed. Good, Fell said, leading the way inside. Let's go. What then is the plan? Drask asked as the car began its slightly tentative rise toward D5. Fell braced himself. This went against everything he'd been taught, and was going to be embarrassing besides. But he'd already concluded it was the only way. The plan, General Drask, he said quietly, is that I'm requesting you to take command of the 501st for the duration of this battle. It was, he reflected, possibly the most surprised he'd ever seen Drask get. You are asking, command? As you yourself pointed out, you're a ground officer, Fell reminded him evenly. I'm a flight officer. This is your area of expertise, not mine. Yet they are your command, Drask said. Do you so easily surrender them to another? Not easily at all, Fell admitted. But it would be the height of arrogance and pride to risk their lives, not to mention the lives of our companions, by insisting on amateur leadership when a professional is standing by. Don't you agree? For a moment Drask just gazed at him, his glowing red eyes narrowed. Then, to Fell's surprise, the general actually smiled. The first genuine smile, to the best of Fell's recollection, that any of the Chiss had given any of the Imperials since their arrival aboard the Chaff Anvil. Well and artfully spoken, Commander Fell, Drask said. I hereby accept command of this unit. He lifted a finger. But, he added, whereas I know ground combat, you are far more versed in the design and layout of the particular battleground we find ourselves in. It will therefore be a joint command. Fell inclined his head. 
In practice, he knew joint commands were usually a disaster, spawning conflicting orders, dueling egos, and general chaos. But in this case, he also knew that none of those problems was going to arise. He would be content to feed Drask tactical data and let the general direct the action. Drask obviously knew that too. Which meant that the offer of joint command had been made solely as a face-saving gesture for Fell himself, to protect his position and his status among his men. There were some aspects of the Chiss warrior philosophy that still drove Fell crazy. But clearly, there were other aspects he could learn to live with. Very well, General, he said. I accept. Good. Drask's eyes glittered as he lifted his charik. Then let us show the Vigari what it means to wage war on the Chiss Ascendancy and the Empire of the Hand. Fell smiled, looking at his stormtroopers. Yes, he said softly. Let's. They attacked Mara together, all three wolf kills charging across the council meeting room like furry proton torpedoes. They leapt to the attack, their primary target clearly the hands holding the strange blue-bladed weapon. Dodging coolly to the side, she cut them down with three quick slashes. Across the room, Jinsler and the others in the makeshift refuge were already pushing aside the chairs that had made up the roof. Hurry, please, Fisa pleaded, pushing away one of the chairs and then bending back down to take Formby's arm. Aristocra Chafor Embintrano is badly hurt. Mara closed down her lightsaber and hurried over, throwing a quick look at the three Chiss warriors and two young men sprawled on the floor as she passed them. Presser was already kneeling beside one of the men, but it was clear to her that all five of them were beyond help. They had pushed over the table and Fisa was helping a shaky and blood-soaked form by out when Mara arrived. Everyone else all right? She said, glancing around for other signs of injury as she refastened her lightsaber to her belt. No one else is hurt, Fisa confirmed, apparently ignoring the line of blood across her own shoulder. Please help him. Just relax. Mara soothed her, taking a moment to study the three old men who had left the refuge and gathered together against the back wall, as if trying to stay as far away from her as they could. Probably some of the original survivors of the outbound flight's destruction, she decided. Luke? Mara? Right here, Fell. You all right? Watch out for those wolf kills. They're extremely hard to kill. Not if you have a lightsaber, Mara told him. I'll make a note to start issuing them to the troops, Fell said dryly. Anyway, we're clear, and heading to D5 in one of the aft turbo lifts. Any new instructions? For the moment, just take out any Vigari you run into, Mara told him. We still don't know how many there are though, so make sure you don't get trapped in an attrition zone. And if you run into any colonists, try to move them somewhere safe. Copy. We're on our way. We'll be pushing our way back toward you soon, Mara said. Luke? Right here, his voice came back. I've put all the wolf kills to sleep, and I'm on my way. What's your situation? Under control, Mara told him. You might as well not even stop here. Keep going and see if you can drive the Vigari back toward the Fievel first. I'll finish here and catch up with you. Right. Mara returned her calm link to its pouch and gently let Formby's arm down. It's bad, all right, she agreed. 
I think you're going to need more than our medpacks can handle. Presser? Presser looked up from his examination of the other young peacekeeper, his eyes smoldering. What? Where are your facilities? You mean our medical facilities? Presser growled. For the wounded? Mara frowned, and then, belatedly, she got it. Presser, kneeling beside one of his dead peacekeepers. I'm sorry about your friend, she said gently. But there's nothing we can do for him now. So we should instead give our supplies to help an alien? One of the older men by the wall demanded bitterly. The very alien who was responsible for bringing these murderers aboard our ship? Mara turned to face him. Look, she said, fighting to keep her voice and temper under control. I understand your anger. But there's a time for analysis and blame setting, and this isn't it. You've lost two men. Six. Presser corrected harshly. You've lost six men, Mara snapped, resisting the temptation to remind him that none of them would have died at all if Presser hadn't locked her and Luke away in that turbo lift car. That's the way warfare goes. They were armed, and they at least had a fighting chance. She nodded back at the door. That's more than you can say for the rest of the people out there. Unless we move, and move fast, they're all going to die. Is that what you want? So go help them, Jedi, the old man bit out. Who's stopping you? Mara shook her head. We're not going to do this piecemeal, running around at cross purposes and getting in each other's way, she said. We do this together, or we don't do it at all. Our part is to fight. Presser's part is to tell us where the enemy is and to assist us. She leveled a finger at the three of them. Your part is to stay behind the battle line, treat the wounded, and protect our civilians until we get back. If that's unacceptable, we can leave right now. So nothing has changed, one of the other old men murmured. Apparently not, the spokesman agreed, his voice edged in bitterness. Very well, Jedi. We'll heal your wounded. As you command. He drew himself up. But when this is over, you will leave us. Is that understood? Perfectly, Mara said, turning her back on him in disgust. All right, Fisa, you and the Aristocra can go with them. You too, Ambassador. A moment, if I may? Jinsler asked, stepping up to her. I'd like to ask you a favor, he added, lowering his voice. Mara stared at him in disbelief. A favor? Jinsler, we don't have time for this. It's a very small favor, he assured her. I want you to take Evelyn with you. Mara frowned past his shoulder at the woman and the girl huddling together uncertainly behind Fisa and Formby. You must be joking. Not at all, Jinsler insisted. She has rudimentary force abilities. And you've already seen how Director Yulier and the other survivors feel about Jedi. I think she'll be safer with you than with them. She'll be safer in a war zone? Mara countered pointedly. Jinsler's eyes were steady on her. Please? Mara shook her head in exasperation. But even in her annoyance, she could sense that Jinsler was deadly serious. And now that she was focusing her attention on the woman and girl, she could feel the gnawing fear within them, as well. A fear that seemed more personal than just the fact that there were armed Vigari running loose aboard their ship. Fine, she said with a sigh but she stays way behind me where it'll be at least halfway safe. Thank you, Jinsler said, beckoning to the girl. Evelyn? 
Come on. Mara shook her head again as the girl hurried toward her. How to make a difficult situation even harder, in one easy lesson. She just hoped it would be worth it. Mara? She turned to see Presser coming toward her. Yes? She asked in a tone designed to warn him away from any further arguments. But to her mild surprise, he hadn't come to argue. Here, you might need these, he muttered, thrusting a pair of calm links toward her. Like you said, we have to work together here. These will connect you directly to me and to the other peacekeepers. And there's a channel that cuts through jamming, too, Jinsler added. Just in case Bersh finds those controls and turns it on again. It's here, Presser said, pointing out the setting. Thanks, Mara said, stuffing the comm links into her belt. Be careful. Presser glanced at his niece, then over at the old men glaring at them from across the room. And, he added, lowering his voice, may the force be with you. There were three armored Vigari standing guard in the turbolift lobby when Fell, Drask, and the 501st arrived. They weren't standing guard for long. Power levels seem fine, Watchman said, glancing around. Their line creepers must not have gotten this far aft yet. This will be the last place they will spread them, Drask said. The Jedi said that the forward turbolifts have already been compromised. The Vigari must make certain these remain operational if they hope to escape again to the surface. Makes sense, Fell agreed, visualizing the ship's layout in his mind. To be specific, they need the turbolift that connects to the starboard side. That's the only one left that'll get them to D4. Which means they will have committed a large number of troops to its defense, Drask said thoughtfully. What do you think, Commander? Would that be a good place for an ambush? Maybe, Fell said doubtfully. Of course, it's also the most likely place for them to be expecting an attack. I did not say an attack, Drask said, his eyes glittering maliciously. I said an ambush. The aft turbolift cluster consists of six cars, does it not, operated singly or in groups? Should be the same setup as the forward ones, yes, Fell said, nodding. And the starboard tube connects with D4, D5, and the storage core? Fell smiled tightly as he finally understood. Yes, sir, it does, he said. How do you want to proceed? Drask looked at the stormtroopers. We will assign two to each mission, I think, he said. Normally I would prefer three or more for the ambush unit, but the 501st has shown itself capable of handling unusual odds. And if we don't have at least two of them here with us, the Vigari may notice and get suspicious. Fell agreed. Watchman and Shadow, how would you like to take a walk? Ready and willing, sir, Watchman said. Once we've reached the Turbolift Pylon, what exactly do you want us to do? You will take up position at the point where the tube from the storage core connects with the tube running between D4 and D5, Drask told him. We will attempt to drive the Vigari back into the cars. As they lift toward D4, we will alert you, and you will destroy them in transit. Can that be done? I think so, Watchman said. It should be easy enough to lock down one of the cars just below the intersection point and climb the rest of the way into position. And as long as you have that one car tucked away out of the line of fire, you can shoot up any of the others that you need to, Fell added. But make sure that one car stays tucked away, or we won't be able to get back to the surface ourselves. And watch out for the same kind of trap Presser had set in the forward cars, Grappler warned. They are likely to have wired this group, as well. No problem, Watchman assured him. Now that we know how it works, we should be able to get up onto the roof of the car and either bypass or reroute the wiring. Good, Fell said. 
Everyone clear on their job? There were four nods. Then carry out your orders, Drask said. Maintain calm silence unless absolutely necessary. The enemy may be able to locate your transmissions and thereby anticipate your movements. May warrior's fortune smile on your efforts. Stiffening briefly to attention, Watchman and Shadow returned to the turbolift car. No, Fell said as the car's creakings faded into the distance. What are your plans for the rest of us? First, we borrow these. Stooping, Drask relieved one of the dead Vigari of his blaster carbine and helmet. The armor, unfortunately, is too small for us. Still, the weapons may be enough. Choose a weapon for yourself, Commander, and let us plot out our best approach to the enemy. Cautiously, Luke eased an eye around the jog in the corridor just ahead of him. Somewhere nearby he could sense a pair of vaguely hostile alien minds. There was a flicker of warning from the Force, and he ducked back just as a pair of Red Bolt's blue pieces of the corner passed his face. Okay, he murmured aloud to himself. So they were closer than he'd realized, and more than just vaguely hostile. That was handy to know. Anyone ever tell you that talking out loud when you're alone is a bad sign? Mara murmured from behind him. When the Force is your ally, you're never truly alone, Luke said gravely, turning around and blinking in mild surprise as he caught sight of the girl trailing silently behind his wife. We have company? So it would seem, Mara gestured to the girl. You remember Evelyn, don't you? Quite well, Luke said. Hello, Evelyn. Hello, the girl said a bit timidly. I'm sorry about earlier. That's all right. Luke looked at Mara, lifting his eyebrows questioningly. It's a long story, she said, and I only have half of it myself. The short version is that Jinsla thinks she'll be safer with us right now than with her own people. All right, Luke said, setting his curiosity aside in favor of more pressing business. Did you get the message from Fell? The one about us pushing the Vigari back toward the turbo lifts? She nodded. Pressers also heard from one of his people back there. It appears that as long as the colonists stay out of their way, the Vigari aren't bothering to shoot them. Rather have them die slowly, I guess, Luke said. Mara nodded. And to that end, they're also apparently scattering line creepers by the bucketful. She hesitated. We may not be able to save this place, Luke. He'd already come to that conclusion. We'll just have to do what we can, he said. And the faster we finish off the Vigari, the less of a problem we'll have. Are any of Presser's people going to be in a position to help when we start our push? Not really, Mara said. Four of them are inside current Vigari territory, but I doubt their antiquated blasters have enough power to punch through that armor. Oh, and it turns out that two of the missing peacekeepers had only been stunned by the 501st as they passed through D6 and are up and functional again. That helped Presser's mood a little. Happy allies are good to have, Luke said. Let's keep him that way by telling his people to stay put. Outnumbered and undergunned is a bad combination. Already done, Mara confirmed. Though one bright side is that they're probably not as undergunned as they might have been. The fact that the Vigari are using Cherix and Old Republic blasters against us implies they didn't bring any real weapons of their own, but had to loot the Chaff Envoy and D4's armory for what they needed. Makes sense, Luke said. They couldn't risk the Chiss picking up odd power readings when they went through scanning their shuttle for line creepers. And of course, that leaves them with the same overage to ban a gas problem the peacekeepers have. Right, Mara said. Even so, the outnumbering remains. She hefted her lightsaber. So I guess it's up to us. 
and the 501st. Luke paused, frowning as a distant sound caught his attention. You hear that? Sounds like blaster fire, Mara said, her forehead wrinkled in concentration. And lots of it. Maybe they've decided some of the colonists need to die right now after all, Luke said grimly. Or else one of Presser's people decided to be a hero, Mara agreed. Either way, I think that's our cue. Right. Luke ignited his lightsaber. The two Vagari were still there, he knew, but it was unlikely they would be expecting a straight-out charge. Ready? Ready. Again, Drask ordered. Fel nodded and fired again, sending a short burst from his borrowed carbine into the corridor wall a few meters in front of him, listening to the slightly wheezy and very distinctive sound of the ancient weapon. Anything? They sound agitated, the general said, holding his appropriated Vigari helmet up to his ear. Ah, uh, there is an order. Fell frowned. How can you possibly know that? He asked. You don't even speak their language. There is a tone of command that is the same in all languages, Drask said. Now we need only wait and see if it is the command we are hoping for. They're coming, Grappler murmured, cocking his head toward the corner he and Cloud were waiting beside. Stand ready, Drask gestured to Fell. Fire again. Fell did so, trying to watch both ends of the corridor at once. Between bursts he could hear rapid footsteps approaching. Suddenly, with a clatter of armor, they were there, five armored Vigari, charging to what they thought was their comrade's aid. They got off a single, startled volley before the two stormtroopers cut them down. Good, Drask said, surveying their handiwork with satisfaction. That diminishes the enemy somewhat. Where do you recommend we go next? There's a series of emergency battery rooms back that way, Fell said dubiously. You aren't really intending to try the same trick twice, are you? Not at all, Drask assured him. It is time to take the battle to the enemy. The other stormtroopers should be in position by now. Let us see if we can drive the Vigari into reach of their weapons. Ah, uh, Fell said. In that case, we probably want the fluid system service corridor instead of the battery rooms. There are two access panels in particular we might find useful, one opening into one of the cross corridors on the side of the starboard turbolift lobby, the other door opening into the lobby itself. How likely are the Vigari to have set up pickets at the entrance to this corridor? Not very, Fell said. It's narrow and probably not well marked. And it offers an avenue of retreat? It has doors to both the main engine room and the secondary command complex, Fell told him. We could hold off a small army from either place. Excellent, Drask said. Take us there. Cautiously, keeping an eye out for stray Vigari, Fell led the way through a series of small utility rooms. They reached the entrance to the service corridor, only to find it jammed shut. What I don't understand is where they're all coming from, Fell said, stroking his bandaged right arm restlessly as he watched Grappler and Cloud work on the door. That ship of theirs couldn't have followed us here, could it? It could not and did not, Drask told him. But surely now that we know about their suspended animation technology, the answer is obvious. But if they didn't, oh, Fell broke off, embarrassed. It was obvious. Those three sealed rooms aboard their shuttle, the ones they claimed were open to vacuum. Yes, Drask confirmed. Though undoubtedly a small portion of each was indeed open to space. Right, the part by the door sensor and access port, Fell said, nodding. Otherwise, a secondary test by your people would have shown that the readings were fake. 
They would have had a secret way to reseal the rooms, of course, Drask said. That was why they pretended Estash had been attacked, to give him an excuse to stay behind. Only it wasn't just pretending, they really did shoot him, Fell reminded him. These people are seriously out for revenge. Perhaps, Drask murmured. Or perhaps they are motivated by something more practical. There was a hollow popping sound from the door. Got it, Cloud announced. Good, Drask said. Proceed. Cloud led the way, followed by Grappler, Drask, and Fell. The corridor was narrower than it had looked on the blueprints, Fell realized with a twinge of apprehension, with barely enough room for the stormtroopers to get through without scraping their shoulders on the piping and access manifolds lining the walls. Far too narrow for any of them to pass any of the others. Which meant that if they had to retreat, it would be Fell and his injured gun arm who would be running point. But at least the Vigari did seem to have missed this particular back door. There were no sentries or other signs of enemy presence in the corridor. In fact, from all appearances, the place might not have been visited in years, and several times Fell had to fight back a reaction to the drifting dust being kicked up by their passage. It would be a shame to put this much effort into sneaking up on the enemy only to announce their presence with a coughing fit. They made it to their target panel without incident. Drask motioned the stormtroopers to take up side-to-side -side positions in front of it, Blastex at the ready. Then, reaching around past them, he punched the release. This door, fortunately, opened without any difficulty at all. The stormtroopers were ready, opening fire the instant the sliding panel was clear of their muzzles. Can you see anything? Fell shouted to Drask over the Blastex stuttering screams. Vigari, Drask shouted back succinctly. Return fire was starting to come now, and Fell winced as burst after burst slammed into his men, leaving blackened marks on the clean white armor. The targets were clearly plentiful. Fell could see both stormtroopers rhythmically swinging their weapons back and forth, but at the same time the return fire seemed to be increasing rather than decreasing. However many troops Bearish had brought along, it was starting to look like a large percentage of them were right here. And even the legendary 501st had a limit to what it could handle. It took only a few more seconds for Drast to come to the same conclusion. Again reaching past the stormtroopers, he punched the control. The door slid shut, the metal ringing with the impact of belated Vigari fire. We have done what we can to encourage their retreat, he said, nudging Fell back toward the direction they'd come from. It is time to make our own. Right. Fell turned around. And froze. Moving stealthily through the passage toward them was a line of Vigari warriors. Apparently, the enemy hadn't missed this bet after all. Chapter 21 Gathering his feet beneath him, Luke ducked out of the doorway he'd been hiding in and sprinted ahead and down the corridor toward the next room in line. As he ran, a hail of blaster bolts scorched the air around him, scattering from his lightsaber blade. He made it to the doorway without getting hit and ducked inside the room. It was another bunk room, he saw, this one having been converted into a game area. In the back corner four young couples sat huddled together on the floor, their fear radiating toward him like a set of pearl lights. It's all right, he assured them. Don't worry, you're safe now. None of them replied. With a sigh, he leaned back out into the corridor for another cautious look. He had hoped this strange aversion to Jedi was confined to the original group of outbound flight survivors. But whatever the reason for their hatred, they'd clearly done a good job of passing it on to successive generations. Unfortunately, if Jinsler was to be believed, it also meant this was yet another place where it might not be safe to leave Evelyn alone. 
It was starting to look like they were going to have to drag her all the way back to the turbo lifts. Behind him, Mara signaled that they were ready. Raising his lightsaber again, he stepped back into the corridor. Again, the Vigari opened fire. But this time, the shots were coming from a set of doorways farther down the corridor. He and Mara might not be taking down many of the enemy with this maneuver, Luke reflected as he took a step toward them, but they were definitely pushing them back. There was the sound of running feet behind him, and Mara and Evelyn ducked into the room he just left. Clear! Mara called. Stepping back again, Luke joined them. Everyone still okay? He asked. Yes, Mara said. Evelyn looked a little winded, but seemed all right otherwise. By the way, did you notice the Vigari have their own jamming system up and running? No, I hadn't, Luke said, frowning. When did this happen? Sometime in the past few minutes, I think, Mara said. I tried to call Fell while you were clearing this last section and could get only static. Terrific, Luke muttered. Not as terrific as they think, Mara said, pulling one of the old Republic comm links out of her belt and handing it to him. We can still keep in touch with Presser and the Peacekeepers with these. That's something anyway, Luke agreed, sliding the comm link onto his belt beside his own. What do you suppose they're up to? I don't know, Mara said. It might not be anything more sinister than Bersh deciding he was tired of coordinated attacks. Then again it might, Luke pointed out grimly. And Fell and the 501st are back there all alone. He caught the flicker of concern from his wife. Apparently, she'd grown fond of the Imperials. We'd better pick up our pace a little, she said. Right, Luke said, stepping back to the doorway. Here goes. The Vigari in the front of the line jerked back as a blaster bolt found a gap in his armor. He toppled over backward, his weapon blazing madly away as he fell. One of the shots sizzled past Fell's head as he crouched down in the corridor, and he winced away as he slammed a fresh Tabana gas cartridge into his blaster. One more Vigari down, a whole line of the aliens standing ready to take his place. Report! He shouted as he took another waddling step backward, trying to keep his head clear of his allies' fire. We're still good, sir, Grappler called. But all the confidence in the galaxy couldn't hide the fact that the stormtrooper was hurting, and hurting badly. Too many enemies, too much blaster fire, and even the tough composite that made up stormtrooper armor was starting to disintegrate under the assault. Cloud had stopped replying entirely to questions and orders, though he was still on his feet, still firing, and still retreating in an orderly fashion. Grappler, Fell suspected, wasn't in much better shape. Fell and Drask were still largely unscathed, crouched down as they were in order to give the stormtroopers a clear field of fire. But that couldn't last, either, and unarmored as they were, a single well-placed shot could easily put either of them out of action. It would have been nice if they could have used their grenades. The stormtroopers had a complete set of them along with gas-powered launchers built into their Blastex to speed them on their way. The problem was that an explosion among pipes filled with coolant and other working fluids would probably kill the attackers, the defenders, and half of outbound flight's remaining populace. The blasters were risky enough in here. And on top of all that, the Vigari had finally begun jamming their comm links. The only mystery was why they hadn't gotten around to it earlier. So here they were, trapped in a narrow corridor with enemies on all sides and no way to call for assistance. And as Fell opened fire on the next Vigari in line, it occurred to him that he was probably going to die. It was an odd sensation that. 
The possibility of death was always present in combat, of course, and there had been many times when he'd gazed out his clawcraft's canopy at the enemy's ships rising to meet him and wondered if this would be the time. But in space combat there was always a chance of survival, even if your ship was blown completely out from under you. Here, there would be no such chance. If the Vigari blasters found him, he would be dead. Dead. Where is this second access door? Drask shouted into his ear. Fell glanced around, getting his bearings. Another two or three meters, he said. Same side of the corridor as the last one. Understood. Fell resumed firing, wondering at the Chiss's composure. The exit into the engine room that Fell had so confidently told him about was all the way at the other end of the corridor, too far away for them to reasonably expect to make before the Vigari numerical superiority finally took them down. But the access door into the turbolift lobby itself was only a few meters along the corridor. And so that was where Drask had ordered them to go. The lobby would be full of Vigari, of course. But any place they could reach would likely have that same problem. At least in the lobby they would have a little more room to maneuver. And maybe the Jedi would come in time. Maybe. The medic straightened up, shaking her head. I'm sorry, Ambassador, but that's all I can do. Jinsler nodded silently gazing down at the treatment table. Formby was lying still, his eyes closed, his breathing labored. The medic had mostly gotten the bleeding stopped, though Jinsler could see traces still seeping out through the bandages. But the Chiss had already lost a lot of blood, and there was no way to replace it. At least not now. Not until they could get back to the Chafanva and its medical supplies, or else find a Chiss crewer with the same blood type. Assuming any of the crewers aboard the Chaff Envoy were still alive. What about Bacta? He asked, looking up at the medic again. Is there any available? The medic looked at him in astonishment. You must be joking, she said. Most of the Bacta we had was lost or corrupted in the battle and aftermath. We used up what was left probably twenty years ago. The ambassador isn't joking. A dark voice came from the corner. He's most serious. Jinsler turned around. Counselor Keeley was sitting there, holding a salve bandage to his elbow where he'd somehow scraped it raw during the battle in the meeting room. Ambassador Jinsler is a friend of all. Keeley continued, staring at the deck. Didn't you know? He's a friend to Blue Ones, to Jedi, even to murdering Vigari. Yes, Ambassador Jinsler likes everyone. He lifted a baleful glare to Jinsler. This Blue One is the real reason your Jedi friends are so anxious to get to the Turbolifts, isn't it? He demanded, nodding at the table. So that you can get him to his ship to be patched up. Once that happens... You'll all just fly away and leave us here to die. That's not true, Jinsler said, keeping his voice steady. He'd had doubts about Keeley's mental stability even before the Vigari had unleashed their wolf kills on him and the rest of the council. Now he was even less sure about it. There are also people aboard the Chiss ship who can get rid of the line creepers the Vigari are leaving behind. The faster we get them down here, the sooner we can restore your ship to full power. Keeley snorted. Oh, yes. It sounds so reasonable. Abruptly, he stood up. But then, your entire profession is based around your ability to lie to people, isn't it? Sit down, Keeley. Jinsler looked over at the room's waiting area, where Yolier and Tarkosa had been talking together in low tones. The conversation had ceased, and both men were gazing at Keeley, their expressions unreadable. Sit down, Yulia repeated. Better yet, go back to your rooms. But he's a liar, Chaz, 
Keeley insisted. By definition, that means he's been lying to us. Very possibly, Yulia agreed coldly. But you will still sit down. For a moment, the two men locked gazes. Then, with a noisy huff, Keeley dropped back into his chair. Liar, he muttered, turning his gaze back to the deck. The medic looked back at Jinsler, and he thought he could detect a hint of fresh strain in her face. I'm going to run a sample of his blood, she told him. It might be possible to synthesize at least some of the basic plasma for him. It wouldn't be whole blood, but it would be better than nothing. It would certainly help, Jinsler acknowledged. Thank you. The medic gave him a flicker of a smile and walked away. Fisa moved into the spot by the table where the woman had been standing, her face etched with worry as she gazed down at Formby. He'll make it, Jinsler assured her, knowing even as he said it that it was probably a lie. Maybe Keeley was right about him. He's strong, and they've got the bleeding stopped. He'll make it. I know, Fisa said, and Jinsler could hear in her voice that she knew she was speaking a lie, too. It's just. He's a relative of yours, isn't he? Jinsler asked, searching for something less painful to talk about. You know, I don't think I ever heard how Chis families are set up. Especially those who make up the ruling families. She looked at him blankly. The nine ruling families are like any other families, she said. Blood and merit create siblings and cousins and ranking distance. Some are released, others are rematched, others are born to trial. The same as any other family. She lowered her eyes to form by again. This wasn't supposed to happen. None of this was supposed to happen. On the table, Formby's eyes fluttered partway open. Fisa, he murmured. No more. What do you mean? Jinsler said, frowning. No more what? Fisa turned her face away. Nothing, she said, her voice suddenly sounding oddly muffled. The back of Jinsler's neck began to tingle. Fisa? He prompted. Fisa, what's going on? Peace, Ambassador, Formby murmured. I will tell you everything later. But not now. His head turned slightly to the side, toward where Keeley was still staring at the deck, muttering to himself. Jinsler felt his breath catch in his throat, a part of that conversation behind their wolfkill barrier flashing suddenly to mind. You genuinely didn't know who they were? Yulier had asked. Of course not, Jinsler had replied, angry and frightened and indignant. You think we would have let them aboard outbound flight if we had? Some of you might have, Yulier had countered. Possibly the heirs of those who tried to destroy outbound flight in the first place. And then, suddenly, Fisa had broken in and changed the subject. You really didn't know who they were? You really didn't know who they were? Yes, Aristocra, he said quietly, feeling cold all over. Later we'll do fine. There! Drass's voice shouted in Fell's ear. There! Fell glanced to his right in mild surprise. Preoccupied with defense, he hadn't even noticed that they'd reached the access door. He fired two more quick shots down the service corridor, then risked another sideways glance to locate the release control. There it was, half a meter above his head. Grappler! He shouted. Stun grenade! Shack! The stormtrooper muttered back, his voice strained. The ikery word for ready, Fell recalled uneasily. Apparently, Grappler was too far gone to even be able to translate into basic. Fell could only hope he was alert enough to remember to arm the stun grenade before he threw it. Ready, 
He lunged up and slapped the release. Go! The door creaked slightly as it began to slide open. Fell got a glimpse through the opening of armored Vigari turning their weapons toward the noise, and then Grappler lobbed the grenade through the opening. Fell hit the release again, reversing the door's direction. There were sounds of sudden consternation outside as the panel slid closed. And then the whole service corridor bulkhead seemed to bow inward toward them as the grenade went off. Now! Fell shouted, hitting the release again as he switched his blaster to rapid fire and emptied it into the Vigari at the other end of the corridor. The door slid open again, all the way this time, and he dived sideways through it. He landed on the deck of the turbolift lobby between two groggy Vigari who lay twitching where the force of the concussion had thrown them. Scrambling to his feet, ignoring the protest of cramping leg muscles, he turned and helped pull Drass through the opening. What was that? The Chiss asked, taking a stumbling step over the nearest Vigari. Concussion grenade, Fell said, looking around as he slid his last Tabana cartridge into his blaster. Knocks everyone flat for a couple of minutes. And then allows them to awaken? Drass demanded as Grappler staggered through the opening. Fell grabbed the stormtrooper's arm to steady him, grimacing at the dozens of pits and scorch marks discoloring his armor. What sort of weapon is that for a warrior? The sword a warrior uses when he doesn't know whether or not the enemy has hostages. Fell snapped. Cloud seemed to be having trouble with the door. Reaching in, Fell grabbed his arm and pulled him bodily through. Come on, we need to get out of here. But it was too late. Even as he turned Cloud toward the turbolift doors and the corridor leading out of the lobby, he saw that the Vigari in that direction were starting to stagger to their feet, their weapons tracking unsteadily toward the intruders. At the speed Cloud and Grappler were probably capable of, the enemy would be back to full strength long before they could run that gauntlet. The same went for the corridor leading aft and the cross corridor leading port side. Which basically left only the option of standing here and taking out as many Vigari as they could before they were killed. Listen! Drask murmured urgently. I hear a turbo lift car approaching. Fell grimaced as he caught the telltale sound too. Approaching full of enemies, no doubt, but he didn't have anything better to offer. If they could clear the car before those inside knew what was happening, they would at least have bought themselves a little cover. In fact, if the Vigari in the lobby stayed groggy long enough, they might even have a chance of using the car to get away. Go, he told Drask, giving a tug on Cloud's arm to get him moving. They picked their way through the maze of stunned Vigari, the stormtroopers stumbling drunkenly, fell doing his best to help and hurry them along. Drask, unencumbered with injured comrades, made the trip considerably faster and was standing ready at the door when it slid open. He swung around the edge to lean into the car, his charic spitting blue fire as he laid down a killing pattern. The pattern broke off almost before it started. Empty, he called, swinging back around again to cover the Vigari still getting to their feet. A shot blistered past his head. Shifting his aim, he fired once to silence the gunner. Hurry! The Chiss had shot three more Vigari, and the room was starting to fill with blaster bolts by the time Fell and the stormtroopers stumbled through the open door. We're in, Fell shouted as he guided his charges to the rear of the car. The enemy fire was still highly random, but the Vigari would be getting both their balance and their aim back any minute. Hit the control, there. Storage core? Drask asked, still firing as he ducked inside. Yes, Fell said. Whatever reinforcements Bearish had would undoubtedly be up on D4, and Fell had no interest in taking them on just now. Come on, hit it. Drask did so. Nothing happened. Drask hit it again 
and again, then tried the switch to d4. Still nothing. What's wrong? Feld demanded, hurrying to his side. It does not function, Drask snarled. The Vigari have locked it down. A burst of enemy fire splattered off the edge of the door. Come on, Fell said, grabbing Drask's arm and dragging him to the back of the car. So that was it. The enemy had anticipated their final move, and they were now well and truly trapped. Fell had failed his men, failed Admiral Park, failed Aristocra Formby and the rest of the Chiss. But if the Vigari expected them to die quietly, they were in for a rude shock. Cloud and Grappler had sunk to the floor, semi-conscious, their Blostex hanging loosely from their hands. Fell grabbed Cloud's weapon, checked the power indicator, and swung it around to point at the door. Outside, he could see the Vigari starting to move purposefully around, fully in control now and probably setting up their pattern for a rush on the car. Leveling the Blostek toward the opening, Fell braced himself. And with a sudden shattering of metal and plastic, the front part of the car's ceiling exploded inward. Instinctively, Fell twisted his head away, squeezing his eyes shut against the flying debris. The roar of the blast faded and he turned back, blinking open his eyes. At the front of the car, barely visible through the roiling dust, stood a pair of Imperial stormtroopers. Watchman and Shadow had arrived. There were, Fell had estimated, about thirty Vigari in the turbolift lobby. They never had a chance. The two stormtroopers stood shoulder to shoulder in the doorway, fresh and uninjured, taking the enemy's attack unflinchingly as they systematically raked the lobby with blaster fire. Fell sank down onto the floor beside Cloud and Grappler, the Blostek falling loose in his hands as he listened to the firefight, the combat tension finally beginning to drain out of him. And as it did, he slowly became aware of pain digging into his body from a dozen different places on arms, legs, and torso. Apparently, he wasn't as uninjured as he thought. By the time the battle was over, he needed Drask's help to even stand up. The two Vigari fired another burst, their blaster bolts scattering from Luke's lightsaber blade. He pressed forward grimly, letting the force manipulate his defense, shortening the gap between him and the attackers. In the distance, the sounds of multiple blaster fire from a minute earlier had gone ominously quiet. Wrapped in the tunnel vision of combat, he couldn't tell what the outcome had been but it was beginning to look as if he and Mara were already too late to be of any help there. The Vigari intensified their fire. Setting his teeth, he struggled to keep up with the attack. And suddenly, the screaming of their weapons was joined by blaster fire of a more modern pitch and rhythm. For a handful of seconds the two sounds played a deadly duet, and then all weapons fell abruptly silent. Luke. Mara? Luke let his lightsaber slow to a halt in ready position, his lungs heaving as he relaxed his tight focus and began opening up his mind again. The voice and the sense accompanying it had been very familiar. We're here, Fell, Mara called out as she and Evelyn came up behind him. Come on, Luke, they're hurt. Luke blinked sweat out of his eyes as he closed down his lightsaber and joined the other two hurrying down the corridor. He could sense the pain now, waves of it, sweeping toward him. The two groups met around the next jog in the corridor, beside the bodies of the three Vigari Luke had been slowly pushing back. He's the last of them? One of the stormtroopers asked, gesturing at them with his blast tech. As far as I know, yes, Luke said, eyeing him and the others with concern and a bit of awe. All four stormtroopers had been through the wars, all right, with blaster burns scattered and clustered all across their once sleek armor. On two of them, the white color of their breastplates had been almost completely obliterated, with at least a dozen spots on each where the armor had been burned clean through. 
It was hard to believe they were even alive, let alone more or less on their feet. Fell didn't look to be in terrific shape, either, and though he seemed to be walking on his own Luke could see that Drask was standing ready to offer him a helping hand. I see you've been busy, he said. The words sounded rather bland, but somehow seemed to fit the casual dignity and bravery he could sense from all six of the group. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to you faster. We managed, Fell said, his voice rigid with the strain of someone fighting back pain and determined not to show it. Afraid we left a mess by the turbo lifts that someone's going to have to clean up. Don't worry about it, Luke assured him. What about Bersh? Did you see him? I didn't know, Fell said, glancing around at the others. There was a general murmur of agreement. He must have made it to D4 before we were able to deal with their rear guard. Rear guard? Mara asked. You saying there are still more of them up there? Definitely, one of the stormtroopers said. We could hear them working in the turbo lift pylon while we were bringing the car in. I don't suppose you got a head count, Luke said. The stormtrooper shook his head. We were too busy getting the car moving and laying out the flash pace to give them much attention. I have done a rough calculation, however, Drask said. From the size of the three inaccessible rooms aboard the Vigari vessel, I estimate Bersh could have brought as many as 300 troops with him. Luke whistled. 300? They must have been stacked like data cards in there. With their hibernation technology, that would be entirely possible, Drask agreed. What were they doing in the pylon? Evelyn asked. They all looked at her. What? Fell asked. You said they were working in the turbolift pylon, the girl reminded them. You said you didn't count them, but didn't you at least look to see what they were doing? The two slightly less injured stormtroopers looked at each other. Not really, one of them confessed. We could see the lights, and they were definitely working on the tube and not on any of the cars. But that was all we got. We had more pressing things to think about at the time, the other stormtrooper added. Well, let's think about it now, Luke said. What could Bersh be up to? Maybe there's a quick way to find out, Mara said, stooping beside one of the Vigari bodies and pulling off his helmet. Let's ask him. She glanced over the controls, then keyed on the built-in comlink. Hello, Bersh. She called toward the voice pickup. This is Mara Jade Skywalker. How's it going up there? There was a long pause. Bersh? She called again. Come on, Vigari, look alive. I'm sorry, but General Bersh is unavailable at this time. A voice replied, sounding distant and oddly hollow as it came from the helmet's headphones. So you still live, Jedi? Luke grimaced. General Bersh, no less. That's right, Astash, Mara said. We still live, you're up and around again. It's just a glorious day for us all. Not for all, Jedi, Estash said, an edge of malicious pleasure in his voice. But for the Vagari, this is indeed a day of satisfaction. Where precisely are you? We're standing around on a Vagari free dreadnought, Mara told him. You want something more precise? No need. Estash said. I see you now, there in the corridor beside the number two turbo laser coolant room. Luke glanced at the marker beside the nearest door in mild surprise. Apparently, the Vigari had very precise locators built into their troops' helmets. What do you mean, Vigari free? Estash went on. Oh, didn't you know? Mara said. Your rear guard's dead. All of them. Really, Estash said. 
Interesting. You Jedi are more effective warriors than we realized. Our mistake. A mistake others paid for, Mara pointed out. But I suppose that's typical. I don't suppose you're brave enough to come down here and take any of the risks yourself? Estash chuckled melodiously. Thank you for your invitation, but no. The Supreme Commander never takes the same risks as the common soldiers. I have my duty, and they have theirs. Supreme Commander, you say, Mara said. I'm impressed. Speaking of duty, you surely didn't sacrifice 40-odd troops just to kill off a couple of hundred humans and a few chis, did you? Of course not, Estash said. Tell me, is Master Skywalker there with you? Luke hesitated, sensing the trap lying beneath the question. Estash was willing to talk, but only if he knew he didn't have a Jedi running loose and unaccounted for. On the other hand, if Luke confirmed he was here listening, his own freedom of movement would be severely limited, at least for the length of the conversation. With Fell and the stormtroopers largely out of commission, it would be a bad idea to let the Vigari pin both him and Mara down to this one particular spot. Mara, he could sense, had come to the same conclusion. Fortunately, she'd also come up with the answer. Smiling wickedly at Luke, she pulled out the calm link presser had given her and lifted her eyebrows. He nodded understanding, taking a rapid couple of steps aft down the corridor as he pulled the matching device from his own belt. Clicking hers on, Mara held it near the helmet's voice pickup and nodded. Yes, I'm here, Estash, Luke said into his comm link. What do you want? Nothing in particular, Estash said offhandedly, his voice coming more faintly now from the comm link as Luke continued down the corridor toward the aft turbo lift lobby. It was time, he decided, to see what exactly was going on up there. I merely didn't want to have to repeat all of this for you later. You're right. We did indeed come here for revenge. But certainly not for the few ragged handfuls of humans who will soon be dying alongside you. No, our revenge will be against the entire Chiss race. The colonists, Luke saw, were beginning to emerge now from the various nooks and crannies they'd been hiding in. Most of them shied back again at their first sight of him. Nice to have goals in life, Mara commented but I find it hard to believe there's anything aboard outbound flight that's going to help you take down the Chiss Ascendancy. Or are the Vigari in the habit of using high-flying words that don't really mean anything? Mock me all you wish, Jedi, Estash snarled. But I am up here, and you are down there. Luke had reached the turbo lift lobby now. There was a single car waiting there behind the piles of Vigari bodies a car with an oddly shaped hole blown in the front part of the roof. He stepped inside and turned back toward the control panel. It was only then that he saw that Evelyn had followed him. He blinked at her in surprise, cutting off his comlink's voice pickup. What are you doing here? He demanded. I want to help, she said. What can I do? His first instinct was to tell her to get back to Mara where she'd be safe. The only way he was going to be able to find out what the Vigari were up to would be to go up to D4 and take a look for himself. If they'd left a reception committee watching that approach, it could get messy. But there was something about the expression on the girl's face that was stirring old memories. And up there is about as far as you're going to get. Mara's voice scoffed over the comm link the tone carefully designed to draw Astash out still further. Or had you forgotten we're in the middle of the Chiss Redoubt? I want to go with you, Evelyn said. Please? Luke smiled as the memory clicked. I want to go with you. He could still remember his eagerness and frustration as he'd said those same words to Ben Kenobi, way back on the first Death Star. But Ben had refused him 
going alone to shut down the tractor beam that was preventing the Millennium Falcon from escaping, and thereby going to his death. Would things have been different if he'd allowed Luke to go along? Of course they would. Leia might never have been found and rescued, for one thing. Han certainly wouldn't have gone out on a limb for her back then, at least not alone. Still, there had been many times over the years when he'd lain awake in the dark hours of the night, visualizing how he and Ben together might have been able to defeat, or at least neutralize Vader, then go on to free Leia from her cell, then take our 2 d 2 and the precious Death Star data to Yavin 4. Ah, uh, so there are things even the great Jedi don't know, Estash scoffed back. Perhaps it was merely your basic combat skills I underestimated. There was really no question as to what the logical, practical decision should be. Evelyn would be at risk up there, as well as being a possibly crucial distraction for Luke himself. And yet, despite all the logic, his instincts were whispering the exact opposite. Trust your instincts, Luke. Get ready to stop the turbo lift, he told her. Bending his knees, stretching to the force for strength, he jumped through the ragged opening up onto the car's roof. The reason for the odd shape of the hole became clear the instant he saw the multicolored wires crisscrossing the roof. Like the forward turbo lifts, this one had been wired as a trap. The stormtroopers who had made the hole had rearranged and extended some of the lines, then shaped their explosive ribbon to avoid damaging the rest of them. And if I tell you to get out of here, you immediately take the car back down and get Mara and the Imperials, without question or argument. Understood? Evelyn nodded. Stretching to the force again, Luke reached down through the opening and keyed the switch. The car began to lumber its way toward D4, downward, from where Luke was currently sitting. Pulling out his glow rod, he adjusted it to tight beam and waited. That's a little unfair, Estash. Fell's voice came from the comlink. Even Jedi can't be expected to know everything. That's why they have allies like us. You see, we know all about the recorder you tapped into the navigational repeater lines. Luke frowned at the comlink. A recorder in the navigational lines that fell in the 501st had known about. And that they hadn't mentioned to anyone else? Ah, uh, so that's what the diversion with the line creepers was all about, Mara said. Even at this distance, Luke could sense her own surprise and annoyance that fell hadn't let them in on the secret but nothing but interested professionalism was coming out in her voice. You knew you might be leaving this party early, so you made sure you'd have a recording of the route back to the Brask Auto Command Station. And your little chat with Jinsler in the forward observation lounge was because he happened to be too close to the action? Yes, Estash said, sounding grudgingly impressed that she'd caught on so quickly. If he'd left at the wrong moment he would have seen Perch installing the device. Master Skywalker, are you still there? Luke clicked the calm link voice pickup back on. Still here, Estash, he assured the other. But even that recording isn't going to get you all the way out of the redoubt, you know. We were half an hour into the flight before you got it tied in. That last part will be easy enough, Estash said offhandedly. Leaving the edge of a star cluster is not nearly as difficult as navigating one's way inside. The turbolift car had hit the main gravity eddy field now and was rotating around in the darkness. A moment later it finished its turn, leaving Luke with a clear line of sight all the way to the curve where the pylon entered the underside of D4. He frowned. Even though he couldn't see the far end of the tube, he ought to be able to hear the sounds of any activity going on around the curve. But all was silence. Whatever the Vigari had been doing, they were apparently finished. That was probably a bad sign. Flicking on his glow rod, he shined it upward. And caught his breath. 
There, packed around the tube a few meters out from the curve, he could see a solid ring of flat gray boxes. Boxes like the ones he and Mara had run into on their initial trip through D4. Boxes Mara had identified as being full of explosives. The Vigari had mined the pylon. Chapter 22 Luke gazed upward, feeling his throat tighten. There was undoubtedly an orderly and systematic method for detaching Dreadnought 4 from the rest of outbound flight. Clearly, the Vigari weren't interested in finding out what that procedure was. The car was approaching the ring now. One thing that puzzles me, Astash, Luke said into his calm link, holding his free hand horizontally over the hole in the ceiling where Evelyn could see it. You couldn't have known any of the dreadnoughts would even be in one piece when we set off on this trip, let alone ready to fly. And you certainly didn't need all these troops just to track the chaff envoy's path into the redoubt. The car reached the explosives, and he jabbed at the air with his finger. Evelyn was ready, and the car settled tentatively to a midair halt. That's right, Mara said. Luke could sense her concern as she picked up on his sudden tension, but again all of it was carefully filtered out of her voice. So what was the original plan? Just out of curiosity, of course. You humans are strange creatures, Estash said, his melodious voice starting to pick up an edge of suspicion. Here you are, about to die, and yet instead of struggling to postpone your fate, you sit quietly and ask about things that cannot possibly help you. Slowly, Luke ran the light from his glow rod along the explosives. The detonator wiring seemed straightforward enough, the kind of arrangement he'd seen demolitions techs use during the rebellion. In theory, he should be able to simply pull it out of all the packages within reach. The problem was that the detonator box itself was a quarter of the way around the tube from him. There is no emotion, there is peace. Taking a careful breath, Luke tried to think. He could, of course, easily use the force to maneuver his lightsaber over to the box and cut it away from the boxes of explosives. But the Vigari might have wired it with a collapsing release to prevent any last-minute tampering. If it was rigged that way, cutting it free would instantly trigger a detonation. In addition, there was something else pressed up against the metal beneath the boxes, something he could see but couldn't get to without disassembling everything on top of it. Unknowns were always to be considered dangerous, especially in explosives work. The thing is, you see, we Jedi don't die nearly as easily as you might like, Mara told Astash calmly. There's a good chance we'll be seeing you again, and the more we know about you, the easier it'll be for us to peel your epaulets back for good when we do. Still, Luke decided, unknowns or not, if he could get over to the box he stood a good chance of figuring out how to disarm it. The problem was that the turbolift pylon was perfectly smooth, with no protrusions anywhere nearby that would hold his weight. The cluster of buried cables he and Mara had used for their climb up the forward pylon weren't situated close enough to the box, either. He probably could have rigged up something out of liquid cable, but he'd used up most of his supply when he and Mara had sealed off the edges of that first turbo lift car. But if his particular car was too far away, one of the other cars in the cluster should be positioned to pass right next to it. All he and Evelyn had to do was continue up to D4, where the Vigari had presumably locked the rest of the cars, transferred to the correct one, and ride it back down again. He wouldn't even have to expose them to enemy fire by going into the lobby. He could use his lightsaber to cut through the sides of the cars until they reached the one they needed. He looked down into the car and gestured upward. Evelyn nodded and touched the switch, and the car began to rise again. They lifted past the explosives around the curve. How very confident of you, Estash said, his voice suddenly silky smooth. My only regret is that I will not actually witness your deaths. Farewell, Jedi. There was a click from Luke's calm link as the Vigari broke the connection. 
and suddenly, below him, the turbolift pylon erupted in an eerie, flickering greenish-blue light and the sound of metallic hissing. Luke! Mara called over the comm link. What's going on? I think they're about to blow the pylons, Luke said grimly, gesturing Evelyn to stop the car. The other five cars of the cluster were visible now directly above him, along with the gap the car they were riding would normally slip into. You know any type of detonator that hisses and gives off blue-green light? Sounds like a scorched stick, Mara said. It's an acid-based, high-temperature paste used to burn a score mark and something to help the explosives crack it more cleanly. How long until it burns around a pylon this size? Half a minute, Mara said. Maybe a little more. If you're anywhere near it, get out now. Luke listened to his heart thudding in his throat as he weighed his options. If he could just get to the detonator before the scorched stick finished its burn. But no. Not in half a minute. Certainly not with Evelyn along to slow him down. He shouldn't have brought her with him. For the first time in a long time, his instincts had played him false. But this wasn't the time for questions or recriminations. Right, he said, jabbing downward. We're on our way. Evelyn didn't need to be told twice. She hit the switch, and the car headed down again. On sudden impulse, Luke snatched his lightsaber from his belt and ignited it. If the Vigari were going to get away, at least they weren't going to get away clean. Using the force to hold down the switch, he hurled the weapon upward toward the gap in the cluster of cars. It hit the upper part of the turbolift lobby, and he had just enough time to see the wobbling blade carve out a large hole in the metal before the curve in the tube blocked it from his sight. The car dropped past the ring of explosives. And with a jolt, he saw that Mara had overestimated how much time they would have. The scorched section already extended over more than half the circle, with the flickering fire seeming to pick up speed as it worked its way around toward the detonator. They had maybe five more seconds before it finished. On the floor, Luke shouted to Evelyn, jumping in through the hole in the roof. The car wouldn't be nearly enough protection from the explosive power about to be unleashed, he knew, but it was all they had. Come on, get on the floor he repeated. But to his surprise, Evelyn ignored him, remaining by the control panel as she punched keys on a command stick she'd plugged into the droid socket. He reached out a hand for her, wondering if she didn't understand or if she'd simply frozen in fear. But even as his hand closed on her arm, he caught the sense of desperate determination in the girl. As he started to pull her down, she touched one last key on the command stick and Luke found the two of them abruptly floating in midair as the floor dropped out from under them. The car hit the main gravity eddy and began its turn, blocking his view of the explosives and the fiery blue-green glow. An instant later, the pylon blew up. The car floor seemed to leap up at him, slamming hard into his face and body, the impact knocking most of the air out of his lungs. He was still holding Evelyn's arm, reflexively, he pulled her close beside him as the shock wave from the explosion washed over them. He was still holding her that way, ears ringing from the shock wave, when the car's side wall disintegrated. He gasped as the pieces slammed into him, some of them hitting like clubs, others digging into his back and arms and legs like knife blades. Beside him he heard Evelyn cry out and let the force flow into her, trying to suppress some of her pain. The rain of shrapnel stopped, the buffeting faded away, and Luke risked a look upward through what was left of the ceiling. The lower curve in the pylon was visible above them, with the safety of D5's turbolift lobby just beyond it. Shakily but steadily, the car continued upward. It was then he suddenly noticed that he couldn't breathe. He expanded his chest, trying to fill his lungs. But there was nothing there. With the car shredded and the far end of the tube blown open, 
he and Evelyn had only the planetoid's thin atmosphere available to them. Steady, Luke told himself sternly, forcing himself to relax. His body's cells contained enough oxygen for at least another half minute, he knew, and Jedi techniques could stretch it to triple that time. He shifted his hand to the back of Evelyn's neck, trying to let his own trust in the Force ease into her and slow her breathing. A few seconds later, the car settled into its place in the turbolift lobby. The door remained closed. Luke set his teeth, glaring up at it. But of course it wouldn't open on its own, not with a near vacuum on one side. It would have to be pried past its safety interlocks. Stretching out to the force, he got a grip on the panel and pulled. The door quivered once, but remained closed. Luke tried again, trying to gather more strength. But between the effects of the concussive blast, the pain from the shrapnel still throbbing through his body, and the oxygen deprivation, he couldn't focus the necessary power. His vision was starting to go hazy. Another few seconds and he would sink into unconsciousness. He stretched out one final time. And with a thud that shook the whole car, the door slammed open. Luke opened his eyes, squinting through the rush of air blowing suddenly in his face. Mara, her eyes blazing with fear, concern, and yes, anger at him, grabbed his arms and pulled him through the door. Presser was right beside her, lifting his knees through to safety. The door slammed shut as Mara released her grip on it. Hi, sweetheart, Luke said, managing a smile. I'm home. She shook her head. Skywalker. I know, Luke said. Still smiling, he let the darkness take him. The medical bay recovery room door slid open, and Mara stepped inside. How are they? Jinsler asked, looking up from his chair by the side wall. I heard one of the medics say they were in pretty bad shape. It looked worse than it really was. Mara assured him. Jinsler's face looked calm enough, she noted, but his hands in his lap were opening and closing restlessly. Most of Evelyn's injuries were superficial and should heal pretty quickly. She went on. Luke had some deeper cuts, but they caught it all before he lost too much blood. He's gone into a Jedi healing trance while they finish patching him up. Fell grunted. Must be a nice thing to be able to do. It can be handy, Mara agreed, looking around the room. They were, she decided, about as sorry a lot as she'd seen in a long time. Formby was lying on one of the recovery tables, his eyes only occasionally fluttering open, his breathing deep and slow. Beside him on opposite sides of the table sat Drask and Fisa, the former looking drained above his own collection of bandages, the latter merely looking exhausted and apprehensive. Fell and the stormtroopers had gathered together in a back corner beside stacks of their mangled armor and were working their way through their own list of injuries. The alien stormtrooper, Sumil, she noted with interest, had pale orange blood. So, Mara went on, raising her voice a little. As long as we seem to have some time on our hands, why don't we all have a nice long talk together? She looked at Fel. You can start, Commander. Did I hear you say earlier that you caught the Vigari wiring a recorder into the Chaff Envoy's navigational lines? We didn't actually catch them in the act, Fel said. Sumil found the recorder after it had already been planted. I stand corrected. Mara said. So why didn't you say anything to anyone? To be perfectly honest, because we didn't know whom it was safe to tell, Fell said evenly. We didn't know whether Barish had put it there, or General Drask, or Aristocra Formby, Ambassador Jinsler. He looked Mara straight in the eye. Or you? I see, Mara said, accepting his gaze and sending it straight back at him. All right, then, let's try this one. You told us once that you didn't know why Park had sent you on this mission. 
you lied. Then you changed your story and said you'd been sent to protect us. I think you lied that time, too. You want to take one more stab at it? Fell's lip twitched. Admiral Park told us the mission would be going into great danger. We were sent to give added protection to Aristocra Formby. And that was all we were told, he added firmly. We didn't even know what direction the danger was going to be coming from, he grimaced. If we had, I guarantee Bersh and his friends would be locked up in binders right now. Yes, Mara murmured, stretching out with the force. It did indeed seem to be the truth this time. Or at least, the truth as Fel knew it, which might not be the same thing. I suppose this clears up the mystery of your missing operational manual, too. Fel nodded. Apparently the Vigari wanted to know everything they could about outbound flight before we arrived. Right, Mara agreed. All of which brings up an even more interesting point. She turned to face the three Chiss. As I think about it, Aristocra Formby, you asked for an amazing amount of muscle to accompany you on this trip. First you called Park and asked for Luke and me, only the message got waylaid. Then, when it looked like we weren't going to show, you called him back and got him to send a unit of the best stormtroopers he had available. And it was indeed fortunate all of you were here, Drask said, nodding his head gravely. We owe you our lives. Yes, you do, Mara agreed. But here's the question. How exactly did you know you were going to need all this help? I do not understand what you are asking, Drask said evenly. But there was a new tightness at the corners of his eyes. You were invited to take possession of outbound flight. That is all. Mara shook her head. Sorry, General, but that won't fly. After that incident with the Lion Creepers, the Aristocra gave us specific orders not to use our lightsabers aboard the ship. Even when we couldn't get into the Dreadnought's docking bay, either of you asked us to just cut it open, which we could have done in a fraction of the time it took the techs with their torches. Yes, Jinsler put in, sounding suddenly thoughtful. I remember thinking about that myself at the time, wondering if it was some form of stiff-necked chis pride. That was what I thought too, Mara said, smiling tightly. In fact, I thought it right up to the minute Bersh told me to die and casually sent his wolf kills charging at me, and I cut them in half. Jinsler inhaled sharply. Your lightsaber he said in sudden understanding. He'd never seen a lightsaber. That's right, he hadn't, Mara agreed. Because Formby made very sure they never saw us in action. That, plus our Jedi abilities in general, which they also never really saw, gave us an edge they were completely unprepared for. She looked back at the three Chiss. So again, how did you know we need that edge? I do not appreciate the tone of your words, Drask said stiffly. You may not make such unsupported accusations against a senior member of the fifth ruling family. Fisa, Jinsler murmured suddenly. Mara looked at him. What? Fisa, Jinsler repeated, nodding as if an odd puzzle piece had suddenly fallen into place. In the turbo lift, right after Presser sprang his trap, she was frightened far more than seemed reasonable. It was because we were all alone in there with Bersh and another Vigari, wasn't it? Fisa didn't answer. I see, Mara said, eyeing formed by closely. So I was wrong. It wasn't the Aristocra running this scam at all. It was Fisa. The Aristocra's closed eyelids twitched. And since she's obviously too young to be a senior member of a ruling family or anything else, Mara went on, I guess it's perfectly all right for me to make such accusations against. Enough, Formby said quietly. Please, Aristocra Chafo Arembentrano, Fisa said, an edge of urgency in her voice. It's all right. 
I'm not afraid to admit my part in this. Your loyalty honors me, second niece, Formby said, reaching over to touch her hand. But it was my plan and my decision. I cannot and will not allow others to take the responsibility for my actions. He turned his head slightly. Jedi Skywalker, approach where I may see you and ask what you will. Mara stepped up beside Visa. You knew they were Vigari, didn't you? She said, determined not to let his drawn face or the oozing blood on his arm influence her. You knew it right from the start. Formby nodded. Yes. But you told me you'd never seen one before. Jinsler objected. That was true, Formby acknowledged. But I had received a detailed description from one who had seen them. He smiled at Jinsler. You, of all of us, should understand. Mara stared at Formby as it suddenly hit her. You mean, Cardas? Again, the Aristocrat nodded. He and I spoke briefly when he brought the ambassador to the Chaff Anvo, he said. When the Vigari then appeared, I knew it was indeed them. Cardas gets around more than I'd realized, Mara commented. Is he also the one who clued the Vigari in on this in the first place? When I sent the message to Admiral Park requesting Master Skywalker's presence, I made sure the transmission had enough edge leakage to be intercepted in the regions where we suspected the Vigari were gathering their strength. And even knowing who they were, you let them aboard your ship? Jinsla demanded, sounding more surprised than angry. Formby closed his eyes again. The Vigari are a violent people, Ambassador, he said wearily. They have killed many, enslaved many others, and driven all who know them to terror and despair. Worse, they may already have made alliances with powers even more dangerous than they are. If Bersh succeeds in escaping with even a partial route into the redoubt, I have no doubt that knowledge will be used against us to terrible advantage. So the Vigari need to be slapped down hard, Mara said, frowning. So what's the problem? Formby smiled wanly. The problem is Chiss military doctrine, Jedi Skywalker, he said. Specifically, the decree that no potential adversaries may be attacked until and unless they first act against Chiss interests within Chiss space. Mara stared at him. You wanted them to make a move against you, she said, not quite sure she believed it. You invited them aboard one of your ships and into your most critical military base, hoping they'd pull this exact stunt. Drask snorted. This exact stunt? That had better not be the case. Of course I didn't expect what actually occurred, Formby assured him. My expectation was that the five Vigari we permitted aboard would attempt to take control of the Chaff Envoy at some point after we reached outbound flight. That would have been sufficient provocation for us to act. Especially when you add in the slaughter of a few unarmed crewers? Fell put in. Loss of life was neither necessary nor expected. Formed by insisted, some heat seeping through the fatigue into his voice. My ship had been specially prepared for this mission. All crewers had been provided with hidden areas near their duty stations where they could protect themselves from attack as they watched for the Vigari to betray themselves. With a squad of warriors in the dreadnought docking bay, I also expected there to be ample warning if Bersh and the others attempted to return to the vessel. We expected to merely catch them in the act of attempted theft or sabotage, which would have satisfied the rules of engagement. He closed his eyes. I did not expect such a massive attack to come from the other direction, he said, the heat fading away. The warriors whom I stationed in the dreadnought are certainly dead. So perhaps are all who we left aboard. Their blood now lies on my hands. 
It's hardly your fault that you didn't know about the Vigari suspended animation trick, Jinsler pointed out. Kardas must have missed that one. He merely met them, Thornby said. He wasn't given a tour of their technical facilities. He'll have to do better next time, Mara said. What about the others? Fisa and General Drask and your other aides? Fisa knew the entire plan, Thornby said. That was why I insisted she come along, so that if anything happened to me she could direct the operation. No one else knew more than you yourself were told. He smiled slightly. Though I believe General Drask was able to deduce much of the truth. Much, but not all, Drask rumbled. It would have been better if you had taken me into your full confidence. If I had, you would have been as guilty as I of manipulating events to bring about this end. Formby shook his head. No. On my hands, and mine alone, must this rest. You can sort all that out when you get home, Mara said. Can we assume the rules of engagement have been satisfied? They have been more than satisfied, Jedi Skywalker, Drask said darkly. We have been attacked without justification or mercy. A state of war now exists between the Chiss Ascendancy and the Vigari. Good, Mara said. I'd hate to have to go through this again just because we'd missed something in the fine print. In that case, there's just one little loose end left. That fallen cable that nearly knocked Luke across the room when we first came aboard the Chaff Anvil. I trust you're not going to try to blame that one on the Vigari? Drass cleared his throat self-consciously. I am afraid I am to blame for that incident, Jedi Skywalker, he confessed. When Aristocra Chafor Embintrano asked Admiral Park who of the New Republic would be the best warriors to have at hand against possible trouble, he recommended you and Master Skywalker. He seemed to have first-hand knowledge of your fighting skill. Formby murmured. Yes, Drask said. However, I did not entirely trust his tales of Jedi abilities. So you arranged a demonstration, Mara said. Did we meet with your approval? Let us simply say that you did not disappoint, Drask smiled slightly. The demonstration arranged today by the Vigari gave you a far better opportunity to prove yourselves. Yes, Mara murmured. I should hope so. Behind her, the door slid open and Evelyn and Rosemary stepped in, press her close behind them. There you are, Mara said. How are you feeling? I'm all right, the girl said, looking around at the others as the door slid shut again. Possibly comparing bandage counts, Mara thought with a brief flicker of amusement. Is Luke all right? She asked. I mean, Master Skywalker? He saved my life, pulling me down and protecting me when the pylon exploded. He's fine, Mara assured her as her mother steered her to one of the other recovery tables. And as far as saving lives goes, I think the two of you come out pretty even on that scoring. What do you mean? Rosemary asked, an odd edge to her voice. Evelyn didn't do anything. She most certainly did, Mara insisted. Evelyn reactivated that turbo lift trap at exactly the right moment to shoot the car down the tube and into the eddy rotation just before the explosives detonated. If she hadn't done that, it would have been the fractured ceiling that took the brunt of the explosion instead of the wall, and a lot more high-speed debris would have gotten through. That kind of prescient timing can only come from the Force. But you won't tell them, will you? Rosemary pleaded. Please? They don't like Jedi here, Mara, Fell said quietly. I don't know exactly why, but they don't. We don't just not like them, Commander, Presser said grimly. If the Council sticks the Jedi label on someone, they get immediately sent over to three. You mean D3? 
Jinsler asked. The number three dreadnought? That's the one, Presser said. The pylons between it and the rest of outbound flight were destroyed or collapsed during the attack and crash, leaving it isolated from everything else. So Yulier and the other survivors set it up as a place where anyone with Jedi traits could be safely banished. I thought that was what the quarantine on D6 was for, Fell said. Presser shook his head. Quarantine is for people they suspect of using the Force, he said. Three is where they get sent once they're pretty sure. Pretty sure, you say? Sumil asked softly, his alien expression very still. In some ways, Mara reflected, he looked even more dangerous without his armor. And how certain exactly is that? Pressa looked away from him. They're completely sure, he said. The managing council is... I can't speak for the rest of us. He looked at Mara. And it's not a death sentence, really, he added with an odd combination of earnestness and embarrassment. The place has been set up with plenty of food and power. A person could live there for a lifetime in reasonable comfort. But in complete isolation, Sumil said darkly, you sentenced these people to a life of loneliness. Presser sighed. We've only done it twice, he said. At least up to now. They're not going to send her there, Jorid, Rosemary said. They can't. She looked suddenly at Mara. You can take her with you, can't you? She asked. You can take her when you leave. The plan was to take all of you with us, Mara told her. Unfortunately, unless we can get out of here and back to the Chaff Anva, either option has much of a future. I spoke to the techs a few minutes ago, Presser said. Most of the blast doors stopped working years ago, and most of the ones that did work have now been locked open by those cursed conduit worms. Unless we can get a few of them working again, we're not going to be able to get either the turbo lift doors or any of the outer hatchways open without losing all our air. He looked at Drask. I take it there's still no word from your own ship? The general shook his head. No, he said. And I no longer believe they will be coming. You think they're all dead? Presser asked. Drask closed his eyes. Including crew members, there were 37 warriors aboard the Chaff Anvo, he said. The Vigari may have had as many as three hundred. He opened his eyes into slender cracks of glowing red. They would not have been prepared for such a devastating assault. Mara felt her stomach tighten. The sudden multiple deaths she and Luke had sensed aboard D1 could have been all the Chiss, or a sizable fraction of them, or just the squad of warriors Drask had left in the D4 docking bay. There hadn't been any way to tell at the time, and there still wasn't. Though if there were surviving Chiss, it might not make any difference. Even if the Vigari hadn't bothered to hunt down and kill everyone aboard, they would certainly have made a point of wrecking the ship on their way out. So in other words, we should assume we're on our own, she concluded. All right. Presser, you said D3 was isolated from the rest of outbound flight. That means you must have vac suits to get back and forth. Any of them still in working condition? A couple dozen of them are, he said. But as I told you, we can't get the hatches open. We don't have to, Mara told him. All you need to do is build a small caisson around one of the turbolift doors with me in it. I can cut through the hull, climb up the pylon, and make my way cross-country to the chaff anvil. And how do you get back in? Drask asked. I'll figure that out later, Mara told him. What do you think? Above them, the lights flickered. Terrific, Presser muttered, glancing up. They must be getting to the generator. 
What, we're running on generator power already? Mara asked. We are in this part of the ship, Presser said. They've already gotten into the main power conduits. Wait a minute, Jinsler said, frowning. You have portable generators? How many? Probably ten that still work, Presser said. The lights flickered again. Better make that nine. I never even thought to ask, Jinsler said, sounding disgusted with himself. Get them together as quickly as you can, all of them, and set them out along the corridors. Connected to what? Presser asked, sounding confused. Connected to anything you want, Jinsler said. Lights, heaters, anything. Just crank them up to full power and then shut down the main reactors. It will not work, Drask declared. Even if the generators succeed in drawing the line creepers out, there are too many of them. They will quickly overload and destroy the generator's wiring, then return to the larger sources of power. That's right, Jinsler said, smiling tightly. If the worms actually get to them, he turned back to Presser. But they won't, because around each generator you're going to create a moat of salt water. The worms will crawl in, short out their organic capacitors, and die. You're kidding, Presser said. I've never even heard of that. Jinsler shrugged. It's a trick we came up with when I was bumming around Hadar sector after the Clone Wars. It's fairly disgusting, but it works. I'll get the text on it right away, Presser said, pulling out his comm link. You've certainly had a very career, Ambassador. Jinsler's answer, if he made one, was lost as a sudden surge of distant emotion yanked at Mara's attention. Something's wrong, she said, pulling her lightsaber from her belt and heading for the door. Presser got there ahead of her, slapping the release and ducking through. It was then that they heard the shouting in the distance ahead. Come on, Presser growled, drawing his blaster as he and Mara sprinted down the corridor. They rounded a turn and nearly collided with a dozen techs and civilians running in the other direction. They're back. One of the techs gasped, jabbing a finger behind him as he dodged around Presser. In the turbo lift. They're trying to break in. Presser swore under his breath, thumbing on his comm link. All peacekeepers to the forward starboard pylon, he ordered. The Vigari are back. This doesn't make sense, Mara objected, trying to stretch out to the force as she ran. But the flavor of the alien minds was too faint to sort out against the clamor of civilian panic throbbing in the air around her. Why would they have come back? Maybe they decided they wanted to watch us die after all, Presser said grimly. If so, they're going to pay heavily for the privilege. One of the other peacekeepers was waiting in the darkness when they arrived at the turbolift lobby, the beam from his glow rod twitching back and forth as he fidgeted with apprehension. They're coming through, he hissed, turning the beam on one of the doors. I can hear them working on it. What do we do? Almost before the words were out of the other's mouth, the door suddenly gave a violent creak and cracked a centimeter open. Three pry bars were in place before it could close again, and with another series of creaks the door was forced open. Presser and the peacekeeper leveled their blasters at the opening, and suddenly two combat-armored figures leapt out of the gloom, their own glow rods swinging back and forth. Behind the lights, Mara could see hand weapons tracking as they searched for targets. No, she snapped, reaching out to the force and twisting all four muzzles to point into opposite corners of the lobby. Don't shoot. They're friends. She stepped into the middle of the standoff as a third armored figure emerged into the room. Welcome to Outbound Flight, Captain Brastal Shibarku, 
she said, bowing slightly to the newcomer. I thought you'd never get here. Chapter 23 We never even heard the Vigari leave, Captain Talshub said disgustedly, his red eyes blazing even more brilliantly in the dim glow of the recovery room perm lights. We were sitting like fools in concealment in the command center, waiting for them to make their move. But they simply exited their own vessel, scattering lion creepers along the way, and left. Apparently they had already decided to take the old Republic vessel and had no time to waste with us. Yes, Bersh would have informed Estash of the new plan by that time, Drask agreed. They had had the foresight to appropriate a set of special operations communicators before traveling to outbound flight and were able to send pulse messages through the humans jamming. I wish I had known, Talship rumbled. We could have deployed to intercept them. It's just as well you didn't, Mara commented from the other side of Formby's recovery table. You saw what happened to the squad we left in the Dreadnought's docking bay. They never even had a chance. Perhaps, Talshib said reluctantly. Warrior's pride, Jinsler thought as he leaned against the wall by the open doorway watching the discussion. Or perhaps just pride in general. Talshib would probably have preferred an overwhelming enemy attack, even if it had meant dying in combat to the situation he currently found himself in. Mara must have sensed that, too. No perhaps about it, Captain, she said firmly. If you hadn't been around to rig that sealant tent across the broken pylon, we'd still be trying to figure out how we were going to get out of here. Talship snorted. Thus permitting you to travel freely from one dead vessel to another. Neither of them will be dead for long. Drask put in firmly. If Ambassador Jinsler's technique works, both vessels should be functional within a matter of days. Talship snorted again. That was probably a good deal of his attitude problem. Jinsler had already decided. The Vigari line creepers had wiped out the chaff envoys' communications with the landing party and otherwise crippled the ship before the crew, lurking in their hidey holes had even realized they were under attack. And then, as if that weren't embarrassment enough, it was human ingenuity that was going to clear out his ship for him. That had to really gall him, and Jinsler was a little surprised that Drask had gone out of his way to mention where the plan had come from. Unless Drask had done it on purpose, a not-so-subtle reminder to his subordinate that even the Chiss could learn from other species on occasion. Certainly the general's politely unfriendly attitude toward humans seemed to have worn perceptively over the past few hours. Jinsler could only wonder what had happened to cause that change. Here comes another one, Evelyn Stage whispered from a few paces down the corridor. No, two of them. No, it's a whole crowd. Jinsler moved away from the wall and the discussion and crossed to her side. In the much brighter light blazing away from a rack above the portable generator, he could see a group of perhaps twenty lion creepers wriggling their way across the deck toward the enticing aroma of electric current. Careful, he warned as Evelyn started toward them. If you get too close your own bioelectrical energy might distract them. Okay, she said, backing up again. Together they watched as the fragile-looking creatures climbed briskly up over the lip of the wide, flat basin the generator's stubby legs were resting in. One by one, they dropped into the salt water, twitched a few times, and went still. That's really cool, she commented. Effective, too, Jinsler agreed absently, most of his attention still back on the snatches of conversation he was able to hear of Formby's war council. Drask and Talship were discussing their options now, with Mara, Formby, and Fell occasionally putting in a comment or suggestion. Luke, still in his Jedi trance, was across the corridor in the operating room where they'd finished patching him up. Unfortunately, none of the options being batted around sounded particularly hopeful, at least not from where he was standing. 
Borrowing extra generators from outbound flight might speed up the decontamination process aboard the Chaff Anver. But even so, the best possible projected completion point was at least three days away. Unless the Vigari had mechanical trouble along the way, the stolen dreadnought would have far too much of a head start for the Chaff Envoy to catch up with it before it reached the Brask Oto Command Station and escaped from the cluster. You'll be leaving soon, won't you? Jinsler shifted his full attention back to Evelyn. We all will, he told her. You, your mother, all of us. I mean as soon as the blue, I mean the Chiss ship is fixed, you and Mara and Luke will be leaving. But we'll be back, Jinsler promised. Or at least some Chiss transports will be. They'll take you anywhere you want to go. She shook her head. It won't make any difference, she said quietly. No matter where we go, Yulia will find some kind of three to put me in. They're not going to do that, Jinsler insisted. Surely they learned a lesson from this whole thing. If it wasn't for you, a good many more people might have died. That won't make any difference, she said again. Not to them, she sighed. I wish you'd never come here. If you hadn't, she trailed off. If we hadn't, what? Jinsler prompted. You would have gone on living a lie? I could have pretended, she said. Lots of people pretend. She looked squarely up into his eyes. Even you do. An edge of guilt dug up under Jinsler's rib cage. That's different, he said. If I hadn't told them I was an ambassador, the Chiss might not have let me come along. But you're here now, she reminded him. You could have stopped pretending a long time ago. Yes, well, we're not talking about me, young lady, he reminded her firmly. We're talking about you. And the point is, you shouldn't be ashamed of what you can do. Maybe not. Presser's voice came from behind them. But that doesn't mean she should announce it from the command deck either. Jinsler turned. Presser and Rosemary were coming down the corridor toward them, Presser with a pile of sacks across one forearm. I brought you a new collection bag, he said, peeling one off the stack and handing it to Evelyn. These are plasticized, so they won't get as soggy. Thanks, she said, taking it and handing him her partially full one in return. I really think you ought to go join the rest of the people down on six, Evelyn, Rosemary said, eyeing her daughter's bandages. Don't you think you'd be more comfortable there? Would you be? Evelyn said pointedly. The corners of Rosemary's mouth tightened. I suppose not, she conceded. Director Yulier's probably been talking to people already. I'm sure he has, Presser said. But I've been thinking, and there may still be a way to backtrack on this. What do you mean? Rosemary asked. Well, think about it, Presser said. Besides the stuff in the turbo lift, which no one else saw, the only thing Evelyn did was pull that comm link across the meeting room deck. We could easily churn the water by saying it was actually Ambassador Jinsler who did that. Except that I'm not a Jedi, Jinsler pointed out. Maybe you lied about that, Presser countered. Or maybe you didn't even know yourself that you had the power. And you are the brother of a known Jedi. Rosemary added thoughtfully. That has to count for something. Maybe your pep talk in the meeting room actually stimulated your powers, not Evelyn's. Are you suggesting I lie for your daughter? Jinsler asked. Rosemary held his gaze without flinching. Why not? She said. It was you and your people who got her into this mess. It's not a mess. Jinsler insisted. It's an opportunity. Beside him, Evelyn stirred. Ambassador Jinsler says I shouldn't be ashamed of who I am. 
Ambassador Jinsler doesn't have to live among these people, Presser retorted, glaring at Jinsler. I do for the moment, Jinsler pointed out ruefully. A moment that could stretch out considerably, I might add. We won't know until the lion creepers have all been cleaned out whether or not they caused any permanent damage. We could conceivably find out that the chaff envoy will never fly again. That could be a problem, all right, Presser grunted. I don't suppose it occurred to you to bring a spare hyper-capable vehicle with you? We brought three, actually, Jinsler said with a grimace. The commander's glider, the transport the Imperials came in, and Luke and Mara's ship. The Vigari hit all three on their way out. Talship says they even took the time to sabotage their own shuttle, and it wasn't even hyper-capable. Presser shook his head. They're thorough, you have to give them that. So how long until the rest of the Chiss come hunting for you? That's just it, Jinsler said. Formby was playing this so close to the table that I'm not sure the rest of the Chiss even know we're out here. There are some aboard the command station we passed on our way into the cluster, of course, but the Vigari might well be planning to destroy that on their way out. If they succeed, it might be months before anyone comes back out this way. That would solve the problem, wouldn't it? Evelyn murmured. They all looked at her. What? Presser asked. That would solve the problem, Evelyn repeated. Because if you stay, they'd have to put Luke and Mara in three if they put me there. And they couldn't do that, could they? I doubt it seriously, Jinsler agreed hesitantly. That hadn't even occurred to him. And then they could teach me how to be a real Jedi, Evelyn continued, looking up at her mother. Then we wouldn't have to be afraid anymore about what they might do to me, because they couldn't. Rosemary reached up to stroke her daughter's hair, an oddly pinched expression on her face. Evelyn. That's what you want, isn't it? Evelyn pressed. She turned back to Jinsler. It's what you want, too, isn't it? Certainly, I want you to develop your gift, Jinsler agreed. But we're the only ones who know about the Vigari and what they've found out about the Redoubt. If we get stuck here, it may mean the deaths of many more Chiss. Is that important? Evelyn said, a strange edge of challenge in her voice. Of course it's important, Rosemary said. Her voice seemed sad, almost resigned, yet at the same time had a sense of peace to it. Ambassador! There may be another hyper-capable transport available. We have a Delta-12 Sky Sprite sitting in one of the docking bays over on 3. Presser turned to his sister, his jaw dropping in astonishment. We've got a what? A Delta-12 Sky Sprite, she repeated. It's a two-passenger sublight transport with a connecting hyperdrive ring. Dad showed it to me once when we were working over there together. I didn't know there was anything like that aboard outbound flight, Presser said. Not many people do, Rosemary said. And I don't think anyone knows why it was even aboard. Dad certainly didn't. She looked at Jinsler. The problem is that the managing council made Dad disassemble the hyperdrive. They knew they'd never be able to find a way out of the cluster and they didn't want one of their exiled Jedi to figure it out and get away. Jinsler took a careful breath. A hyper-capable ship. You say the ring was disassembled, not destroyed? Are all the parts still there? I'm sure Dad didn't break anything, Rosemary said. He was being very careful. And when he was done, he put everything into a storage locker. If you could get it to work, someone might at least be able to go for help. So you just let us go? Jinsler asked, eyeing her closely. Even though keeping us here might help your daughter? Against your will? Rosemary asked quietly. 
and at the cost of all those chis lives? She shook her head. Not for me. Not even for my daughter. Jedi serve others rather than ruling over them, for the good of the galaxy. She looked down at her daughter, a bittersweet smile on her lips. You see? She said. I even know the code. Evelyn wrapped her arms around her mother. I knew you'd do the right thing, she murmured. Jinsler took a deep breath. Mara? He called. Three seconds later Mara appeared at the recovery room doorway, Captain Talshib right behind her. What is it? She demanded, glancing around for trouble. Rosemary says there's a Delta-12 tucked away over in D3, he told her. You ever hear of that particular model? Sounds vaguely familiar, Mara said, frowning in concentration. Remind me. It was from Quat Systems, he told her. They manufactured the entire Delta line, including the Delta-7 Aethersprite the Jedi used as starfighters during the early days of the Clone Wars. None of the Deltas had an internal hyperdrive, but Transgal Meg Industries made a hyperdrive ring for it to dock into. The 12 was basically a larger, two-person version of the 7 that had its weapons stripped off for the civilian market. I'll take your word for it, Mara said. So what's the question? The question is whether you or Luke could fly it, Jinsler said. But the hyperdrive doesn't work, Presser reminded him. I'll fix the hyperdrive, Jinsler said tartly. Can you fly it? Don't worry, she assured him grimly. If you can fix it, we can fly it. You can fix it? Evelyn asked, her voice sounding odd. Jinsler looked at her. She was gazing up at him, her eyes as odd as her voice. A girl who had the power of the Jedi, and yet she was awed and impressed that he could fix a hyperdrive. Suddenly he was staring at his sister again, all those years ago. Pretty exotic training for an ambassador, Presser murmured. Jinsler turned to face him, and as he did so, he felt himself drawing up to his full height. I'm not an ambassador, guardian he said, his voice ringing clearly down the corridor with a pride and self-respect he never, ever felt before. I'm an electronics technician. He looked down at Evelyn and smiled. Like my father before me. Yes, if from deep inside a well, a familiar voice called their standard code phrase. I love you. Luke blinked his eyes open, fighting the equally standard surge of disorientation. It was dark in the operating room, with only a dim perm light glowing off to one side, but he had no trouble recognizing the face leaning over him. Hi, Mar, he said, working moisture into his mouth. How's it going? Better than I would have thought when you went under, she told him. First things first. How do you feel? Mostly healed, I think, he told her. Muscles and skin seem fine. He wiggled his shoulders. Except for my left shoulder blade. You took a big piece of shrapnel there, Mara said, rolling him half up onto his right side and probing the half-healed injury with her fingertips. That one'll take a little more work. We seem to have time, Luke pointed out, glancing around the darkened room. Apparently, Bersha's lion creepers had gotten a solid grip on outbound flight's electrical systems. Your turn. The Vigari didn't bother to kill any of the Chiss when they left the Chaff Envoy except the squad we'd left in the Dreadnought docking bay, Mara said. That ambush is apparently what we felt while we were poking around D1. They did dump a whole bunch of lion creepers, though, which have pretty well incapacitated everything over there. She made a face. Including the saber, of course. Of course, Luke agreed, 
eyeing her face and wincing for Astasha's chances if Mara ever caught up with him again. Messing with his wife's ship was not a healthy thing to do. So we're basically stuck here? Not as stuck as Bersh was hoping, Mara said. Jinsler taught us a little trick to draw the line creepers out of the conduits and kill them. Another three or four days and we should have all the ships cleaned out. She smiled tightly. Even more interesting is that outbound flight had a small starship tucked away. A Delta-12 Sky Sprite. Never heard of it, Luke said. Is it functional? They're running the final diagnostics on it now, Mara said. Jinsler stopped being an ambassador, by the way, and gone back to being a lowly hyperdrive tech. Sounds like a more useful profession at the moment, Luke said. What about the others? Did everyone make it out of the battle all right? Yes, though no one's going to be doing any strenuous dancing for a while, Mara assured him. The 501st took the most damage, but Fell says they should be fine. The big question right now is whether you feel up to a little trip. Luke had already figured out where the conversation was heading. You mean to try to whistle up an alert on the Vigari before they get out of Chiss space? Preferably before they even get out of the redoubt, Mara said. Don't forget they've got a whole bunch of disguised fighters waiting for them at that command station. Right. Luke had forgotten that, actually. You figure they'll try to destroy the station on their way out? But right now, they've only got a six-hour head start on us. They're also flying a dreadnought, which weren't exactly known for their speed even under the best of circumstances. And we know the course they're on. If we can get out of here in the next hour or two, there's a good chance we can beat them to the station. Yes, Luke murmured. Mara cocked her head slightly. You don't sound convinced. Just thinking, he said. What about food and air? I seem to remember Delta's not having a lot of range. It has enough, Mara assured him. Anyway, we only have to make it out of the cluster. Right, Luke said, still considering. How about recognition signals? I presume that the Chiss on Brask Oto aren't just going to take our word for any of this. Hardly, Mara agreed. Formby's already given me a recorded message to transmit to them, with Drask and Captain Talship co-signing on it. Drask's also given me his private emergency prefix signal, or rather the one that'll be current on the day we reach Brask Oto, 2 space 1 space 2. Sounds reasonable, Luke grunted, easing himself up into a sitting position. Do we have time to eat before we take off? They've packed us a lunch, Mara said. We need to get going as soon as Jinsler gives the okay. Then that time is here, Jinsler said, stepping through the doorway. The sky sprite checks out just... He broke off. What is it? Luke asked, frowning at the sudden surge of emotion in Jinsler's face and sense. That lightsaber, Jinsler said his voice suddenly stiff. May I see it? We found it down on D1, in what was left of the bridge. We think it might have been Jorisk Beathes, Mara added. No. Jinsler said quietly as he carefully turned the old weapon over in his hands. It was Lorana's. Luke felt his heart tighten. I'm sorry, was all he could think of to say. Jinsler shrugged, a fractional lifting of his shoulders. I knew she hadn't made it, he said. 
All this hatred and prejudice would have disappeared years ago if they'd had a true Jedi living and working in their midst. Do you know how she died? Luke shook his head. The bridge was pretty well wrecked, and of course any evidence that might have been there is half a century old. There was no way for us to tell whether she died in the crash or before. He hesitated. We did find some alien bones in the same area, though. They may or may not be connected with her. They probably were, Jinza murmured. She would have died trying to protect her people. I'm sorry, Luke said again. Would you like to have it? For a moment Jinsler continued to gaze at the lightsaber, and Luke could sense the struggle going on within him. Something that had been his sister's, possibly his last link to that part of his own life. He took a deep breath. Yes, I would, he said, handing it back to Luke. But not now. You might need it, and I rather like the idea of Lorana's lightsaber being used against those who helped destroy her. You can bring it back to me when this is all over. I will, Luke promised, taking the weapon back with a new reverence. And you'd better get going, Jinsler added. The ship's still over in D3, so you'll need vac suits to get to it. I'll take you to where Presser's got a pair laid out for you. Luke had expected Tio to see most of their companions on the way out with the opportunity for both a proper farewell and also a quick assessment of their individual injuries. It didn't work out that way. Fell and the stormtroopers had been moved down to D6 with most of the rest of the colony, where they would be more comfortable while they recovered from their battle wounds. Drask and Formby had been similarly transferred back to the Chaff Envoy for more specialized treatment than the outbound flight medics could provide with Fisa as always staying at the aristocrat's side. Director Yulier and the rest of the council had rather pointedly retired to D6 as well, leaving behind an unspoken but distinct impression that they wouldn't be returning to D5 until it was free again from the taint of the Jedi and their influence. Which meant that aside from a couple of silent texts and a pair of Chiss warriors guarding the turbolifts, the only ones there to see them off were Jinsler, Presser, Rosemary, and Evelyn. Only Evelyn seemed to have anything to say, and she seemed too shy or troubled to say very much of it. Under other circumstances, Luke would probably have taken the time to try to draw the girl out a little. Mara, he knew, would definitely have done so. But with the Vigari already hours ahead of them, personal and social considerations would have to wait. Ten minutes after arriving at the turbolift lobby they were suited up and ready to go. One of the Chiss guided them up the broken turbolift tube to the sealant tent and feel their lock that the Chaff Envoy's crew had installed, then escorted them over the rough terrain of the planetoid's surface to the docking bay where the Delta-12 was waiting. Thirty minutes later, after a quick test of the control systems and a final diagnostic check, Luke eased the sky sprite out of the docking bay and turned its nose upward. You ever ride in anything like this? He asked as they drove toward the brilliant star's cape. No, Mara said, unsealing one of the self-heating food packets Jinsler and the outbound flight techs had put aboard for them. According to Jinsler, Quat sold the Delta line around 40 years ago to Sinar Systems. They got most of the Starfighter contracts under Palpatine, and they either built the hyperdrive into the hull or left it out completely. Like with the old TIE fighters, Luke said, his stomach growling as he sniffed at the aromas rising from the packet. Karkin rye beans with Tomo Spice, one of his favorite meals. Mara must have had a hand in the menu arrangements. I never thought the TIE design made much sense. Mara shrugged as she laid out the tray of rye beans, set a golden plate for it beside it, and pulled out two bottles of flavored water. They were cheap to make, and Palpatine didn't mind spending pilots. Lunch is served. Dig in. Luke set at the meal with enthusiasm, tearing the rye beans off the slab and devouring them right down to the bone, 
alternating with bites of the plate fruit. It had been a long time since he'd eaten, and healing trances were always hard on energy reserves. Mara took a couple of the smaller rye beans, but from the way she nibbled at them it was clear she must have already eaten a bored outbound flight and was simply being companionable. Midway through the meal the control board pinged with the announcement that the sky sprite had reached the edge of the planetoid's gravity well. Mara keyed in the hyperdrive, and with a flash of starlines they were off. They chatted about inconsequential things as they ate, mostly just enjoying the chance to spend a few minutes of tranquility together. Luke finished off the rye beans and plate fruit, and Mara produced a pair of chalk lime twists for dessert. So, she commented as Luke bit into his. When are you going to tell me about that deep revelation back in the recovery room? Nothing deep or surprising, he told her, savoring the sweet tang. It was just a random thought. Such as? She asked, taking a bite of her twist. Such as, why should we settle for just warning the Brask Odo station? He said. Dreadnoughts might not have been known for speed, but they were known for toughness, and I doubt Thrawn took out all the weapons in his attack. Even if the station is alerted, it's going to have a hard time taking both a dreadnought and a Vigari battle carrier. Agreed, Mara said. So option two is? He smiled at her. We intercept the dreadnought en route, get aboard, and take it back ourselves. Uh-huh, she said. Just the two of us? Luke shrugged. They won't be expecting it. That's for sure. No, it sounds too crazy even for us, Mara agreed dryly. Any particular ideas on how we would get aboard without them noticing and massing fire against us? Already taken care of, Luke assured her. Back when Evelyn and I were retreating down the pylon, I threw my lightsaber into one of the D4 turbolift doors, opening it to space. Assuming the local blast doors are working, that should have isolated the whole lobby area from the rest of the ship. We maneuver this thing into what's left of the pylon, go inside, reseal the whole eye cut, repressurize, and we're in. Great, Mara said. Then all we have to do is cut our way through 200 Vigari soldiers and take over the ship. Something like that, Luke agreed. You game? Mara shrugged. Sure, why not? I didn't have anything else planned for after lunch. Good, Luke said, wiping his fingers and mouth with his napkin and dropping it into the empty rye bean container. Then all we have to do is plot out our intercept point, maybe use some Jedi navigation technique to make up a little more time, and we'll be in. Right. Mara said, slipping the last half of her chalk line twist back into its wrapper and resealing it. Except that I'll be doing all that. Your job right now is to finish healing. Luke grimaced. But she was right. Fine, he said with a theatrical sigh as he adjusted his chair to horizontal position. You always get all the fun stuff. I know, Mara said sweetly and I appreciate you indulging me that way. Now go to sleep. Okay. Luke took a deep breath and stretched out to the force. Just don't forget to wake me when we get there. You'll be the first to know, she promised. Pleasant dreams. His last view before the darkness of the healing trance folded over him was of her red-gold hair shimmering in the light as she bent over the navigation console. Chapter 24 I love you. Luke jerked slightly as he came out of his healing trance. Are we there? He asked, working moisture into his mouth. We're there, she confirmed. More importantly, so is our wayward dreadnought. It came into the system about fifteen minutes ago and is angling around the star to get into position for the next jump. It should be crossing our bow in about half an hour. 
Luke peered out the canopy at the asteroid Mara had settled the sky sprite beside. Nice location, he complimented her. How'd you manage to sneak in without them spotting you? Actually, we were a little ahead of them, Mara told him. They weren't anywhere in sight, so I gambled that they hadn't picked up an hour or two somewhere along the way and settled in to wait. Good, Luke said, stretching again and bringing his seat back to a sitting position. Where exactly are we? Well, that's the bad news, Mara admitted. We're only another hour or two outside the Brask Oto Command Station. If we let them get back into hyperspace, we're going to be pushing it to take back the ship in time. Okay, so it'll be a challenge, Luke said offhandedly. I think we can handle it. Mara frowned suspiciously at him. You're not going all Super Jedi on me, are you? Luke gave her an innocent look. Me? Skywalker, she said warningly. He grinned once, then sobered. No, of course not, he assured her. I just don't think they're going to put up that much resistance, that's all. We pretty well proved aboard outbound flight that we can take them. We proved it to the ones who didn't survive, Mara pointed out. I'm not convinced Bear Shanestash will have gotten the message. You're not really expecting them to just surrender, are you? But I don't think their troops will just stand there and get themselves slaughtered either. If we can push them back to the bridge, I'm going to offer Estash a deal. We'll let him and his people leave the Dreadnought, get back into their carrier, and leave in peace. Under Chiss' escort, of course, Mara said. And if he doesn't go for it? Luke grimaced. Then we'll just have to take them out. Sounds reasonable. Mara said. Come on, you've got just enough time for a quick snack before we have to get ready. They were in their vac suits and back at their chosen control boards when the dreadnought appeared around the side of the asteroid. It was, Luke noted, nearly five minutes ahead of Mara's estimate. Estash was apparently pushing the ancient ship for all it was worth. Okay, he muttered watching the huge mass of metal lumber past and trying to gauge the best moment to swing out of their partial concealment. The massive sublight engines blazed into view. He threw power to the Sky Sprite's drive, blasting them away from the asteroid on a vector paralleling the dreadnought's course. Keeping them clear of the larger ship's ion emissions, he swung them around the starboard side and underneath. The stumps of the four broken turbolift pylons looked like sections of a model maker's mounting stand in the light from the distant star. Anything? He asked as he swung toward the aft port side tube. No course twitching, nothing tracking us, Mara reported. Of course, the aft sensors are the ones the colonists would probably have skipped if they hadn't felt like fixing everything. Or they may just have skipped the point defense weaponry back here, Luke reminded her, easing up to the shattered end of the pylon for a closer look. It didn't look like there was going to be enough room for him to lift the sky sprite straight upward, canopy first, as he would into a standard docking bay. But if he rotated the ship 90 degrees, standing it on its drive nozzles and taking it in nose first. I hope, Mara said that you're not thinking what I think you're thinking. I am, Luke said. Hang on. He gave the engines a burst of power, pushing the small craft ahead a dozen meters along the dreadnought's underside. Then, shutting down the main drive, he shifted power to the forward ventral maneuvering jets, pitching the sky sprite's nose upward. The pylon stumps slid past, and he fired one final burst from the main drive running them straight upward into the tube. To the accompaniment of a horrendous screech of torn metal, Luke fought back a wince as he activated the forward landing claw, firing it past the turbolift cars to a more solid connection with the wall. 
Was that the hyperdrive ring? He asked as he took in the cable slack, winching the sky sprite another couple of meters into the pylon. Let's just say we'd better not need a quick exit, Mara said. Aside from that, it was a classy maneuver. Thanks, Luke said, shutting the sky sprite systems back to standby and making sure his vac suit was sealed. At least we don't have to wonder whether or not they heard us coming. Grab the sealant kit and let's go. The sky sprite's canopy was, fortunately, reasonably flat, and they were able to get it open in the cramped space without having to cut their way out. Working his way up the landing claw cable, Luke maneuvered between the parked turbolift cars to that last second gash he'd carved with his thrown lightsaber and squeezed through it. The damage turned out to be even more impressive than he'd expected. The lightsaber handle had apparently bumped the top of the door a fraction of a second before the blade had closed down, swinging it up and nicking a small hole in the lobby ceiling. Nice, Mara said, nodding to the ladder as she handed Luke the sealant kit through the opening, and then eased her own way through it. You cut off not only the turbolift lobby, but a section of the next deck up, too. Anything up there they would have particularly missed? Just the next turbo lift lobby up, Luke said looking around. His lightsaber was lying over in a corner beside four dead Vigari who had been in the wrong place when the dreadnought broke free and the lobby depressurized. The blast doors that had reacted to the emergency were about five meters away down each of the three corridors leading away from the lobby. I think one of the after electronics supply rooms is just down the corridor from it, though, and a droid maintenance facility is off in the other direction, he added, starting across the lobby. Depending on which blast doors reacted up there, either or both of those might have been locked away from them, too. Mara grunted. It would have been a lot simpler if none of them had worked, she pointed out, taking the sealant kit back from him and opening it. Then the whole ship would have depressurized, and they'd all have died right then and there. Which they obviously didn't, since the ship is still under power, Luke pointed out, retrieving his lightsaber and taking a quick look at the alien bodies. I didn't say I believed it, Mara said. I just said it would have been simpler. Anyone we know? Nope, Luke said, experimentally igniting the lightsaber. The green-white blade flashed to existence with gratifying strength. Good, he said, closing it down again and hooking it onto his belt next to Lorana's. I was afraid the activator might have stuck on and drained all the power. You need any help? No, I've got it, Mara said, unfolding the patch to the proper size and starting to seal its edges around the gash. You just stand there and be ready for trouble. They may try to pull something cute even before we get the lobby repressurized. Right. Moving to the blast door blocking the corridor leading forward, he stretched out to the force. There were alien minds in that direction, he could tell, and a high degree of maliciousness. But that was all he could read. Holding his lightsaber ready, he waited. No attack had come by the time Mara finished laying out the patch and checking its integrity. Ready? Luke asked as she packed the kit away. Ready, Mara confirmed. You sure you don't want to use the emergency oxygen tanks to repressurize? It would let us get out of these suits before we have to do any serious fighting. Luke looked over at the red-rimmed emergency cabinet fastened to the side wall with its collection of oxygen tanks, sealant kits, and medpacks. I'd rather leave that in reserve, he told her. Depending on how much of a fight the Vigari put up, we may wind up needing extra oxygen somewhere else along the line. Okay. Igniting her own lightsaber, she took up a ready stance a couple of meters in front of the blast doors. Remember, just nick it. Enough to let the air in, but not enough to trigger anything they might have on the other side. Right. Standing as far off to the side as he could, feeling awkward in the confines of his vac suit, 
Luke jabbed the end of the green-white blade through one corner of the thick door. There was a sudden hissing noise, and a stream of air began to blow in through the opening, its edges swirling white as water vapor condensed and froze in the vacuum. He glanced at the atmosphere tester on his vac suit, wondering if the Vigari might have tried poisoning the air on this deck. But there was nothing. A minute later the whistling faded away as the pressures equalized. Anything? Mara asked. Luke checked the tester again. Looks clear, he said. Good. Laying her lightsaber on the deck, Mara popped her helmet and started stripping off the vac suit. I hate trying to move in these things. Watch for company, will you? A minute later she was finished. A minute after that, both vac suits were off and piled neatly back near the turbolift doors. Here we go, Luke commented as Mara took up a stance a couple of meters back from the blast door, her lightsaber humming in front of her. Let's see what the Vigari have come up with. Reaching out with the force, he keyed the control. Ponderously, the blast doors began to slide back into the walls. And from a dozen standing and kneeling Vigari five meters back came a withering hail of blaster fire. Luke was ready, king the doors instantly closed again as Mara scattered away the shots that had made it in. Well, that answers that question, she commented. Partially anyway, Luke corrected. Did you happen to notice the little flat boxes lying along the sides of the walls? Observation was your job, she reminded him. My job was staying alive. Right, Luke said. Anyway, they were just like the little gray boxes they used to mine the turbo lift, except that these were white. White? Mara frowned, then nodded. Of course, repainted to blend in with the corridor walls. How many were there? I didn't get an actual count, Luke said, studying the image in his memory. But they were spaced a meter or two apart and ran all the way down to where the corridor jogs to the right. Cute, Mara said. So the next time we open the blast doors, we'll probably see the Vigari in full retreat. We'll chase them, watching for blaster shots, and whoever's handling the detonators will have his choice of when to blow us to bits. Something like that, Luke said, looking at the ceiling above them. What do you think? We go up? They'll probably have something ready up there, too. Mara said, her voice and sense suddenly thoughtful. After all, they've seen what lightsabers can do. You have an idea? Luke prompted. She favored him with an evil smile. What they haven't seen is this, she said. Letting go of her lightsaber, she levitated it in front of her. Okay, Luke said. So? Mara's reply was a twitch of her head back toward the turbolift lobby. Frowning, Luke followed. She stepped to the Vigari bodies in the corner and, stretching out to the force, levitated one of them upright. Focusing her control, she moved its arms and legs, keeping it a couple of centimeters above the floor, making it stride rather shakily across the lobby as if it was still alive. Or rather as if he and Mara had put on their enemy's armor as a disguise. She lifted her eyebrows questioningly. Doesn't look all that realistic, he pointed out doubtfully, levitating one of the other bodies for himself and sending it across the deck. His didn't look any more alive than hers did. But if we keep them moving, the Vigari may not notice. I think it's worth a try anyway, Mara said. Definitely, he agreed. Let's do it. Moving their puppets to the blast doors, they settled them into standing position. Quickly now, Mara said, crouching down beside the wall where her presence wouldn't be immediately obvious. 
We don't want anyone getting a clear look. Luke nodded. Stretching out to the force, he keyed open the doors. Mara's prediction had hit it exactly. The Vigari who had been firing from just outside the doors were already halfway down the corridor, firing wildly behind them in full retreat. Mara sent her puppet charging after them, its arms and legs pumping madly. Luke's was right behind it. The apparently terrified retreating Vigari disappeared around the distant corner. And with an air-splitting blast, the entire corridor exploded in a burst of fire and smoke. Luke winced, feeling his puppet twist around as it was buffeted violently by the blast before sprawling out of his control onto the deck. His ears ringing, he caught Mara's eye and nodded. She nodded back, and together they sprinted ahead through the smoke and heat. They met the returning Vigari just around the corner as the aliens headed back to check the results of their handiwork. The battle was over very quickly. Twelve down. Luke commented as he looked down the corridor. There were no signs of trouble or activity, at least not up to the next jog some ten meters ahead. Plus the four from the turbolift lobby makes sixteen, which might actually be a significant number if we knew how many there were to begin with. Mara nudged one of the bodies with her boot. Recognize anyone? Is that Berge? Sure looks like him, she said. These guys are a lot more impressive in combat armor than in those silly robes, aren't they? Most species are, Luke said. Looks like he was leading this particular charge personally. That's a good sign. How so? Estash called him a general, he reminded her. If he's sending generals to handle field operations, it might imply he hasn't got all that many warriors left. Good point, Mara agreed. Between the dent we made in his troops on outbound flight and the people he absolutely has to have crewing the dreadnought's duty stations, he may very well be hurting for bodies to throw at us right now. Right, Luke said. Either that, or Bersh was simply being overconfident. You are so very helpful sometimes, Mara said, shaking her head in mock annoyance. I'm surprised you didn't go into politics. Come on, let's get moving before they come up with something else. They reached the corridor Jog Luke had noted without further incident and paused there, looking carefully around the bend. Still no signs of enemies, but twenty meters ahead another set of blast doors had been closed across their path. Looks clear, he murmured. There are three sets of doors leading off each side of the corridor, though, Mara pointed out. Perfect place to hide while you're waiting to pounce. Luke closed his eyes, stretching out his senses. He could feel the malevolent, brooding presence of Vigari all over the dreadnought, scattered through his mind like vaguely defined bubbles of heat in a cold room. But none seemed to be very close. I'm not picking up anyone in there, he said. Neither am I, Mara confirmed reluctantly. I still don't like it. Then let's get through it quickly. Throwing a last look at the empty corridor behind them, he rounded the corner and headed forward. He was just passing the middle set of doors when the left-hand door ahead of him slid open, and five growling wolf kills padded into the corridor. He braked to a halt lifting his lightsaber warningly toward the animals. From behind Mara came the sound of another door opening, and he glanced back as four more of the predators filed in from one of the aft set of doors to block their retreat. Well, this is cute, Mara murmured. You see what the stylish wolf kill is wearing this season? Luke hadn't. But now his jaw tightened as he spotted the fragmentation grenades slung under each wolf kill's belly. I was wondering what they thought this was going to accomplish, he commented, adjusting his grip on his lightsaber as he tried to think. So far the wolf kills didn't seem inclined to attack, 
but were contenting themselves with growling from a distance. But that could change at any moment. Mara had come to the same conclusion. Let's try a strategic withdrawal while we think this out, she suggested, easing up to Luke's right and tapping the release on the door beside him. It slid open, and Luke sensed her concentration as she gave the interior a quick check. Clear, she said. Come on. Together, they eased into the room, lightsabers ready. The wolf kills made no move to follow. Mara touched the inner door control, and the panel slid shut. In the glow from his lightsaber Luke found the light pad, flicked it on, and closed down his weapon. They were in what appeared to be one of the many pumping stations that were by necessity scattered around any ship this size. Sets of conduits snaked along the walls and high ceiling, most of them running into one or the other of two huge and silently chugging rectangular boxes with rounded corners set against the bulkhead across from the door. Cozy, Luke commented, looking around. There were no other exits from the room. But of course that didn't mean anything to a Jedi with a lightsaber. Let's see if we can carve ourselves a back door, he suggested. Stepping to the forward wall, he ignited his lightsaber. Wait, Mara said. Luke paused, looking over his shoulder at her. What? He asked. She was gazing at the wall in front of him, her sense tight and suspicious. Luke, what's the usual procedure for sealing a hull breach? He frowned. You send some repair droids to the vicinity, close the blast doors behind them, pump out the air to equalize pressures, then open the inner doors to give them access to the leak. Right, Mara said, nodding. The Vigari have had four days to seal the gas you cut in the turbolift lobby. We know there are housekeeping droids still working, and we know there were enough repair droids rolling around at one time to fix all the damage Thrawn did to the hull. And anyway, even if none of them works anymore, Astash surely brought a pressure suit or two along they could have used to go in themselves and fix it. But they didn't, Luke said thoughtfully. Why not? Because if we'd come up the pylon and found your gash all sewn up, we might have decided to come aboard somewhere else, Mara concluded grimly. This way, they could reasonably predict where we'd come in, and could concentrate on making this one corridor as much of a death trap as they could. She nodded toward the wall in front of him. So why should this part of it be any different? Good question, Luke agreed, closing down his lightsaber and stepping aside. In that case, you'd better do this. It took three delicate strokes for her to tease a scratch all the way through the bulkhead. And it was indeed a very good thing he'd let her go first. Terrific, she said darkly, sniffing at the liquid trickling down the wall. Secondary reactant fuel, which most certainly wouldn't normally be stored next to a pump room. Estash is kindly offering us the opportunity of immolating ourselves. How generous of him, Luke said, looking up at the ceiling. I wonder if they've ever seen how high a Jedi can jump. I don't think so, she said. But it wouldn't take a Jedi to climb that maze of pipes fastened to the wall. If they were being thorough, they'd certainly have booby-trapped the ceiling, too. Right, he conceded. What about down? Any idea what's below us? Usually it would be substructure, environmental equipment, and other bulk stuff, Mara said. Not a place you want to go randomly swinging lightsabers. So we can't go down, up, or sideways, and outside the door there's nothing but wolf kills and fragmentation grenades, Luke concluded, looking around for inspiration. And we've got a reactant fuel leak going, Mara reminded him. Any ideas? Luke's gaze paused on the two humming pumps. Each of them was nearly two meters tall and a meter wide, 
with a casing built of heavy metal and a front access cover shaped like a rectangular, flat-bottomed bowl with rounded corners and edges. Actually, yes, he told her, popping the release on one of the covers and swinging it open. The cover was as strongly built as the rest of the casing, with a 10-centimeter lip all the way around the perimeter. Let's get these doors off. Igniting his lightsaber, he sliced off the hinges, catching the cover in a forced grip as it started to fall ponderously toward him. I hope you're not planning to use these things as shields, Mara warned as she cut the other cover free. There are an awful lot of grenades out there. No, I've got something else in mind, Luke assured her, leaning the cover up against the wall by the door and closing down his lightsaber. Time to go for the high ground. Getting a grip on two of the pipes fastened to the wall, he started to climb. Mara followed silently, clearly puzzled but willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Midway through their climb, he could sense when she suddenly caught on. Okay, he said when they were about two meters off the deck. Looking down over his shoulder, he stretched out to the force and lifted the two covers to hover in the air just beneath him and Mara, their bowl sides up. You ready? He said. Her answer was the snap hiss of her lightsaber. Reaching over to the dripping bulkhead, she slashed the blade through it. With a sudden gurgle, the trickle became a flood, the aromatic fuel flowing down the wall and running across the floor. Watch your timing, Luke warned as the sloshing pool began to fill the small room. Remember, the lips on these things are only about ten centimeters high. I know, Mara assured him. She had her lightsaber closed down and back on her belt now, with her sleeve gun drawn. Get ready, now. Abruptly, the door slid open at her force command, the pool of fuel flowing out into the corridor. There was a surprise yelp from one of the wolf kills. And Mara fired a single shot from her blaster into the liquid. It ignited with a tremendous roar the flames shooting nearly a meter off the deck. Even with the hovering covers protecting them, Luke found himself wincing at the rush of heat that washed over and passed him. The yelp outside had become a howl of pain and fear, and he could hear startled Vigari voices mixed in with those of the wolf kills. The height of the flames diminished as the blazing liquid continued to flow out into the corridor, settling down to perhaps 30 centimeters. It was time to go. Take the right one. He called to Mara over the noise of the flames, pointing to the hovering cover nearest her. He felt her take its weight. Then, focusing all his attention on the other one, he maneuvered it into the center of the doorway and settled it down onto the deck. Bracing himself, he jumped. He hit the cover dead center, dropping into a crouch as he landed. The flames crackled all around him, flowing nearly to the level of the cover's lip, giving him the sudden feeling of being in a boat floating on a river of fire. Recovering his balance, he straightened up and looked around. The entire corridor was filled with fire and smoke and the screams and howls of the injured. Through the shimmering heat haze to his left he could see flame-sheathed Vigari writhing in agony, as they staggered around trying to find a way out of the rolling river of fire. To his right, the blast doors reflected back the light of the flames, making metallic pinging noises as the sudden heat created uneven expansion in the metal. Surprisingly, he saw only a couple of wolf kill bodies lying burning in the inferno. Apparently, the animal's speed was as good for escape as it was for attack. Turning back to the room, he again stretched out to the force, taking the second cover from Mara's grip. Sliding it over his head through the blocked doorway, he maneuvered it along the corridor and set it down in the flames just in front of the blast doors. Okay, he called to Mara. Let's go. Bending his knees, he leapt over the fire to land in the center of this second metal boat. He glanced back to see Mara land safely in the cover he just vacated then turned and slapped the blast door release. There were no Vigari waiting on the other side, 
though if there had been the flaming liquid now streaming out along the floor toward them would probably have sent them running anyway. Luke made another jump to get past the edge of the expanding fire and turned back around, ready in case Mara needed assistance. She didn't. Without having to pause to open the blast doors as Luke had had to, she did the final part of the trip in two quick back-to-back -back leaps, landing on the deck beside him. Even before she was down, he stretched back out to the control and closed the blast doors again. Well, that was fun, she said, breathing hard after her trip through the smoke. With its source of new fuel now blocked, the fire on this side of the blast doors had settled into a small pool that was busily burning itself out. Yulia's going to have a fit when he sees what we've done to his dreadnought. He can bill us, Luke said, looking around. I vote we get out of this corridor. The command decks another four decks up anyway. Seconded and approved, Mara said. I take it you'll want to avoid the turbo lifts? Absolutely, Luke said, looking up at the high ceiling. But as you pointed out, they haven't yet seen how high we can jump. Igniting his lightsaber, he locked the switch on and hurled it spinning into the ceiling, carving out a neat hole just wide enough to pass comfortably through. There we go, he said, catching the weapon and closing it down as Mara fielded the circle of deck metal as it tumbled toward them. Let's go. Asterisk, asterisk. They made it to the command deck's level without further trouble. Either the Vigari had been thrown into disarray by the turning of their fire trap against them, or else Mara had been right about their defenses being focused on that single corridor. Still, there was a lot of distance yet to cover before they reached the command deck, and a potentially large number of Vigari still available for Estash to throw at them. Senses alert, lightsabers held at the ready, they started forward. But for a while... Luke began to wonder if the aliens had indeed given up. As they'd already discovered on the lower decks, the damage was greatest in the Dreadnought's midsection, where Thrawn's attack had methodically taken out the turbolaser blisters and shield projectors. The debris and twisted bulkheads made for ideal ambush points, yet the Vigari made no attempt to use them. There were occasional stacks or lines of explosives but laid out hurriedly and with no attempt at subtlety or camouflage, almost as if simply dropped there by Vigari trying desperately to get out of the path of the approaching Jedi. The two clusters that couldn't be bypassed were quickly disarmed. They made it through the midsection and continued on into the forward operations and crew areas. Here the resistance was slightly better organized. Teams of three to five Vigari would lurk in doorways or curves in the corridor firing concerted volleys of blaster fire as Luke and Mara came into view. But again, Jedi senses and reflexes were more than adequate to the task, and it usually took only a few seconds of fire for the aliens to realize that their surprise had failed and to break off, scattering away into the shadows. From all appearances, it would seem Estash was in the last stages of helpless desperation. Mara didn't believe it either. He's up to something, she muttered as they passed the site of the latest would-be ambush, stepping over the bodies of the two Vigari who had been unlucky enough to have their shots reflected straight back at them. Of course he is, Luke said, glancing in both directions as they reached yet another cross corridor. No one lying in wait in this one. The question is, what? What else could outbound flights organizers have brought aboard that he could use against us? We'll find out soon enough, Mara said. Another couple of cross corridors and we should be there. They moved ahead cautiously. Three minutes later, they reached the command deck. It was the same setup as they'd seen earlier on D1, minus the extensive damage that the impact with the planetoid's gravel pit had created down there. A wide cross corridor ran across the width of the ship just aft of the command deck with an archway and sealed blast door set into the bulkhead directly in front of their port side corridor. Thirty meters to their right was a similar entryway, this one set in front of the main starboard corridor. 
Beyond the two blast doors would be the monitor anteroom with its long rows of consoles. From the far side of the anteroom, a single archway and even heavier blast door would lead onto the bridge proper. They're in there, all right, Luke said, stretching out toward the thick bulkhead with his mind. Quite a few of them. I get the feeling they're expecting us. They got that part right anyway, Mara said. How do you want to work this? The fact that they're in the cross corridor toward the starboard entryway, considering their options. So e The fact that the Vigari had sealed the anteroom blast doors implied they weren't going to give up their territory quite so easily. We go straight in, he decided. Whatever they've got planned, they've either got a duplicate trap at each of the two doors, or else they've saved everything for the bridge proper. Either way. Hold it, Mara cut him off, her head cocked. You hear something? Luke frowned. A new sound had been added to the background noises of a capital ship in flight, a metallic rumbling coming from their right. He looked again down the cross corridor toward the other anteroom door. And suddenly, a giant will-like machine rolled into view from the starboard corridor. It braked to a halt and began to open like a strange metal flower. Oh no, Mara breathed tossing her lightsaber to her left hand and snatching out her sleeve gun. But she was too late. Even as she fired, the machine finished unfolding, its curved head rearing up over its tripod legs, its jointed forearms settling themselves into horizontal position, the hazy sphere of its deflector shield flickering to life and spattering Mara's shot into the ceiling. The head shifted slightly toward them, as if noticing the intruders for the first time, the arms swiveling their permanently mounted blasters to point in their direction. It was a droidica. But unlike the one they'd so recently faced in Jurf Huxley's cantina, this one appeared to be fully functional. And it was hunting them. Chapter 25 Mara still had her lightsaber in her left hand as the droidica opened fire. She swung it around, trying to get it to guard position. Just as the green blade of Luke's lightsaber cut in front of her, deflecting the shots that had been aimed at her torso. Come on! He shouted. She didn't need to be told twice. Moving as quickly as they could while still defending against the sudden hail of fire, they ducked back into the portside corridor they'd just left. Well, that's just... Later, Luke snapped. I hear it folding up again. Mara swore under her breath, jamming her sleeve blaster back into its holster as she took off down the corridor. Wait a second, she said as a thought suddenly occurred to her. Keep going, she added, ducking into an open doorway to her right. Luke broke stride. What? I'm playing a hunch, she hissed back. Get going before it sees you talking to an empty room. She could tell he didn't understand and that he furthermore wasn't at all happy about leaving her alone like this. But as she could sense his doubts, he could also sense her confidence that it was a gamble worth taking. Giving her a quick nod, he resumed his sprint away from the command deck. Listening closely, Mara heard the droidica's rumbling change pitch as it made a tight turn around the corner and rolled into the corridor behind her husband. The pitch changed again as it spotted Luke in the distance and headed in pursuit. Taking a couple of steps backward into the room, hopefully putting herself out of range of the droidica's sensors, Mara pulled out her blaster again and leveled it at the doorway. She could very literally have only one shot. Abruptly, a blur of shiny metal flashed into view. Letting the force guide her hand, she fired. The droidica was gone again almost before it registered in her vision, and from the direction it had disappeared came an abrupt cacophony of metal on metal as it scrabbled to a sudden halt to deal with this unexpected menace on its flank. 
Mara jumped to her feet and charged for the doorway, hoping she might get in a follow-up shot before it could recover its balance. But the machine was too fast. By the time she emerged into the corridor, it had already started to wheel around toward her. Aiming for the sensor cluster in its head, she fired. Too late. The droidica again got its shield up in time, ricocheting the shot away. It finished its unrolling and rose again, weapons tracking toward her. Mara dropped her blaster, igniting her lightsaber and bringing it back up in front of her. The droidica's blasters lifted slightly. And suddenly the machine staggered as something big and dark came flying down the corridor and slammed into its shield from behind, sending its first volley into the deck. Mara backed away down the corridor, blocking the droidica's shots as it waddled awkwardly after her. A moment later, she made it back to the cross corridor outside the command deck. A second object slammed into the droidica and she took advantage of the distraction to dodge to her left and run full speed toward the starboard corridor. Hoping fervently that the droidica didn't have a friend waiting in ambush, she rounded the corner. No one was waiting, droidica or vigari. She'd made it two cross corridors back when Luke stepped out in front of her, palm upraised. It's all right, he said. It's not following. You'd better be right, she said, breathing hard as she slowed to a halt. Thanks for the assist. What were you throwing at it, anyway? Whatever odds and ends were handy, he told her, glancing around and pointing her to a nearby electronics repair room. The first one was a power converter, I think, and the second was a two-meter piece of structural bracing girder that had been broken off and was lying around. Neither of which is exactly a lightweight, Mara pointed out grimly as they stepped inside the room. If hitting it that hard didn't do anything but spoil its aim for a couple of shots, we can forget about that as a way to take it down. I think you're right, Luke agreed. What about you? Any luck with that sucker shot? Mara shrugged. I'm pretty sure I hit the sensor head but I don't know what kind of damage I did. Probably not very much. It sure didn't have any trouble lining up its blasters on me afterward. So they can't keep their shields up while they're rolling? Right, Mara said. About all they can do with their shields up is that little waddle thing. Problem is, in will form they're just too fast for a good killing shot. Certainly not from a blaster that small. Luke said. Maybe we should see if we can find something with a little more power and try it again. Maybe, Mara said doubtfully. But then you're going to run into a different limitation. With blasters, the more power it's got, the bigger and heavier it is. Even with the force I had enough trouble hitting it with my sleeve gun. It would be that much harder to move even a carbine fast enough to keep up with the droidica's speed and maneuverability. How about if it wasn't moving? Luke asked. Could that same carbine punch through the shield? Mara shook her head. I've never seen the specs, but from what I've heard it sounds like it would take something a lot bigger than that to do the trick. So we're back to hitting it when it's on the move, Luke concluded. Maybe you should have tried that ambush trick with your lightsaber instead of your blaster. Wouldn't have worked, Mara said. I would have had to stand right at the doorway to reach it, and it would have picked me up long before it got within range. How about now that its sensors are damaged? I'd hate to try it, Mara said hesitantly. There are several different types of sensors grouped there. Composite radiation, vibration and I think one or two more. It can aim and fire using any combination of them. Terrific, Luke said, starting to sound a little frustrated. We can't use blasters, and we can't use lightsabers. So how did the Jedi of that era deal with them? Mara felt her lips tighten. Mostly, they ran away, she said. 
I can't remember a single story of a Jedi taking out a shielded one on his own. Luke seemed taken aback. Oh. Oh, indeed. Mara leaned her head back out of the room to peer down the corridor. You did say it had stopped, right? Luke nodded. I heard it unroll. From the direction of the sound, I'd guess it's sitting midway between the two command deck doors. Like a big metal Vornskron guard duty. Exactly, Luke said, starting to sound back on track again. At least now we know what else outbound flights organizers packed aboard. Where in the worlds did they get a droidica, anyway? I thought only the Trade Federation had them back then. They did, but you forget that the Trade Federation had been allegedly rehabilitated after the Naboo incident, Mara pointed out. They were all sweetness and light. Well, they were all grudging cooperation, anyway, until the Separatists dropped the hammer at Geonosis and the Clone Wars began. Someone probably persuaded them to donate a few to outbound flight with an eye towards sentry use on any new colonies they might set up. She gestured. Fortunately, it looks like the Vigari only have one of them working. One is plenty for me, Luke assured her dryly. I'm surprised they got even that far. I'm not, Mara said sourly. Or at least I shouldn't have been. The more I think about it, the more I think droid technology was what Astash came here looking for in the first place. What makes you say that? Luke asked, frowning. It was right after that first cleaner droid appeared on D4, and you slipped away to scout out our path, Mara said, feeling yet another twinge of professional embarrassment. Like the fake Jerun refugee ship, this was something she should have instantly caught on to. We got to talking about droids in general, and one of the Vigari asked specifically about droid geekas. There's no place he could have picked up that term except from Fell's operational manual. Okay, Luke said slowly. But we already know they're the ones who stole it. Right, Mara said. But there were four densely packed data cards in that set. What are the odds they would have stumbled across a list of droid designations unless they were specifically looking for them? Even less than the odds they'd find the maintenance and activation procedures, Luke said, nodding. So this whole fuss is over nothing but a few droids? They're only a few droids to us because we're so used to having them around, Mara pointed out. Remember what Fell said about the Chiss not having droid technology? If the Chiss don't, probably no one else out here does either. If the Vigari can learn how to build and field a droid army, they're going to have a huge advantage, especially among the less developed cultures who seem to be their preferred prey. I guess you're right, Luke said. So the original plan was probably to kill everyone aboard the Chaff Anva, spread out through outbound flight to collect all the droids they could find, then sneak back through the redoubt before we were gone long enough to have raised any alarms. That's my guess, Mara said. It was just pure luck they got a working dreadnought as a bonus. Luke grimaced. Some bonus. The Chief Vigari's going to be really pleased to have this show up on his doorstep. Not if we can help it, Mara declared. Come on, you're the Jedi Master. Think of something. Maybe we don't actually have to destroy it, Luke said. All we really want to do is to get onto the command deck and take control of the ship. And what, we just persuade the droidica to turn its head for a minute? Luke smiled tightly. As a matter of fact, he said, I think we can do exactly that. Carefully, Luke eased his way to the end of the starboard corridor. Directly in front of him was the archway and access door into the command deck, while somewhere out of sight to his left the droidica was standing guard. He stretched out his mind to Mara, sensed that she was in mirror image position 30 meters away in the port side corridor. The droidica was now directly between them, and the way its arms were hinged, 
it could only fire in one direction at a time. Bracing himself, he ignited his lightsaber and stepped out into the cross corridor. The droidica was, as he'd surmised earlier, standing with its back to the command deck wall midway between the two access doors. Its shield popped on as its sensors detected Luke's movement, its gun swiveling as it tracked toward him. Yes, it's me, Luke called, lifting his lightsaber to guard position as he took another two steps toward the machine. Come on, have at it. The droidica obliged with a burst of blaster fire. Luke's lightsaber flashed back and forth, deflecting the shots as he slowly reversed direction back the way he come. He made it back to the corner and ducked back to safety. Closing down his lightsaber, he turned aft and started running down the corridor, listening between the thudding of his footsteps for the sounds of the droidica giving chase. The sounds didn't come. Frowning, he slowed to a halt, listening more closely. Still no pursuit. Reversing direction again, he returned to the corner and eased an eye around it. The droidica's response was another round of blaster fire that gouged a fresh set of pits in the metal walls. But in that single brief glimpse Luke had seen that the droidica hadn't budged from the spot where he'd left it. Retreating a few paces down the corridor, he pulled out his comm link and thumbed it on. Mara? It doesn't seem to want to come out and play, does it? Her voice answered. No, it's apparently happy right where it is, Luke said. You want to give it a try? Not worth the effort, Mara said. It's already seen that there are two of us, and it's smart enough not to get suckered into chasing one of us when the other one's unaccounted for. I was afraid we were going to run into that problem. It was still worth a try, Luke said. On to plan two, I guess. You ready? Watch yourself. Right. Luke shut off the comm link and returned it to his belt. Stepping back to the corner, he lifted his lightsaber, braced himself, and spun 180 degrees around a fraction of a second before the burst of blaster fire erupted toward him from far down the corridor. Another Vigari hit squad had launched its assault, apparently hoping to sneak up on him while he was concentrating on the droidica. Like the previous attacks, this one was over quickly. Luke could sense the pain that indicated one of the deflected bolts had returned to its source, then sense the distance change as the aliens retreated, dragging their wounded comrade with them. He took a deep breath. With the combat tunnel vision fading, he could sense Mara's sudden anxiety. He sent her a quick mental assurance, plus a wordless warning to watch her own back. Stepping to the corner again, lightsaber held ready, he charged suddenly toward the archway in front of him. The droidica must have expected a repeat of Luke's earlier, more cautious appearance. Its first spatter of fire passed harmlessly behind him as he sprinted across the cross corridor and skidded to a halt in front of the anteroom door. The droidica's second volley found the range, and Luke set his teeth firmly together as he swung his lightsaber across the multiple shots coming at him. He didn't dare split away enough of his attention to look behind his attacker, but if Mara was on schedule, she was even now moving stealthily from her corridor to the port side anteroom door. Abruptly, the fire coming at Luke broke off as the droidica pivoted around. Luke had just enough time to see Mara in the distance, stabbing her lightsaber into the edge of the blast door as the droidica opened fire. He felt his breath catch in his throat. But Mara had been expecting that move, and had her lightsaber back up in time to defend herself. And now, with the droidica's attack pointed in the other direction, it was Luke's turn. Lifting his lightsaber to point horizontally, keeping a wary eye on the droidica, he jabbed the blade into the blast door beside him. Again, 
the droidica reacted, swiveling back around toward him. Luke brought his lightsaber up, dropping into combat focus again as the quadruple blasters began laying down their withering rain of fire. Behind the droidica, he knew, Mara would have returned to her own assault on the command deck. If the droidica continued to play this game, eventually both of them would make it through. The droidica had apparently figured that out, too. Firing one last volley at Luke, it dropped its shield, folded back into wheel shape, and charged down the cross corridor toward Mara. Luke set off in pursuit and barely got his lightsaber back up in time as the droidica's blasters fired a twin burst at him. He managed to block the shots, his stride faltering with the sheer unexpectedness of it. He hadn't realized it was possible for droidicas to shoot while in wheel shape. The machine fired a rolling burst at Mara, then another at Luke as the positioning of its blasters came back to the right spot in its rotation. It fired another shot at Mara. Luke inhaled sharply, breaking into an all-out run as the droidica's strategy suddenly became clear. It was going to roll right up to Mara, moving so close that even Jedi reflexes wouldn't be fast enough to handle the shots. Run, he thought desperately toward her. Get away. Now. Mara didn't move. She'd figured out the droidica's plan, too, he could sense. But instead of trying to get away, she was waiting for it, lightsaber ready, preparing to meet the destroyer head-on. Luke breathed a curse that was half anger and half fear and leaned into his sprint, driving himself desperately toward his wife. The droidica was nearly on her now. Then... Even as it fired one final time from the wheel position and screeched to a halt a bare two meters away, Mara finally moved. She leapt forward and to the side, moving out of its line of rolling fire and lunging toward it with her lightsaber. Once again, the droidica's mechanical reflexes were too fast. It had its shield up even before it finished unrolling, bouncing her lightsaber blade uselessly off the hazy surface. The droidica continued uncurling, its blasters swinging up and out into full maneuverability again as Mara tried to bring her lightsaber up in time. The blaster spat fire. And with a final desperate lunge, Luke hurled his lightsaber forward directly in front of the blasters, blocking the shots. Come on! He shouted. Mara needed no encouragement. She jumped past the droidica plucking Luke's lightsaber out of midair as she passed it and hit the deck running. Luke braked to a halt, snatching back his weapon from her as she shot past him. A second later, they were sprinting together toward the safety of the starboard corridor. Only it might not be as safe as Luke had expected. Behind them, he could hear the sounds as the droidica once again folded up and set itself in motion. Now that it had both of them in sight, it had apparently decided to go on the offensive. They reached the starboard corridor and ducked around the corner. It's following us, Mara panted. I know, Luke panted back. Keep going. We may have to try that lightsaber ambush after all. Mara didn't reply. Maybe she was thinking about pointing out that the droidica's sensors were obviously still functional enough to make that gesture useless. More likely, she was conserving her air. Again, he caught the sounds behind him just in time. Watch it, he snapped, skidding to a halt and spinning around. The droidica had stopped a couple of meters into the corridor and was in the process of unfolding. In there, Luke ordered, nodding to a cross corridor cutting across their path a couple of meters behind them. The droidica opened fire as they backed toward it, but at this distance Jedi reflexes were more than adequate to handle the attack. A few seconds later, they were into the corridor and out of its sight. For a moment they leaned side by side against the cool metal wall, panting hard. In the distance, 
Luke could hear the droidica starting to fold up again, and risked a quick look around the corner. If it thought it could bottle them up. But with the enemy temporarily out of its sight, the machine had apparently decided to go back to guard duty. Luke watched it finish its reconfiguration and roll almost leisurely back around the corner into the command deck corridor. This isn't working, he commented. No kidding, Mara growled back. Thanks for getting me out of that, by the way. I thought I might have a chance to get in a killing thrust before its shield went up. I guess it saw you coming, Luke said. Did you know it could shoot while rolling that way? No, Mara said. Either that was a very well-kept secret, or else it's something new that someone built into this particular model. It's not all that effective. You saw it could only fire straight along its path, and only at the spot in its rotation when the blasters were turned to the right spot. Luke grunted. It was effective enough for me. No argument there. Mara shook her head. We need a new approach, Luke. We keep playing this game, and eventually it's going to wear us down. Or a Vigari sniper squad will get us while we're being distracted. Luke agreed. Let's think it through. We know we can't get it with the shield up. That means we have to get it before then, either while it's still rolling or else right as it stops and starts to unfold. And as we just saw, it can put its shield up before it finishes unfolding if it senses an attacker nearby, Mara pointed out. Which means we can't let it see the attack coming, Luke agreed. Which brings us back to some kind of ambush. Right, Mara agreed. Problem, the only place around here to hide is inside one of the rooms off the corridor. Which we already tried. Right, Mara said. What we need is for it to follow us someplace more promising. Maybe after the turbo laser blisters, where we've got all that wreckage to set up in. Luke shook his head. It's not going to let us do that, he said. You saw what it did just now. With both of us clearly in sight, it still stopped two meters in from the command deck corridor, fired a few times, then went back to guard duty. It did, didn't it? Mara commented, her expression changing subtly as she stared at the wall across from them. You think you could pick out the exact spot where it stopped? Luke pulled up the memory. Easily, he said. Both times it stopped about two meters in, right in the center of the corridor where it's as safe from possible ambush as it can get. Of course, there's no guarantee it'll go to the same spot the next time. Oh, I think there is, Mara said, smiling a sudden, private smile. Even if this is one of the models with an autonomous brain, the Vigari can't possibly have the skill to have programmed anything fancy into it. I'm guessing it's been given its patrol parameters and is going to stick with them down to the half centimeter. Okay, Luke said, eyeing her suspiciously. He knew that look, and it generally meant trouble. But there's still no cover anywhere nearby for an ambush. That's okay, she said. For this one, we're not going to need cover. Here's the plan. Getting a firm grip on his lightsaber, Luke once again stepped out into the command deck corridor. The droidica's head swiveled toward him, as if not believing he was actually going to try this again. Luke took another step. The droidica responded by tracking its blasters toward him. Get ready, Luke murmured. He took a third step, sensing Mara stepping into the corridor directly behind him. And suddenly all other sensations and awareness vanished as the droidica opened fire. Luke's lightsaber flashed back and forth, deflecting the blasts as he continued to sidle toward the starboard anteroom door. He reached it dimly hearing the snap hiss behind him as Mara ignited her own weapon. The droidica reacted instantly. Even as Mara stabbed her lightsaber blade into the blast door, it ceased fire, folded up, 
and began rolling full speed toward them. Luke watched its approach, trying to judge the timing. Go! He snapped at Mara. He deflected a burst of rolling fire as he heard her close down her weapon and take off back to the relative safety of the corridor. He held position another half-second, then broke out of combat stance and charged after her. The droidica kept coming. Luke heard the subtle changes in pitch as it altered direction to continue the chase, and put some extra speed into his running. If he hadn't been right about the droidica's positioning the last time, or if the machine wasn't as precisely programmed as Mara was hoping, this wasn't going to work. The sound of the rolling wheel abruptly halted. There it goes! Mara called, breaking to a halt in front of him. Luke stopped and spun around, lightsaber ignited and ready. The droidica was standing in the center of the corridor exactly where it had been the last two times it had chased them in this direction, its hazy deflector shield up as it finished the process of unfolding into attack position. And beneath it, lying on the deck beside one of its tripod feet where Mara had carefully placed it before they'd launched their little feint, was their secret weapon. Lorana Jinsler's old lightsaber. Lying inside the droidica's deflector shield. Luke lifted his lightsaber but in salute, not defense. Even as the droidica's blaster settled into firing position, he felt Mara stretch out to the force, twitching Lorana's lightsaber off the deck and rotating it to point upward toward the large, bronzium armor bulb at the base of the droidica's abdomen. With an asthmatic snap his the green blade blazed to life, slicing into the droidica's heavy alloy body. Luke had just a fraction of a second of premonition. Down! He snapped, grabbing Mara in a force grip and pulling her down onto the deck beside him with their backs to the doomed machine. And with a thundering explosion, the droidica disintegrated. Luke squeezed his eyes shut. Wincing as the blast washed over him like a desert sandstorm, the heat singeing the back of his neck, the concussion lifting him up off the deck and slamming him back down again the tiny bits of shattered metal whipping across his back and legs and arms like maddened stink flies. A wave of acrid smoke followed behind the blast, curling his nostrils. A second later cooler air flowed across him in the opposite direction toward the partial vacuum, causing a brief moment of turbulence. And then, everything was once again still. Cautiously, he opened his eyes and looked back over his shoulder. The droidica was gone. So was Lorana's lightsaber, he noted with a twinge of guilt. So was most of the portside blast door. Come on, he said to Mara, dragging himself upright. He felt a little woozy, but otherwise he seemed all right. Let's get in there before they recover. What? Mara asked vaguely rubbing at her cheek as she got shakily to her feet and turned around. Oh. That could be useful. Right. Luke looked around for his lightsaber, which had somehow ended up another three meters down the corridor, and stretched out to the force to call it to his hand. I take it that bulb thing with all the bronzium armor was the droidica's mini-reactor? You got it, Mara said, stooping and retrieving her own lightsaber. I was just trying to shut it down. I didn't mean to shut it down quite that violently. You must have hit one of the power regulators, Luke said taking a couple of deep breaths as he looked her over. Her clothing was badly scorched, but aside from a few minor cuts and burns she seemed uninjured. She still had some of the same blast-induced fogginess he himself was fighting, but it was rapidly fading away. Come on, we have to get in there, he repeated. Right, Mara said, her voice firmer this time. Taking a deep breath, she started forward. Let's do it. The left side of the blast door had been collapsed inward, crumpling the thick metal and leaving a gap big enough for two people to step through together. He and Mara did just that, lightsabers ready in front of them. There was, as it turned out, no need for caution. 
Outside, the concussion shock wave from the exploding droidica had had a long, wide corridor to spread out into as it dissipated its energy. Here, however, it had had only the relatively confined space of the monitor anteroom to bounce around in. From the looks of the twenty, or so Vigari sprawled over their consoles or lying twitching on the deck, the wave must have done some fairly serious bouncing. They'll keep, Luke decided, looking across the rows of chairs and monitor consoles toward the archway and blast door leading into the bridge. Let's see if we can get inside before Astash realizes we're here. Go ahead, Mara said, nodding to the left where one of the consoles had suddenly started beeping. I want to see what's coming through over there. Luke nodded, threading his way through the rows of consoles toward the door. He was nearly there when there was a hollow metallic clank, and with a ponderous rumble the door began to slide open. SSS Luke hissed a warning to Mara as he jumped to a group of consoles a couple of meters to the right of the door. Closing down his lightsaber, he dropped into concealment behind one of the cabinets and peered cautiously around the side. Behind the opening door were a pair of nervous-looking Vigari pointing heavy blaster carbines out into the monitor anteroom. At their feet, growling deep in their throats, were a pair of wolf kills. Luke held his breath, recognizing the opportunity that had just been handed to them. Protected by thick bulkheads from any damage from the exploding droidica, the Vigari in the bridge had nevertheless certainly noticed the blast. Astash had apparently decided it was worth the risk of sending someone out to see what was going on. Which meant the bridge now lay wide open to them, with only a couple of soldiers and their pet wolf kills standing in their way. The question was how best to take advantage of that. One of the soldiers said something back over his shoulder. Another voice replied from inside the bridge. Reluctantly, Luke thought, the two Vigari stepped through the doorway and started across the room toward the wrecked blast door, their weapons clutched tightly in their hands. And as they did so, one of the wolf kills turned its head and looked straight at Luke. Luke looked back, stretching out to the force. Back aboard outbound flight, he touched the nerve centers of a group of the predators, searching out the pathways that would let him put them harmlessly to sleep. Now, though, he needed something subtler, something that would suppress their curiosity or their aggressive instincts without doing anything as obvious as dropping them like a couple of soft dolls. Carefully, quickly, he traced along a wolf kill's nervous system. And then, across the room, someone moaned. The two Vigari jerked in unison toward the noise, their weapons jerking with them. The moan came again, more gurgling this time. One of the aliens murmured something to the wolf kills, and Luke was suddenly forgotten as the two animals headed in that direction. The Vigari followed, weapons held ready. Behind them, the door to the bridge reversed its direction and began to slide closed. And with a tight smile, Luke rose from his concealment, took two quick steps behind the oblivious soldiers, and slipped through the closing door. Chapter 26 the move was so smooth and quiet that for that first half-second no one in the bridge even seemed to notice him. Luke took that moment for a quick assessment of the situation. Ten Vigari dressed in brown uniforms standing or sitting at various of the multitude of control consoles, the huge transparent steel viewport in front of them still showing the mottled sky of hyperspace, the big status board curving around the starboard bulkhead showing three more minutes to break out and then the Vigari who had been working the blast door controls suddenly focused on him and managed a strangled gasp. The aliens at the consoles spun in their seats, goggling. Luke lifted his lightsaber and ignited it, and abruptly, every one of them hauled out a blaster and opened fire. Most of that first panicky volley went wide. Luke easily blocked the three shots that had been accurately aimed and, Mindful of the critical equipment filling the room, took care to send the deflected shots directly back to their sources. The next volley was even more poorly aimed as the surviving Vigari, suddenly recognizing the danger they were in, scrambled for some semblance of cover. 
Luke took advantage of the unintended lull to send the Vigari operating the blast door controls sprawling to the deck, reaching out to the force to key the door open again. The rest of the Vigari, now crouched beside consoles or behind chairs, opened fire again. A flurry of shots later, two more of them lay sprawled on the deck. Behind him, Luke sensed Mara sprinting to the archway to assist. Amma cries here. Abruptly, the firing ceased. Luke held his stance, senses alert. You are remarkable warriors indeed, you Jedi. One of the Vigari said calmly from midway across the room as he holstered his weapon. Had I not witnessed it myself, I would not have believed it. Everyone needs a little amazement in their lives, Estash. Luke commented. You look good in that uniform. I appear now as I truly am. Estash countered, straightening up proudly. Not the pathetically eager drone I made myself to be. It was a nice performance, Mara commented as she slipped in through the doorway to stand beside Luke. I do think you overplayed it a little, though. No matter, Estash said, starting to stroll casually across the bridge. It fooled you all into thinking we were harmless. That was all that mattered. Actually, you didn't fool everyone, Mara corrected him. Aristocra Formby was on to you right from the start. Estash stopped short. You lie. Mara shook her head. No, but go ahead and believe whatever you want. So, you've got your droids, and you've even got yourself a dreadnought to carry them in. What's the rest of the plan? Estasha's mouths twisted. Again you choose to let your female carry out your interrogation? He sneered at Luke as he resumed his pacing. She's just making conversation, Luke said, feeling his forehead creasing. Estash wasn't just pacing aimlessly, he realized suddenly. He was heading somewhere specific. Speech is for drones and prey, Estash said contemptuously. The conversation of warriors is in their actions. We like to think we're pretty good at both, Luke said, wondering what the other was up to. One of the Vigari who'd been killed in that first volley was sprawled across a console in Estasha's path. The helm, he tentatively identified it. Could the dead Vigari be carrying a special weapon Estash was hoping to get hold of? Or was there an important course change he wanted to make? Alternatively, there were two live Vigari glaring silently at the Jedi from twin consoles a little farther along the same projected path. Could Estash be hoping to drop down behind them, using them as living shields while he did something clever? Either way, it was time to put a stop to it. Luke shifted his weight, preparing to head off on an intercept path. Let him go, Mara murmured from beside him. Frowning, Luke glanced at her. There was a gleam in those brilliant green eyes, a microscopic smile creasing the corners of her mouth. She flicked her eyes briefly toward his, and crinkled her nose significantly. True warriors do not care if they talk well, Estash said scornfully. Luke turned back to Estash, running through his Jedi sensory enhancement techniques. The Vigari's meaningless tirade grew painfully loud in his ears, but Luke wasn't interested in sounds right now. Inhaling slowly, he sorted though the drifting aromas of age and dust, human and Vigari, searching for whatever it was Mara had already spotted. There it was, very faint and distant. He inhaled again, trying to identify it. And stiffened. It wasn't the distinctive tang of explosives, as he'd expected, but something far more virulent. Poison. Not just any poison, either. The acidity of the scent betrayed this as a corrosive poison, one designed to burn straight through the protection of a breath mask or atmosphere filter, and then do the same to the victim's lungs. It was a last-ditch weapon, lethal to defender and attacker alike, used only when defeat was inevitable but allowing an opponent victory was unthinkable. He sent a quick, furtive look around the room. 
There were Jedi techniques for detoxifying poisons, techniques he had successfully used a number of times in the past. Problem was, they generally didn't work against corrosive poisons like this one. The acidic matrix meant that both detoxification and healing techniques had to be used simultaneously, something that was nearly impossible for even an experienced Jedi to do without losing control of one or the other procedure. And the poison could be concealed virtually anywhere on the bridge, remote triggered by any of the Vagari. With the traces he and Mara had detected already filling the air, there was no way for them to track it down to its source. He looked questioningly at Mara. She nodded, that gleam still in her eye, and for an instant their minds touched, possibilities and contingencies and plans swirling wordlessly between them. Who have no strength or cunning of their own, Estash continued, still strolling along on his random-looking walk. Oh, I don't know, Mara said. I'll grant you have a fair amount of brute strength, but your level of cunning is pretty pathetic. Aristocra formed by knew about you from the start, and Luke and I know all about the fighter carrier you left at the Brask Oto Command Station. The point being that you're outgunned and outmaneuvered, Luke said, picking up on Mara's cue. If they tried to negotiate with him, he would be less likely to suspect they were also on to this last-ditch effort of his. And if he could actually be persuaded to surrender, so much the better. So you might as well give up now, Luke went on. If you do, we'll promise you and your people safe passage outside Chiss territory. Your remaining people, that is, Mara added. Take too much time arguing the point and that number's likely to shrink some more. Perhaps, Estash said, coming to a casual stop in front of the helm console. But perhaps none of us expect to leave this vessel alive anymore. He leaned forward with his forearms resting on the front edge of the console, his hands dangling casually a couple of centimeters above the controls. Perhaps the future glory of the Vigari Empire will be a sufficient payment for our efforts. No, Luke said quietly. You won't even get that. We shall see, Estash said. He took a deep breath, straightening up to his full height. As he did so, his fingers dipped suddenly to the controls beneath them. There was a quiet beep, and a second later, the hyperspace sky flowing past the viewport turned into starlines and then into stars. In the distance, Luke could see the lights of the Brask Oto Command Station directly ahead. The station, and the faint glow of a hundred starfighter drives spiraling around it. Even as he felt his throat tighten, he spotted the multiple flash of laser fire. The victory is ours, Estash said calmly. He lifted his arms toward them. And now, he added, you will die. He clenched his hands into fists, and from each of his sleeves a thin spray of pale green mist shot outward. Go! Mara snapped, jumping sideways toward the red-rimmed emergency cabinet fastened to the wall beside the blast door. Luke took a deep breath, holding it as he charged through the maze of control consoles toward Estash. The two Vigari nearest their commander, he noted, had already slumped over twitching violently with the effects of the poison. He angled to the side. Estash responded by shifting his arms to aim the spray more directly toward Luke's face. Clearly, he too was holding his breath, hoping to live long enough to watch his enemies die. With a suddenness that startled even Luke, Mara's lightsaber flashed past overhead, spinning its way across the bridge. Reflexively, Estash ducked, his head turning to follow the weapon's motion. And as he looked away, Luke took a long step toward him, ducking low to stay beneath the poison spray. With two quick slashes of his lightsaber, he sliced open Estasha's sleeves and the gas canisters strapped to his forearms. With an explosive poof, the directional spray became a billowing green cloud as the entire contents of the canisters were dumped at once. The fog enveloped Estasha's head, roiling outward as Luke took a long step backward. 
Astash spun back toward him, his face nearly invisible behind the cloud, his body starting to twitch and contort as the acid burned his skin and the poison worked its way into his lungs despite his efforts to keep it out. For a moment his eyes locked with Luke's. And then, across the bridge, Mara's thrown lightsaber hit the transparent steel viewport, slicing it open. In an instant the bridge became the center of a windstorm as the air streamed violently out into space. The expanding poison cloud swirling around Astash was whipped away with the rest of the atmosphere, turning into thin green tendrils as it was sucked toward the gap. Behind Luke, reacting to the sudden loss of pressure, the bridge blast doors slammed shut. The twisting vortex blew Astash off his feet, dumping him to sprawl onto the deck. He turned around to face Luke, hands scrabbling desperately and uselessly across the metal, his face a mask of pain and hatred. Jedi! He spat out hoarsely, his last breath a curse. But Luke was already gone. Even as the windstorm erupted around him he began leaping over and around the control consoles, letting the wind at his back add to his speed as he raced across the bridge toward the hole Mara had cut. Her lightsaber was bouncing precariously along the edge. Reaching out with the force, he closed down the weapon and drew it back to him, jamming it into his belt alongside his. His lungs were starting to ache as the air pressure dropped nearly to zero and he again stretched out to the force for strength. Reaching the viewport, he skidded to a halt beside the crack and spun around. Across the room, Mara had the emergency cabinet open, one hand poised on the oxygen lever, the other holding a patch kit. At Luke's nod she pulled down on the lever and sent the kit spinning through the air into his outstretched hand. The gale, which had subsided to a faint whisper, began to pick up again as the oxygen tanks across the room flooded more air into the escaping flow. Luke counted out a few more seconds to make sure all of the poison gas had been flushed out, then pulled open the patch and slapped it across the hole. There was a sizzling sound, more felt than really heard in the painfully thin atmosphere. The swirling wind subsided, and he felt the air pressure returning to normal. He exhaled the rest of the air he'd been holding in reserve and took a cautious breath. There was just a residual hint of the poison, drifting through the bridge like a bad memory, far too dilute to pose any danger. He looked around the bridge. The Vigari lay across their consoles or in contorted poses on the deck. All were dead. He sighed. Jedi respect all life, in any form. Snap out of it, Luke, Mara called. We've still got work to do. Luke focused on her. She was leaning over the helm console, the one Estash had made such an effort to reach before he died, working feverishly at the controls. Right, he said, coming toward her. What did he do there? Exactly what I thought he would, Mara told him and he sensed her grim satisfaction as she straightened up. Okay, I caught it in time. She nodded at the viewport. Now we just have to figure out what we're going to do about that. Luke turned and looked. During the past few minutes, Astasha's final helm command had continued to drive them toward the Chiss command station. And from their new vantage point he could see that the defenders were in desperate straits. The Vigari fighters swarming around it were as maneuverable as X-Wings, but with considerably more firepower, and they whipped around the base in a complex dance-like pattern that made them nearly impossible to hit. So far the base's shields were holding, but from the methodical way the fighters were hammering at it he knew it wouldn't be long before they battered the defenses down far enough to begin causing serious damage. Off to one side, drifting along outside of the attack pattern, was the Vigari colony ship, looking like a strange spherical skeleton now that its brood of fighters had been launched. And that's after only a few minutes of combat, Mara murmured. These guys are good. The beeping console in the anteroom? Luke asked. She nodded. It was the calm monitor, 
indicating a signal being sent out from the bridge, she confirmed. It had to have been Astasha's attack order. She shook her head. No wonder Formby wanted an excuse to launch a campaign against these people. I don't think they'll need more of an excuse than they've already got, Luke declared, crossing to one of the weapon stations. Can this thing still fight? What, against ships that small? Mara countered. Not a chance. Certainly not with just the two of us to run it. Besides, all we're likely to have are the anti-meteor laser cannon and maybe one or two of the smaller point defense stuff. Thrawn demolished all the heavy weaponry fifty years ago. Across the bridge, one of the consoles pinged, and a Vagari voice began speaking faintly from its speakers. They've spotted us, Mara said, stepping toward it. You have anything you want to say to them? Just a second, Luke said, an idea popping into the back of his mind. No, don't answer. Find me a sensor station and tell me what's happening with the Vigari carrier. He sensed Mara's puzzlement, but she headed off across the bridge without comment. Luke went the other direction, toward where the weapons consoles were located. Maybe Thrawn's attack had missed something. But no. All the turbo laser and ion cannon status boards showed red. Got it, Mara called, and he looked over to see her leaning over another console. The carrier's in pretty bad shape, actually. Power output minimal. Life support systems minimal. Serious damage to its north and south poles. Probably where its own heavy weapons were, Luke said with satisfaction. I was hoping the Chiss had gotten in some good shots before they were surrounded. Fine, but that still leaves the fighters, Mara pointed out. And us with no weapons. We won't need any, Luke assured her. Get back to the helm. He broke off as a stutter of laser fire raked suddenly across the hull just below and forward of the bridge. What the? Chiss fighters. Mara snapped, grabbing the console for balance as the deck shook with another set of impacts. At least twenty of them, coming in from behind. Luke bit down hard on his lip. He'd had a perfect plan, only now here came the chist threatening to ruin it. And maybe to blow the dreadnought out from under them in the process. I'll transmit Formby's message, Mara shouted as another volley stuttered across the hull. If they believe it. No. Luke cut her off, looking around him. It had to be on this side of the bridge somewhere. No communications to anyone. Get back to the helm and get us an evasive course toward the station. What? Luke. Don't argue. Luke snapped, crossing back to the turbo laser control console and looking at the consoles near it. If we say anything to the Chiss, the Vigari will know we can transmit. And that's a problem? Yes, that's a problem. Beneath him, the deck started to sway slightly as Mara keyed in the evasive maneuvers he'd called for. We need to look like a ship that can't communicate, where Astash is still in command, ah. He interrupted himself. There it was, nestled between the ion cannon and forward deflector shield consoles the anti-meteor laser cannon. Keep us evasive, he ordered, keying the activation switches. The board shifted to green with gratifying speed. Okay. What was Drast's emergency prefix code again? Two space one space two, Mara told him. And you've lost me completely. Just cross your fingers. The Chiss fighters were swinging around for another pass. Mentally crossing his own, Luke aimed the laser cannon just astern of the group and fired pulse pulse, pulse, pulse pulse. For a long moment nothing happened. The fighters completed their turn and regrouped, heading back for another strafing run. Luke fired the pattern a second time, again aiming just wide of the group. They kept coming, he fired a third time. 
and then they were on him, flashing over the dreadnought's surface, pouring volleys of laser fire into the hull. Only this time there were no thuds as sections of hull metal vaporized explosively away. No impacts, no shaking of the ship, no nothing. I'll be a roasted nerf, Mara breathed. They've cranked their lasers down to minimal power. They figured out the message. And at the same time were smart enough not to give the game away to the Vigari, Luke said, abandoning the laser console and heading off across the bridge in a search pattern again. I could learn to like working with these people. They're coming around for another pass, Mara reported. You want to keep it evasive? Right, Luke confirmed. The console he was looking for, there. Where are the Chiss fighters? He called as he keyed for activation. Off our port side stern. Good, Luke said. Bring our flank around to port side, as if we're running interference for the Vigari. Got it. The view ahead turned as the huge ship began rotating sluggishly to the left, and Luke shifted his attention to the attacking Vigari. If they reacted the way every other squadron he'd ever served with would react under these circumstances. He caught his breath. In twos and threes, the Vigari were beginning to break off their attack on the station. Keep going, he ordered, hearing the excitement in his voice. Keep us between the Chiss and the Vigari. The Chiss are firing again, Mara reported. Again, just for show. Perfect, Luke said, his full attention on the Vigari. They were definitely abandoning the station now, pulling away in an orderly fashion and forming up again as they headed away at full attack speed. Moving straight for the dreadnought. Mara had spotted the new maneuver, too. Uh, Luke? She said hesitantly. Trust me, he said. Reaching down to his console, he keyed a switch. And deep beneath them, he heard the faint sound of metal grinding against metal as the forward starboard hangar deck doors slid reluctantly open. Across the room, he heard Mara's huff. You're not serious, she said. You really think they'll just? No. Of course they will, Luke said. Remember. Their own carrier is wrecked. What else are they going to do? He looked up as she stepped to his side. You have got to be the most brazen con artist I've ever met, she said, shaking her head. Better even than Han? Luke asked innocently. Why, thank you. It wasn't necessarily meant as a compliment, Mara said. That was a pretty serious risk you took. Not really, Luke said. Remember, I know how starfighter pilots think. The rule is, any friendly port in a battle. He smiled lopsidedly. And as far as they know, we're as friendly as they get. Together they stood and watched until the last of the Vigari fighters had come aboard. There we go, Luke said, keying the massive docking bay door closed again. Now we can send that message of form buys off to the station. I'm sure they'll want to be aboard to help us give the Vigari pilots the bad news. Station Commander Pradian Siefler was a tall chiss with a generous helping of white in his blue-black hair and a highly intimidating look in his glowing red eyes. He was also, if Mara was reading the name and facial structures correctly, a relative of General Drask. We are grateful for your assistance in this matter, he said rather stiffly, his eyes mostly following his own people as they moved around the Dreadnought's bridge inspecting the equipment. It is evident now that Aristocra Chafor Rembentrano's counsel was well thought. Though I dare say you didn't think so at the time? Mara suggested. The glowing red eyes flicked briefly to her. Past thoughts are irrelevant to the realities of the present he said, looking away again. You have aided us in the protection of our people and of our military secrets. 
That is high service from those who are not chis. He looked suddenly back at them again. The secrets are safe, are they not? Almost certainly, Luke assured him. We had a chance to look at the communications log while you were coming aboard. Estash made only that one transmission, and that was a short-range signal to his carrier here at Brass Goto. And he couldn't have sent anything earlier, Mara added. Not from inside the redoubt's natural interference. I see, Pradenkeifler murmured. We will hope you are reading the data correctly. Mara caught Luke's eye, sensing his wry amusement. For all his official gratitude, it was clear the commander privately wasn't all that impressed by humans and their abilities. Much the way Drask himself had been, in fact, early on in the mission. It was time to give that attitude a little nudge. So what happens now? She asked. I mean, as far as the Vigari are concerned? They have committed multiple acts of war against the Chis Ascendancy, he said flatly. Even as we speak a strike force is being assembled, and scout ships are being sent to search for the enemy's location. That'll take time, Mara pointed out. There's a lot of territory out there for the Vigari to hide in. By the time you find them, there's a good chance they'll realize Estasha's team is overdue and fade back into the background hum. Have you an alternative to suggest? Pardenkeifler demanded. Or do the mind tricks aristocrat Chafo Arambintrano speaks of allow you to pull the location of the Vigari base from dead mines? Actually, we can't even do it with live mines, Mara said. But we don't have to. She pointed to the helm console. The location is right in there. So that's what he was doing at the helm, Luke said, and Mara could sense his sudden understanding. I thought he was just bringing the ship out of hyperspace. No, he was going for something more long-range, Mara said, studying the confusion in Pradenkeifler's face. You see, Commander, Astache knew it was over as soon as we reached the bridge. He had a last-ditch weapon that he thought would kill all of us, so he figured that at least we wouldn't win. But even if he died in the process, he still wanted to get this ship to his people. So we let him key in an automatic course heading to take the ship to wherever their rendezvous point was, Luke said. Which is probably also where most of their heavy warships are waiting, Mara gestured again to the helm console. Would you like me to pull the coordinates for you? Then, with a twitch of a lip, he gave her a small bow. Thank you, he said softly. I would like that very much. Chapter 27 So there was nothing left at all? Jinsler asked, just to be sure. Luke shook his head, his expression pained. No, he said. We searched the debris pretty thoroughly afterward. We couldn't even find a piece of the amethyst to bring back to you. I'm sorry. I know how much it meant to you. It's all right, Jinsler told him. And for a wonder, it really was. That lightsaber had been the last thing that had belonged to his sister. His last link to her life. And yet, the loss wasn't hurting nearly as much as he would have expected it to perhaps because he no longer needed objects to remember her by. Perhaps because all those painful memories were finally beginning to heal themselves. And to heal him. Actually, it's rather fitting, he added. Lorana came aboard outbound flight dedicating herself to protect and nurture the people here. It's only fitting that her lightsaber be sacrificed for them, just as she herself was. Luke and Mara exchanged glances, and he could see the caution in their expressions. As far as they were concerned, there was still no way of knowing how Lorana had died, or what she had been doing at the time of her death. But Jinsler didn't care. 
He knew she died defending outbound flight. That was all that mattered. From somewhere down the corridor came a multiple thump of dropped boxes and a strangled curse. Moving day is such fun, isn't it? Mara commented, peering down the corridor in the direction of the noise. Especially when half the tenants are convinced they're being evicted, Jinsler agreed ruefully. Yulier and the managing council still don't want to leave? Luke asked. The Chiss are practically having to drag them out by their heels, Jinsler said. I know, it's crazy. Not that crazy, Mara said, her eyes thoughtful. Even if there's nothing here for them anymore, it's still been their home for fifty years. It's all about familiarity, Luke agreed soberly. No matter how unpleasant or dreary a place might have become, it's always hard to give up something you've become so used to. Jinsler nodded, remembering back to his childhood. Coruscant. Tatooine, Luke said. The Empire, Mara added quietly. Luke threw her an odd look, but turned back to Jinsler without commenting. Speaking of empires, I understand you're going to the Empire of the Hand with them? I'm going with Rosemary and Evelyn, he corrected. Since they insist on staying with the rest of the colonists, I guess that's where I'm going, too. I wish you talked to them, Luke said. Nothing against the Empire of the Hand, but they don't have any way to give her proper Jedi training. Jinza lifted his hands, palms upward. The colonists don't want to go to the New Republic, he reminded Luke. It's got the word Republic in its name, and it's got Jedi. End of argument. I understand, Luke said. I just don't like letting Evelyn go off without a proper instructor, that's all. Keep working on them, will you? For whatever good it'll do, Jinsler smiled lopsidedly. Actually, I suspect that Commander Fell's going to be working the opposite direction hoping that Evelyn's presence will induce you to come over to his side and set up an academy there. Did he say that? Luke asked, frowning. Not in so many words, Jinsler said. But he did ask me to tell you that Admiral Park's offer of a job is still open. Right, Luke said, throwing another sideways look at Mara. Be sure to thank him the next time you see him. That may be a while. Jinsla warned. I understand he and the 501st have already left with General Drask. Probably gone to join up with the Vigari attack force, Luke said. Probably, Jinsler agreed. Both Drask and Fell strike me as the sort of people who like to see things through to their conclusion. Rather like you? Mara suggested. Hardly, Jinsler admitted glancing around the ancient metal corridor. I may have come here to see the end of outbound flight, but I didn't do a very good job of being there for the middle. Or the beginning, for that matter. I was referring to your decision to stick with Rosemary and Evelyn, Mara said. Jinsler blinked. Oh. Well, maybe. I guess we'll see how I do. Anyway, keep in touch. Luke said, taking Mara's arm. The chaff envoy is taking form by out of here in about an hour, and we need to say a few quick goodbyes before we take off. I'll try, Jinsler said dubiously. I don't know how well any messages would get through, though. They'll do fine, Luke assured him. I know Park has some contact with Bastion these days and after this I think the nine ruling families may be willing to discuss diplomatic relations with Coruscant. We should get anything you send. Provided some hotshot in a relay station doesn't intercept it along the way, Mara added. Jinsler felt his face redden. There's that, of course, he conceded. Another good reason for me to sit out in the Empire of the Hand for a while. Don't worry, we'll square things with Card. Luke assured him. You just take care of Rosemary and Evelyn. I will, 
Jinsler held out his hand. Goodbye. And thank you. For everything. The trip back through the redoubt was, thankfully, uneventful. By the time the chaff envoy emerged at the Brask Oto station, the news was waiting that the Chis strike force had successfully located and attacked the Vagari warships gathered together for their anticipated rendezvous with Estasha's team. General Drask reported that the enemy had been taken by surprise and destroyed. Of course, Luke reminded himself privately, that was probably what Thrawn had reported fifty years ago, too. Whether the Vagari would still be a threat somewhere down the line would remain to be seen. He and Mara took their leave of their hosts, accepting one final thanks from the still bettered informed by, and headed for home. The Jade Saber was cruising through hyperspace, and they were lying together in bed in their stateroom, when Luke finally asked the question he knew his wife had been expecting for days. So, he said, deciding on the casual approach. Have you made your decision yet? Decision? Mara asked, apparently deciding to play it coy. You know what decision? Luke growled, not really in the mood for coy. About whether you're going to take Park up on his offer to join the Empire of the Hand. That would certainly be something, wouldn't it? Mara commented thoughtfully. All those people on Coruscant who never really liked or trusted me would have a Harvest Day special with that one. I'm being serious, Luke said. Hey, relax, she soothed. I'm joking. You know I'm staying with you. I know that, he braced himself. What I meant was, if you really need to be there, I'm willing to go with you. I know, she said quietly reaching over and taking his hand. And you don't know how much it means to me that you are. She hesitated. I won't deny that the idea has some attraction, she admitted. Ever since this whole thing started, I've been fighting some strange survivor's guilt over the fact that I lived through the Empire's destruction when so many other people didn't. I kept wondering if I was just lucky, or whether there was some other reason behind that. Of course there was, Luke said. He felt the subtle muscle movements as she smiled. I meant some reason besides completing your life and making you happier than you ever thought possible. Ah, uh, he said dryly. And what did you conclude? I don't know, she conceded. All I know is that I was given about as clear a choice as anyone could hope to have. On one side was the chance to again serve an empire, this time an empire that had all the strengths I'd always admired but none of the evil. A chance to give back some of my time and ability to the heirs of the people who'd spent so much time and energy teaching me those skills in the first place. And on the other side, you have the New Republic, Luke murmured. Squabbling, political brushfires, Bahan backbilating and an occasional diehard who still doesn't trust you. That was the choice, all right, Mara said. But no matter how nice and ordered and comfortable the Empire of the Hand might look, I've decided that my place right now is with the New Republic. You're sure? Luke asked one last time. I'm positive, she said. Besides, how could I drag you away from your sister and everything you fought so hard for? It would have been tricky, he admitted. But I could have adapted. I guess I'm just surprised that after all this time you would still even have to make such a decision. I wondered about that myself, Mara agreed. But I could feel the force in this, right from the very beginning. Maybe it was that lingering survivor's guilt that had to be dealt with. Or maybe the New Republic is in for some rough times and I needed to be clear in my own mind exactly where I stood before it happened. Good enough reasons for the Force to send us out here. Not to mention the fact that we were needed to keep form by and everyone else alive. There's that too, Mara agreed. I always like it when I get to accomplish three things at the same time. It makes life so much more efficient. Yes. 
Luke murmured. And I'd be the first to say that the New Republic is certainly where you're needed the most. So is that finally settled? It's settled, she confirmed. We're in for the duration, dear. She squeezed his hand. I'm just sorry your own quest didn't turn out so well. He shrugged. No, but it's not really over yet. I still think there must be useful records of the old Jedi somewhere aboard outbound flight. We're just going to have to wait until we get hold of the entire thing and can go through it console by console. Which could be a while, Mara warned. It could take the Chiss years to dig it out of that rock pile, especially with the shape it's in. That's okay, Luke said. We've lived this long without it. We can wait a few more years if necessary. Patience is a virtue. Never had much use for it myself, Mara said lightly. Yes, I've noticed. Luke paused. You want to tell me the rest of it now? What rest of it? The other thing that's had you walking around like a kid in a cemetery at midnight, he said. The thing you've been trying to bury where you hope I won't notice it. He could sense her sudden discomfort. Clearly, she had indeed been hoping he wouldn't notice. It's nothing, really, she hedged. Just a weird thought from my overly suspicious imagination that I can't quite get rid of. Origin and caveats noted, Luke said. Quit stalling and let's have it. Okay, she said reluctantly. Did it ever occur to you? I mean, did you ever really think about it? Just how sneaky and convoluted this whole scheme of form buys was? You forgot to add underhanded. Oh, absolutely underhanded, Mara agreed. The idea of dangling outbound flight and the redoubt in front of the Vigari precisely so they could push the chiss just that little bit too far is about as devious as you can get. Especially when you add the extra touch of bringing us aboard as the ultimate wild card for Formby to play against them. Devious and a half, Luke agreed. So? She took a deep breath. So who do we know who specialized in exactly that kind of convoluted plan? I don't know, Luke said, his voice frowning. Cardas, maybe? You said he used to work with Card, who's always been pretty good at the devious approach himself. And we already know he was the one who maneuvered Jinsler aboard. I suppose it could have been him, Mara said. Though from what Shada said it sounded like he mostly keeps out of galactic affairs these days. I was thinking more about someone with a proven record for strategic and tactical finesse. Luke tensed as he suddenly saw where she was going. No, he insisted reflexively. It couldn't be. We destroyed that clone, remember? We destroyed a clone, Mara corrected him. But who's to say he didn't have another one stashed away somewhere? No, Luke said firmly. It's impossible. If there was another clone of Thrawn running around, we would have heard about it by now. Would we? Mara countered. Remember, according to Park... The only reason Thrawn came back to attack the New Republic in the first place was to whip us into fighting shape for some danger looming out there at the edge of the galaxy. Maybe he figures we're as ready as we're going to be and has decided to concentrate on clearing out some of the local troublemakers from his own backyard. Or maybe the Vigari were more than just locals, Luke said, feeling his stomach tighten. This was making far more sense than he cared for. Maybe they've already been in contact with the threat park and fell mention to you. Could be, Mara agreed. Of course, that would just give the Chiss one more reason to squash the Vigari as quickly as possible. Not only would it eliminate part of the threat, but they might also learn something about possible new enemies when they sifted through the rubble. Luke shook his head. I wish you'd mentioned this while we were still aboard the Chaff Anvir, he said. We could have asked Formby about it. 
That's exactly why I didn't mention it then, Mara told him. Because we probably would have asked, and frankly I don't want to know. If Thrawn's back, I think we can assume he's more or less on our side. She exhaled between her teeth. If he's not back, I guess we'll all just have to make do on our own. Yes, Luke murmured. But we'll do all right. I know. Mara rolled onto her side to press herself closer against her husband, and Luke felt the warmth of her body and spirit flowing into his. Because whatever it is we wind up facing, we'll be facing it together. He reached his arm around to stroke her cheek. Yes, they would indeed. Because whatever prohibitions and restrictions the Jedi Order had imposed on its members during the Old Republic, he knew now in the core of his being that, somehow, those restrictions no longer applied to him and his fellow Jedi. This was the new Jedi Order, and he and Mara were walking together in as perfect a harmony with each other and with the Force as he could ever expect. The Force will be with you always, Mara, he murmured in her ear. And so will I. Yes, she murmured back. Whatever the future brings. They were still holding on to each other as they fell asleep. They were still holding on to each other as they fell asleep. End of Star Wars Survivor's Quest by Timothy Zahn